Realize. Welcome to the second day of the second global neuro ophthalmology case festival from India. We are all looking forward to a great day of sharing and learning in neuro ophthalmology. Let me introduce you to the moderator for the first session today. Dr. Jyoti Matalia is the head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuro ophthalmology at Narayan Netrale Eye Hospital in Bangalore, India. She is a voluntary volunteer faculty of Orbis International to teach and train ophthalmologists in developing countries. She has more than 50 publications to her credit in peer-reviewed national and international journals, and she has presented at conferences in India and abroad and made several national and international award-winning teaching videos in AAO, ESCRS, and WSPOS. Over to you, Jyoti. Uh, thanks, Satya. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to congratulate uh, and thank you for having hosted this wonderful meeting after 2020 to get all the people from ev everywhere around the world to discuss very wonderful cases. Yesterday, we had a marathon of afferent uh, system-related uh, cases, and today we'll be discussing the efferent system. So let's begin. The first session is going to be of five topics. We have five eminent speakers. With that, we also have uh, uh, great uh, panelists, and I shall be introducing them first. So our first panelist is Dr. Digvijay Singh. He's a director of Noble Eye Care Program. Uh, he's a head of department of Narayana Super Speciality Hospital. He holds to his credit 20 awards, 75 publications, 20 plus book chapters, one book in 60 abstracts. He has delivered over 100 lectures in 10 international, 18 national and 25 state conferences, apart from being virtually delivering over 30 lectures and webinars. He has great interest in technology in eye care and is a co-founder of a technology company, Kalpa Innovations, where he has developed an AI-related glaucoma diagnostic tool called RIAG. He is the treasurer of, uh, of INOS and past president of UOC of India. Next is Dr. Himalani Saman. She's a director of the Eye Associates Mumbai, the team clinic India, the honorary associate professor of JJ Hospital, She's won the best paper at the SARC conference on her work of six patients with myasthenia gravis, case reports of flu uh, fluvoxamine-induced BIH and published in IGO, co-author of DK Notes, a book for ophthalmology for the undergraduates, held the post of BOA Association Secretary in the past, in the year 2011, and has, and has given several didactic lectures in the above speciality in local and national conferences. Dr. Ramesh Kekunaya, who is a head and consultant at the Child Side Institute, Jasti V. Ramanamma Children's Eye Care Centre, L.V. Prasad. He's a fellow, he's done his fellowship from LVP and then from Julestein Eye Institute. He's an excellent teacher. He's a reviewer for ophthalmology, BJO, AJO, I, JAPOS, clinical and experimental ophthalmology. Uh, interests are basically complex trabismus, vision development, pediatric cataract, neuroophthalmology, and ophthalmic genetics. Now let us start today's presentation first with Dr. Sharon To, who is the senior consultant at the Singapore National Eye Center, Singapore. She was the first, uh, she was the previous head of neurology department from 2006 to 2019, I mean neuro-ophthalmology department. She's dedicated to the training of residents. She's actively involved in teaching residents apart from students as a member of the National Residency Advisory Committee. Dr. Tao examines for the College of Ophthalmologists, where she's also a council member. 
This year, she received the Singh Health Distinguished Senior Clinician Award. Over to you, Dr. Chow. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, just to check, you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, greetings from Singapore. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful case festival. So I have no financial disclosures. And um, starting, I have my patient is a 74 year old female Chinese who woke up two days ago with left eye sudden loss of vision. This was associated with mild discomfort of, on up gaze. On further questioning, we found that she also had occasional scalp tenderness for one week and loss of appetite with loss of weight of two kilograms over three weeks. Her past medical history was significant for bilateral automestoiditis with granulation tissue and effusion for the last six months. Significant findings on examination were in the left eye, which showed light perception vision only, associated with a grade four left RAPD. There were a few hemorrhages, splint hemorrhages around the left optic disc, which showed pallid swelling. And there were also a few cotton wool spots that are not too well shown on the photo. This is the OCT showing the RNFL that's thickened on the left consistent with the left optic disc swelling and the slightly reduced GCIPL in the left eye. We had additional findings on examination. The patient showed left eye reduced ocular motility in adduction, superduction and infraduction. And she also had a left facial palsy, both of these of which she was totally unaware of. She also had reduced hearing bilaterally. Of note, there was no ptosis, no proptosis, and both her temporal artery pulses were present and non-tender. At this point, our impression was with her presentation of left, left sudden severe visual loss with chalky white disc swelling that we had to definitely rule out GCA. And with a finding of left facial palsy and a partial pupil non-pupil involving third nerve palsy, of which we want, we had no idea how long it had been present. Um, we had differentials, which were the following, whether was it part of GCA. However, we couldn't exclude that it could have, there could be an underlying neoplasm. Was it inflammatory, autoimmune, ischemic? These were included in our differentials. Our plan was to do an urgent FPC, ESR, and CRP. We admitted her for urgent neuroimaging as well of the orbits and brain, temporal artery biopsy, and we started her on IV methylprednisolone, one gram a day. These were the investigations that came back quickly, and you can see that her CRP and ESR were markedly raised. She had a normal cystic, normal chromic anemia, and her uh, platelets were slightly raised. Her MR of the orbits and brain and MRA were done without contrast as her creatinine were, was unexpectedly raised. This was um, in contrast to a normal creatinine a few years ago. Her temporal artery biopsy on the left showed that it was thickened intraop and the histopathological findings were positive um, for GCA with all the typical uh, findings that you would find in GCA. After three days of IV methylprednisolone, she had improved systemically. Her left eye had deteriorated, unfortunately, to most, no perception of light, but her ocular motility and facial nerve palsy had improved. At this point, she was started on oral prednisolone, 60 milligrams a day. She underwent further investigations due to the finding of the bilateral, I'm sorry, the multiple cranial nerve palsies that were at this time, we're not, not exactly sure what's causing them. So we wanted to make sure that there wasn't an, uh, an underlying 
perineoplastic um, mechanism going on. So this, you can see what she went through. There was uh, no malignancy found. She did have uh, some um, fungal infestations, as you can see. She was worked out for acute kidney injury due to the unexplained creatinine um, rise, as well as um, findings on um, ultrasound of the kidney. And so she underwent renal biopsy, and this showed crescentic uh, glomerulonephritis with small cell, small vessel vasculitis. Importantly, her serologies came back with a positive anti-MPO and other um, positive serologies as well, as you can see. Her lumbar puncture was unremarkable. So in the clinical summary for her was that we felt she had GCA manifesting as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and anchor-associated vasculitis manifesting as bilateral automastoiditis, crescentic glomerulonephritis and multiple cranial neuropathies. So this picture shows where anchor-associated vasculitis lies along the spectrum of vasculitides. I think you saw this yesterday in Andy Lee's uh, talk. So it, being a small vessel vasculitis, it includes what we know as microscopic polyangiitis, granulomatous with poly, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, GPA, formerly known as Wegener's, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, previously known as Chuck Strauss. And GCA or giant cell arthritis lies at the large vessel end of vasculitis. So is it important to know the difference between the two clinically in terms of diagnosis, um, such as could we have made the diagnosis of the cranial nerve palsies, um, um, the, the ocular motility, the, the third nerve palsy and the facial nerve palsy as giant cell arteritis, which can occur, but it's atypical. Um, in terms of treatment, it is significant because the treatment's different and the outcomes are different as a result. So this is a um, diagram showing the treatment for GCA and um, the initial treatment is high-dose IV uh, steroids with Tocilizumab, tocilizumab, and then um, after that, you can consider going with steroids with methotrexate and then uh, to, to, to invoke a clinical remission. However, with uh, anchor-associated vasculitis, the trying to get into remission induction is very different where rituximab is used and um, with um, steroids, and sometimes cyclophosphamide is used as well. So uh, very different from, from GCA. And then after remission is induced, then it's rituximab or sometimes methotrexate, azathioprine and others. So if you have a patient who presents with a temporal arteritis that you're not sure if it's giant cell arteritis or not, um, clues to it as that it may be um, something such as anchor-associated vasculitis, would be things in the clinical presentation that are uh, not so much in keeping with giant cell arteritis. And you can see there's a long list here to make you uh, have ring um, alarm bells. And you can see it's a long list, which I will not go through. Uh, and in such cases, when you have this suspicion, then you need to do anchor um, serology, which not only is the IIF anchor, which is like the C and the P anchor, but also the specific serologies. So I'll close with this um, study that was published in 2021. Um, and it looked, it's a retrospective case control study that looked at patients with temporal arteritis that was associated with anchor associated vasculitis versus patients with just giant cell arteritis, and they compared the characteristics of these two groups. And they found that patients um, present, the presenting symptoms of patients with temporal arteritis associated AAV, they, they had much more atypical um, associations as I alluded to earlier. So 32% of them had ENT symptoms, 26% renal, 
pulmonary in 20%, in neurologic 16%, they tended to be a little bit younger. They were more frequently men and they had slightly higher CRP values. And temporal artery biopsy in 23% showed fibrinoid necrosis and small branch vasculitis. It was not seen in giant cell controls, artery controls, giant cell arthritis controls. So the conclusion, I would agree with these investigators that in the case of um, temporal arteritis, um, where there's atypical manifestations that are not so in keeping with GCA, we should uh, consider the presence of AAV and we should always perform in such cases where we suspect that it, there's um, AAV may be uh, um, present that we should um, uh, test for anchors. So um, that's the end of my presentation and I thank you for your attention. I know I note that um, Dr. Neil Miller and Dr. Edsel Ng are in the audience, in the panelists, and I really hope I haven't said anything too far off from what is the truth. And I would really um, appreciate their, their expert comments on this case and their opinions. Thank you. Apart from my panelists, who's who the, the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharon. I think that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, indeed, you've covered a lot of the, you know, the, the things to discuss in that, in your, in your slides in a beautiful manner. And uh, so one of the things uh, I think that one does realize is that, you know, it's very, very important to go into the history of looking at other systemic involvements as well, because, you know, very often uh, what seems obvious, you know, we tend to get biased towards that. But in this case, for example, there was the otomastoiditis that had happened in the past. So these were histories that you that you got to later on, or this was something that you had some information of right on the day one as well. Um, only on, on well, when we saw the patient, of course, it's our usual practice to go go and see what's what's in the medical history. And at that point, I have to admit it. I I, I paid attention to it, but. I, it didn't immediately click that it was it was necessarily a related. I did wonder what was going on though, because it, it was like six months history, sequential vision loss. And the interesting thing was that the ENT uh, specialist gave the patient steroids for the first time. They, she lost vision uh, hearing in the left ear first. So he gave steroids and the hearing returned and then lost hearing in the right ear. And I mean, both times the hearing didn't completely return, but I thought that was really odd. That was sudden profound hearing loss. And that always makes me think that it could be, um, of course it could be post-infectious, post but it does make me wonder whether it, there's something autoimmune behind it. But I mean, we were so uh, caught up with her, her vision, her vision loss that, um, uh, and then she was admitted under the care of neurology as well, not, not under ophthalmology. Uh, but yeah, it, it was at the back of my mind. Yeah, that it was that's, something that, that's what with, I was coming to. But so that, that's what happens. You know, a lot of times we, we kind of don't look at that. But retrospectively, we, we learn from these cases. And this is one of those cases that, you know, kind of teaches yeah. us. Uh, Dr. Neil, Neil, sir, or anybody else would like to you know give their quick comments as well? Well, the, the only thing, first of all, I'd like to know how Sharon became a senior clinician already. Uh, I don't really understand that. Only yesterday she was a fellow, so don't really understand that. <laughs> um, but I think this gets, for me, this gets to the issue that we don't know what causes what we call temporal arteritis. Um, as you know, uh, there are those who think that this is viral induced uh, and uh, maybe from herpes zoster. So the issue is, uh, for me, is that if the small vessel vasculitis is an autoimmune phenomenon. Is that related to whatever causes GCA? Or are they two separate things that are developed by the immune system? So I, I just don't know, but I think it's worthwhile just remembering that, that we call 
temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, calling it that doesn't tell us what caused it. And so it's not surprising to me that there might be more than one thing going on. The question is, does it all relate to a specific or specific defects in the immune system? Or are they two totally separate things, which of course is the lump or splitter issue that, that Sharon's title implies. I'd be interested in Edsel's uh, comments. He's the real expert. Uh, Dr. Miller, uh, I see here in Brazil uh, more cases uh, of GCA here during the pandemic. Uh, do, do you, re, do you uh, have this there in the U.S., Singapore? Not that I know of. Um, that's really interesting, I, Luciano. I, I, I don't know. that I haven't been made aware, nor have we seen, as far as I know, with my colleagues, uh, we can ask uh, Drew Carey later on when he's on, but I'm not aware of an increase in either in our institution or in the States. Yeah, but the time that I... Sorry, please, Luciano. By the time that uh, we saw here, a uh, lot of uh, inflammatory biomarkers uh, that was uh, presenting to the uh, ER, and people here uh, always uh, have the concern of, of COVID, and and they don't don't and they miss the GCA diagnosis, and they, they, unfortunately, lots of people uh, I think three got blind because of this misdiagnosis, and nobody will. Uh, give uh, uh, methylprotein alone to to those people uh, who was uh, uh, dealing with the diagnosis of of, of COVID, and then they uh, do the uh, the diagnose the final diagnosis of GCA later on. So unfortunately, I faced uh, three three people here got blind because of that. Dr. Ambika, you were going to say something. Yeah, I just have a question to the panel and uh, Dr. Miller, I would like to recall that patient which I had shared with you. How frequently you have made a diagnosis of GCA in the absence of a, in the absence of a raised ESR and a normal CRP and no other evidence of systemic GCA, but clinically there is an evidence of uh, acute vision loss with ischemic optic neuropathy. Well, in my experience, it's about 1%. Um, it's really rare. It's about 3% or so. And again, I defer to Edsel, but it's about 3% to have normal SED rate and ESR, but constitutional symptoms. And it's probably about 3% of people who have uh, no constitutional symptoms, but an elevated SED rate or ESR. And if you multiply those, you it's maybe about 1% or so. It's, it's quite rare and it's always a difficult issue because then the issue is how do you follow the patient? Uh, you, put them, you want to put them on steroids, but how do you follow that patient when you have no biomarkers to follow and you have no manifestations to follow? Dr. Miller, one quick but question. But the you are... positive for temporal artery biopsy. I beg your pardon? The patient was positive for temporal artery biopsy, ah, okay. having evidence of giant cell arteritis because since we had more clinical suspicion, we went ahead, we requested the family to agree for a temporal artery biopsy, and there we found that there was an evidence for it. And it was... Well, cer yeah, certainly it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis initially, and if you have a positive... I mean... I was once taken to task many years ago for not advocating more temporal artery biopsies because they're really, in general, a very benign procedure unless the posterior branch of the temporal artery is feeding the brain. And that's extremely rare. Um, so I, I think the harder cases are the ones that, where the patients have symptoms, but the temporal artery biopsy is negative. And then you have to decide if you're going to treat that patient as if uh, he or she had giant cell arteritis. Uh, Dr. Edsel, do you want to weigh in uh, anything on the case, Dr. Edsel, or this from GCS and your experience? Um, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Neil Miller is the expert. Uh, I'm just a student. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, labeling diseases, lumping and splitting, 
I, I think it's just that we don't understand the immune system right now. How can you get a giant cell arteritis like picture with uh, uh, even uh, anti-cancer uh, medications? So it's just, we don't have the right names for the diseases. Uh, and, and, you know, so if we're sitting there saying there's an overlap between uh, uh, polyangiitis and giant cell arteritis, it's just because we don't have the right name for it. I think every 10, 20 years, they revise the classification systems. The other thing with respect to uh, serology and giant cell arteritis, um, uh, all the blood tests are not specific. Also, our use of uh, rules like ESR above or below 50, uh, they're very artifactual. Uh, uh, same thing, platelets. Um, it, it's not 400 or 450. Uh, if you look at things in a continuous fashion and say, put them in a risk model, uh, you, you can better utilize uh, your blood test is just for ease of simplicity. We're dichotomizing everything, but we shouldn't be doing because an ESR of 49 is not the same thing as ESR or 20. Um, so, so, I think we can move on to the next case. So I'll introduce, uh, just a minute, I'll share the slide. Yeah, so the next talk will be given by Dr. Carmen Chan. She's a Chief of Service and Consultant Ophthalmologist at the Hong Kong Eye Hospital and the Honorary Clinical Associate Professor at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Overall, she has published over 70 papers in the peer-reviewed journals, and she's, an editorial, uh, she's on the editorial board member of the Journal of Neuro-Ophthalmology, Asia-Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology, and the Hong Kong Journal of Ophthalmology. She's a convener of the Hong Kong Neuro-Ophthalmology Interest Group, a council member of the Asia Pacific Neuro Ophthalmology Society and a member of the North American Neuro Ophthalmology Society International Relations Committee. Dr. Chan was a recipient of the Tsutsui Fujino International Award from the Japanese Neuro Ophthalmology Society in 2017. Over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I might add that I'm also a student of Dr. Neil Miller. So I let me share my screen. There are people here who are his students and who are there to see him teach as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah, please move on. Okay, so can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, no financial disclosures as usual. So um, my case is a 67 year old uh, Chinese uh, male retired engineer. Um, his presenting complaint was, um, well, he first presented over 10 years ago, only at the age of 56 with bilateral ptosis and diplopia. And his main com subjective complaint was that he had diplopia on right gaze. So uh, uh, his past medical history was significant for hepatitis B, hypertension, uh, benign uh, prosthetic hypertrophy, obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, he was not taking any traditional Chinese medicine. The family history was really unremarkable. Despite having a big family, he only had um, parents who had dementia at old age and no family history of eye or mitochondrial diseases. So um, the initial eye examination at an outside center, I'm sorry, this is all I have and nothing more specific. So uh, he had bilateral ptosis, right greater than left. Uh, in the right eye, he had reduced elevation in abduction and reduced depression in adduction. And also he had reduced adduction in the left eye. So on cover test, he had right hypertropia and what they describe as a mild nystagmus, mild nystagmus. Um, his vision was um, within normal range, uh, fundus non-remarkable except some macular atrophic changes. So what would a normal ophthalmologist think at this point? Feel free to shout out because I, I'm sure it's too easy for um, our panelists. What would be the, the usual thought here with bilateral ptosis and also uh, funny eye movements which did not correspond uh, to any cranial nerve pattern? Anyone? So too easy. Okay, so um, at this point, of course, uh, of course, MG. 
So um, he had some investigations for MG, uh, including uh, anti acetylcholine receptor antibody, ISPAC test, Tenslon test, EMG, nerve conduction studies, were all within normal limits. So MG so far is um, an out of the question. So uh, at this point, he had some neuroimaging. So a CT scan, sorry, we always start with CT scan because the waiting list is shorter. Uh, it showed a prominent aqueduct, a horizontal slit-like extension in the uh, uh, in bilateral brainstem. So uh, this was followed by an MRI, which showed uh, a lesion which was hyper-intense on T T1-weighted images and hypo-intense on T2-weighted images uh, in the cerebral aqueduct, which was expanded with no contrast enhancement. So at that point, uh, the, the DDX included epidermoid cyst or complicated intraventricular cyst. He had an LP, which was essentially normal. So um, he was seen by uh, an outside neuro neurologist who thought perhaps the patient had chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, but the patient had no pigmentary retinopathy. Uh, the serum creatine kinase was normal. Uh, the ECG did show first degree heart block. He had a muscle biopsy, which was unremarkable. And during this time, he had his ptosis correction done by an outside ophthalmologist. This was five years uh, since the symptom onset already. So during this time, in addition to his eye signs and symptoms, he had other problems. So he developed a generalized tonic clonic seizure in 2014. So he had a repeat CT scan, which showed no space occupying lesion, repeat LP, which was unremarkable. Then he had two episodes of syncope, uh, what they thought was syncope in 2015, but his, um, EEG was, uh, there was no epileptiform discharges and the halter was normal. He also had some occasional, uns uh, occasional unsteadiness. Uh, his other cranial nerves were normal, no limb weakness, but uh, his jerks were slightly hyperreflexic. His pinprick and proprioceptions were normal, no pass pointing or intention tremor. His gait was okay, but he failed tandem walking and he had a tendency to fall towards the left side. So uh, he had some further tests by outside neurologists, I think plural, because I think he's seen quite a few people back by now. Uh, so the, the blood test showed um, blood serum protein electrophoresis, which was normal, but he had raised serum free light chain. Mm. So in the uh, chat box, uh, we had Kenomad. Mm. Well, Let's, let's have a think about it. So anyway, the, the free light, uh, light chain, the kappa to lambda ratio was normal. So at this point, uh, the outside ophthalmologist thought that perhaps he had Sando disease with monoclonal gammopathy. So if like you, if like me, you have never heard of Sando before, let me just uh, tell you a bit more. It's, um, it's characterized by adult onset and it's a severe form of sensory ataxic uh, neuropathy with dysarthria and ophthalmoparesis. Uh, so it is due to mitochondrial DNA depletion in muscle and peripheral nerves and um, with a mutation in the gene POLG. So he had uh, EMG, which showed only patchy myopathic changes, and he had genetic tests, which showed no mutation in the POLG gene. So during this time, he had progressive neurological deterioration in his mobility and other neurological signs. Initially, he can walk unaided, but now he was wheelchair, he was dependent on wheelchair um, outside his home. And more neurological signs, including right head tilt, impaired vibration up to the trunk, mild dysarthria, uh, cerebellar signs, and also lower limb areflexia. At this point, uh, in 2019, he was returned, referred to our center for the end opinion. And this, so, uh, so this is, this summarizes his, um, his ophthalmoplegia. So is external as well as internal. The lip position is unreliable because he had tosis surgery done and he does have a, a chin up posture. And he had a funny nice So, 
I welcome any thoughts at this moment, but at this point, let me summarize it for our audience. So these are all the investigations he had in the past 10 years. So EEG, basically normal, muscle biopsy, um, unremarkable, EMG, some patchy myopic changes, e and uh, Holter, normal, echocardiogram, normal, polysomnography, don't know how to interpret, the creatine kinase was normal, uh, IG free light gene was increased, the POLG gene was, uh, there was no mutation detected, uh, and he had a mitochondrial disease panel, uh, which came back with no path path uh, pathogenic variants identified. He had a repeat, uh, so what would you do next? So as usual, uh, uh, we would repeat the MRI. This was repeated in 2019, which still showed an abnormal T2 weighted hyperintense changes involving uh, bilateral midbrain at the periechoductal region and central quantine region, with no significant change in size and imaging appearance since 2013. And there was compensatory dilatation of the cerebral aqueduct. So, summary. So, with this ophthalmoplegia, which is which was external as well as internal, dysarthria, cerebellar signs, and lower limb areflexia. Can this be Sando disease, but the muscle biopsy and was normal and the POG mutation was not detected, or some CM, CNS disease because he has cerebellar signs and pupil involvement. But if this is a CNS disease, what is it? So at this point, what would you do? Would you do a 50-50? phone a friend or ask the audience. So any suggestion from our panelists? We have some really bright neurologists in the, uh, in the panel and I was afraid that they would guess it straight away. So did you take multiple opinions from, uh, did you present this in a neurology meeting? Yes, I did actually, because yeah, LP was done, uh, a question from, um, uh, Dr. Naveen, was an LP done? Yes, it was done at least twice and they were all normal. So at this point, I actually posted the video uh, to uh, the Neuro uh, North American Neuro Ophthalmology Society, um, uh, the listserv, the, the, the email chat group. And um, I had some really, uh, really useful opinion from uh, the NANOS members. So they asked me, well, it, they asked me to, to look at something very specific. So can, you, can anyone suggest what specific sign that I missed? Okay. So I should have looked in the mouth. And of course, this is oculopalatal, well, sorry. In fact, there was in inferior olivary hypertrophy on the neuroimaging, which was uh, not commented on by the uh, neuroradiologist before. It's perhaps because we didn't give the correct clinical information. So all of this points to CNS course. So in fact, the putting everything together, the eventual diagnosis was chronic progressive external and internal ophthalmoplegia secondary to midbrain cleft. So at this point, perhaps, I didn't know very much about midbrain cleft, so I had to look, look it up. So uh, this is uh, just a, a little revision on the midbrain anatomy. So these two diagrams show uh, the position of the aqueduct at the level of the superior colliculus and also uh, at the inferior colliculus. So the aqueduct is very close to the oculomotor nucleus, uh, the, the MLF, and also the edgingal westfall nucleus, which controls the pupils. So uh, further down near the inferior colliculus, uh, it also is very close to the trochlear nucleus. So uh, the midbrain cleft syndrome is also known as the keyhole aqueduct syndrome, hence the name of this presentation. So basically what these patients have is CSF containing slit-like ventral extension of the aqueduct lined by a combination of ependymal or glial tissues. They usually give you long-standing symptoms and signs, including diplopia and oculomotor abnormalities. So in all reported cases, they had internuclear ophthalmoplegia because the MLF is, is uh, dis destroyed um, uh, in, in, in those patients. 
And also the patients may also have upgaze paresis and third and fourth nerve palsies. They also have ataxia and dysarthria because of uh, cerebellar involvement. So the etiology is unknown. So uh, one uh, pathogenetic theory is about the development of a syrinx, this is, which is related to uh, disrupted CSF flow. The presentation is usually in the fourth decade with subsequent clinical progression. And the clinical course is consistent with the degenerative process. And there's usually a misdiagnosis of multiple sclerot sclerosis or other degenerative CNS dis diseases. So, and let's talk a little bit about the olivary nucleus as well. So, well, as an ophthalmologist, I don't really know much about it, but uh, after uh, knowing uh, the importance of uh, the uh, radiological sign in this case, I think it's worth knowing a little bit more about it. So it is located in the superior medulla just below the pons. So in this patient, uh, he had hypertrophic olivary degeneration, which is a rare condition characterized by a unique pattern of transynaptic degeneration caused by a lesion of the uh, den dentato rubro uh, thalamic tract, which is also known as the guillain mollare triangle. And both, both names are very difficult uh, to pronounce. So if you have a disruption of this uh, triangle, you develop a clinical sign called oculopalatal tremor, also known previously known as oculopalatal malclonus, but it's not really a, a malclonus or pharyngo-laryngo diaphragmatic monoclonus. So it is an acquired syndrome of continuous and rhythmic movement of the soft palate combined with pendular nystagmus. So with midbrain cleft syndrome, there is no effective treatment. There's a case report of uh, um, treatment with a trial of uh, Dimox followed by a third ventriculostomy uh, for CFS di CSF diversion uh, in a patient with progressive midbrain cleft syndrome after head trauma, which resulted in arrested disease progression and, first, uh, and partial recovery. So in this patient, we did offer this. We, we discussed it with a neurosurgeon. We did offer it to the patient, but um, the patient declined a programmable shunt because, of course, this kind of neurosurgery does have, does have um, uh, significant potential morbidity, and he opted for observation. So at his last follow-up um, uh, earlier this year, unfortunately, there was a slow progressive deterioration. He was wheelchair-bound. He was developing a dysphagia as well. So he was offers, offered an aroused tube feeding, but uh, the family and himself opted for comfort feeding. So, so what can we learn from these take home messages? So um, if there is pupil involvement and nystagmus, so this is unlikely to be MG or CPEO. So I have to put unless in, a, in small brackets. So because you can get pseudo INO in MG and you can get uh, um, uh, gaze paretic nystagmus a little bit. And, and what about pupil involvement? Well, in CPEO, if you were to have um, extensive uh, pigmentary retinopathy with secondary optic atrophy, then you could potentially get a light near to save association because of optic atrophy. But this is really in the small print. Okay, moving on to the main take home messages. Okay, and if you encounter a patient with pendular nystagmus, especially vertical pendular nystagmus, we should always check for oculopalatal tremor. So, if in doubt, uh, there are always international experts out there who may be able to help you. And also, we need to um, seek the help from neuroradiology, neuro neurology, and neurosurgery. And of course, we have to review the MRI with your neurologist with specific clinical information. So that's the end of my presentation. And I, I'd like to thank all the NanosNet uh, listener members, especially Dr. Gordon Plant, who pointed out the uh, clinical and radiological signs that I missed. And also, I would also like to thank my colleagues and to also all the ophthalmologists, neurologists, and neurosurgeons who provided care to this patient. So thank you. Any questions or any comments from uh, our expert panelists?
Dr. Carmen, first of all, you know, I, I must compliment you that your approach to, to the case was phenomenal and the way the patient was investigated uh, very extensively. Uh, because of our uh, logistics present here, it would not have been possible to, you know, in, do so many serial MRIs if, if this patient would have come to us. Um, the second thing is that it again highlights the uh, importance of good communication between us and the radiologist. So do you think there's a possibility that in the previous MRIs, which were done in 2012, this midbrain cleft was there and it was missed? Yes, the, 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 there was there all the time, right from the start. But no one actually took much notice of it. And so it was very, very often, initial, even in the initial CT, it was seen on the initial CT. Okay. And very often that. these patients often get mis uh, you know treated with steroids so was this patient also treated with steroids no, because they might have been misdiagnosed as ms or something else and somebody would have given a trial of steroids um actually no nobody gave a trial of steroids surprisingly okay. and i have to say i didn't really do much of the workup the workup was done by the numerous uh uh neurologists who saw the patient before me in the um in the preceding seven years uh, before he came, to, he came to me. Right. I think really interesting case, something new that we've learned today. And rightly said, we need to have a good communication with our other colleagues because sometimes as a neuro, neuro ophthalmologist, we may miss a lot of things. So when we are able to discuss cases in groups or in uh, you know, particular meetings, we are able to pick up a lot of things. So I think uh, seminars like this, webinars will help us learn more and next time when we get cases like this, we'll be able to approach better. Carmen, one of the things that I think is interesting about the oculopalatal tremor is, and it was hard to see because your patient had the ophthalmoplegia as well, but the, the movements of uh, oculopalatal tremor are really sort of lazy. They're, 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 they just sort of uh, float in a way. And I swear, sometimes they look more like jerk. They almost look like convergence retraction nystagmus. But when you do the waveforms, as you say, they're pendular. But my rule of thumb is that if you see sort of a lazy sort of movement, look in the palate. And of course, it doesn't have to be synchronous with the eye. The palatal movement isn't always synchronous. Sometimes it's asynchronous palatal movement. Um, but I think that that you know, most nystagmus is fairly rapid, uh, especially the, both pendular and jerk. But this is one of those that's just really sort of just flows along. Yeah. yeah. So then oh, we can move to the third talk. Uh, I would now welcome Dr. Uma Pati, who is a senior consultant neurologist at the National Neuroscience Institute, Singapore. His subspecialty interests are neuromuscular disorders, electrophysiology, autonomic nervous system, eye movements, and neuroimmunology. Over to you. Hello. Hi. Um, let me just share the screen now. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for having me uh, in this very uh, uh, prestigious meeting. Um, let me get on with the case. To and fro, we go, we swim. Okay. So this is a young girl that I saw in Lusaka, Zambia. She is a, she has got retroviral disease, but unfortunately, she did not take care of herself. Uh, she had actually defaulted uh, a heart therapy for quite a number of months. She also had very poor social circumstances, quite a bit of social deprivation. She was estranged from her family, used to live in the streets, uh, homeless. And uh, there was a clear-cut uh, history of uh, substance abuse, including uh, alcohol. So she was admitted acutely uh, overnight for altered mental state and unsteady gait. And then the next morning during the rounds, we saw her. So I'll just play it again. So 
So the question that I wanted to ask uh, the audience was, uh, what is this particular eye movement? Perhaps it is the wrong kind of audience, uh, such an expert as Steve, the audience, but uh, for the purpose of uh, discussion in the Socrates uh, uh, method, I mean, the questions will be helpful. So, pendulum nystagmus was what we thought she had. And uh, if I could just take a step back and remember what Dr. Z used to teach me was that the eye movements basically have only two things, two basic functions. Eyes basically have two functions, right? Uh, with, with regards to movement. It's one is that if they're supposed to be staying put, they should be staying put. If they're supposed to go from one place to another, they must reach the other place well without any inaccuracy. So in this particular case, the problem is that the eye is not staying put. So if the eye is not staying put, then the first thing to ask is, what is taking it away from this, uh, from this, from its primary resting position? Is it an intrusive saccade or is it a slow drift? Now, as you can see in the video, it's, it's quite clear that it's a slow drift that's taking the eye from a resting position. So that makes it an nystagmus. Now, once that's uh, labeled a nystagmus, then the next question to ask is, what's bringing it back? What's bringing it back from its position of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, mischief? You know, what's bringing it back? Is it a jerk or is it another a slow drift? And in this particular case, you can see slow drift, 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 slow drift. So we decided it must be a nystagmus, but because the, what's bringing it back is also a slow drift, we thought it was pendular in nature. Now, with, with regards to pendular nystagmus, like what Carmen said, the most important cause in modern medicine is probably ocular palatal tremor, and everyone has to look into the palate for that. Then, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, anything that causes brainstem demyelination could cause uh, pendular nystagmus. Then, of course, there is a whole branch of uh, pendular nystagmus, which we refer to as congenital nystagmus. So with that, um, what would you like to examine next in this patient? So as, uh, as Carmen alluded to, the first thing we need to do is look at the palate. And as you can see very clearly here, the palate is not moving at all. That's absolutely uh, no movements suggestive of uh, ocular palatal tremor. So this is another patient, very similar to what Carmen showed. This is a patient who had a brainstem bleed about one year ago, and then subsequently developed a palatal tremor that's synchronous with the almost elliptical, like what Dr. Miller was saying, a very lethargic sort of almost, uh, almost elliptical sort of uh, movement. And you can see that both the to and fro phase are both slow phase in nature. This is another patient with, again, a brainstem stroke some time ago who developed ocular palatal tremor. And the pathology, as what um, Carmen has alluded to, is, uh, is, is bound by this triangle of gila molare, which is the uh, central tegmentum, the olive, and the deep cerebellar nuclei. So this lady didn't have ocular palatal tremor. So what is the cause of her pendulum nystagmus? Further examination of her eyes revealed that she had normal range of eye movements, but her pursuit was very poor. She had saccadic hypermetria. Her vestibular ocular reflex was not easy to uh, discern whether it's normal or abnormal. So I would have to equivocate with regards to her vestibular ocular reflex. And a pupillary response was quite normal. In addition, a general neurological exam revealed marked dysmetria in her limbs, dysdiadokinesia, a toxic gait, um, a very uh, uh, scanning speech suggestive of cerebellar disease. And as I alluded to at the beginning of the slide, she was uh, confused, she was disorientated, couldn't give, her, uh, couldn't give us uh, any information about the time and space that she was in. So the following, uh, reasonable management steps, except, well, it would be reasonable to do it. Remember, she's a lady with retroviral disease, poorly treated, so she's likely to have a very low CD4 count. 
she's likely to get immunosuppressive, uh, immunocompromised illness. She's also likely to get all the illness associated with social deprivation. So with that, uh, it's a reasonable get neuroimaging, definitely yes. But unfortunately, uh, in this uh, hospital that we're working in, um, even a plain CT scan is not easy to get. So we didn't get any, we couldn't get any neuroimaging, but it's very reasonable to get neuroimaging. Would it be reasonable to start high doses of IV parenteral, uh, a parenteral timing? Yes, indeed. Because as I alluded to earlier, one of the substances she's known to abuse is uh, alcohol, but not just abusing large amounts of alcohol, but because of a social deprivation, her diet is otherwise not quite balanced. Then of course, in all patients with uh, such circumstances, especially in the context of Wernicke's that we are considering in the second option, we must always remember electrolyte abnormalities like hypoglycemia, hypomagnesemia, which it by themselves can cause significant morbidity. Then of course, as I mentioned earlier, because of an immunosuppressive state, it would be reasonable to consider the possibility of this being some sort of uh, opportunistic infection, tuberculosis, cryptococcosis, toxoplasma, that could be either in the posterior fossa in the cerebellum. And then the last option is whether to consider starting the patient on any anticonvulsant. So I think it's uh, quite clear from the way I've uh, explained that the first four options was uh, quite reasonable. In fact, that's exactly what we did, except for the imaging. We didn't, we didn't get uh, opportunity to image her. Uh, and we didn't start her on phenytoin or any anticonvulsants because we didn't think any of her manifestations were related to seizures. Let's see. Now, her mental state improved. As you can see, the next day she's, uh, uh, next day, maybe about 24 hours later, you know, after the time in had gone in about three or four doses of time in, her mental state had improved somewhat, you know, and uh, she was able to provide us further history. She did confirm that she does misuse large amounts of alcohol, but she was also taking something else. What do you think that is? Glue or toluene? Okay, toluene is the substance in glue. Marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, and LSD. I think many of you would have guessed by now, this uh, she did indeed uh, uh, admit to taking uh, inhalants. So basically, she was inhaling glue as well as petrol or, or anything that, that, that gave her a high. So these were the two the big substances that she was misusing. And both of them contained toluene. And toluene has been known to be a very potent uh, dysmyelinator or demyelinator in the central nervous system. So the belief is that uh, toluene co toxicity causes dysmyelination or demyelination in the brainstem and affects the brainstem circuits and causes this to and fro pendulum nystagmus. And that's what we think she had. So over the next few days, her uh, mental state continued to improve. Her taxi improved. She started walking much better. Her memory improved. And we thought that that was part, most likely, of Wernicke's Kosakoff component of her illness. So we corrected that component of her illness with thymine. But unfortunately, uh, with regards to the, the pendulum nystagmus, it remained the same. There was absolutely no change in the, in the state of a pendulum nystagmus. And then, um, uh, as I mentioned before, in terms of management, there's, there's, we couldn't do any other investigations for her. We stopped the antibiotics because it was quite clear that there was uh, no evidence of an infection. We put her back on our antiretroviral drugs. And then we got a social worker involved to see whether we could address the underlying social issues. We managed to find one of her relatives in another village who was willing to take her temporarily so that uh, and, and watch over her and make sure that uh, she's fed properly. She's not malnourished anymore. And she doesn't fall prey to uh, misusing alcohol and uh, toluene again. So that's the, um, the end of uh, this story. Fairly uh, happy story, I think, for happy ending, I think. Um, uh, I will pause here before I go on to the second case, which is another short case, for the panelists to make their comments. Well, Uma Papi, I just yes. point out that these patients are often misdiagnosed as chronic progressive MS because of the white matter changes on the MRI and the things we reported. 
a woman who had bilateral INOs with pendular or elliptical nystagmus from glue sniffing uh, without any evidence of Wernicke's. Uh, but it's all, it definitely should be in the differential of uh, acquired pendular nystagmus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. In this case, as I said, we didn't manage to get any imaging, so we don't know what a brainstem looks like, but I suspect that would be white matter changes. Okay, should I go on? Yes, please. Okay, sure. The next case, up and down, just now it's to and fro, now it's up and down. So I'm going to just play this video for a while. Any comments from anyone? So we see the vertical nystagmus as well as uh, palatal tremor. Mm. And in the later part, uh, I've exposed uh, uh, his, his tummy and you can see that there is also some movements on the abdomen suggestive that the diaphragm is also synchronously firing. So again, this looks like a common syndrome again. Okay, I'll go on with the story because the story is also quite interesting. So this is a 55-year-old man who was unfortunately unvaccinated for COVID. He presented with uh, acute right basal ganglia hemorrhage with left side of weakness. And uh, we think that this is probably a garden variety basal ganglia hemorrhage from poorly, uh, uncontrolled, or in fact, undiagnosed hypertension. Then in the hospital, as it was routine at that time, uh, all patients were tested and he was COVID positive. Uh, but in terms of COVID, he had actually minimal symptoms. You know, In fact, CD thorax was completely normal. And uh, there was only a few days when he needed a bit of oxygen, but really nothing to write home about as far as COVID's manifestations in the respiratory system. But on the day three of illness, he became progressively encephalopathic out of proportion to the, to the effects of the right basal ganglia bleed. He was also noted to have intractable hiccups, stridor, and fluctuating blood pressures. At that time, electroencephalogram revealed non-convulsive status epilepticus. At that uh, point, we were uh, neurology was also involved, and and one of the things that we found remarkable were some ocular findings. There was a suggestion of intermittent saccadic intrusions, short bursts of opsoclonus, okay? and very interestingly, there were these periods of tonic deviation of the eye, either leftward or da up downward lasting up to one minute each time, often induced by head shaking. Okay, and I'll show, you, show that in a minute. These ocular movement abnormalities, abnormalities were not correlating with any electrographic seizures. The patient did not have any limb myoclonus. So this is a video of his early part of his illness. It was done in the isolation intensive care unit. We had to video him using a, a plastic cover over the video camera. So, so the quality of the video is not as good as it should be, but I will try to uh, fill in with some running commentary. Ah. Uh. 
go there. So you can see that the eyes most of the time conjugate, but occasionally disconjugate eye movement. Sometimes goes down, straight down, and stays there, or sometimes goes leftwards, stays there for a while and comes back. And often it can be induced much more obviously after persistent head shaking. So this was the early part of his illness, at the peak of his encephalopathy. So at uh, the workup, which I'll show you later on, suggested that his encephalopathy was most likely a post-COVID inflammatory sort of encephalitis. So initially, we, he received a cause of methylprednisolone, followed by a cause of immunoglobulins, and you still continue to remain encephalopathic. And this was the time when his electroencephalograph also showed uh, non-convulsive seizures. So after about two weeks, we decided to finally push on to intravenous to tocilizumab, as you know, which is an IL-6, uh, anti-IL-6 uh, monoclonal antibody. And uh, later on, I'll show you the, the investigation showed that his IL-6 and uh, levels were also very raised. Seizures were eventually controlled by about the two or three weeks of uh, admission with phenytoin as well as sodium valproate and his mental state slowly improved. From day 35, as the patient became more alert, he started developing that nystagmus that you first saw at the beginning of the whole presentation, the vertical pendulum nystagmus, together with a palatal and diaphragmatic tremor, consistent with oculopalatal tremor. The frequency of the pendular tremor and pendular uh, nystagmus, as well as the palatal and diaphragmatic tremor were between two to 2.5 hertz consistent with ocular palatal tremor. We observed him for long periods of time and didn't notice any facial myorrhythmia. So let's just watch the same video again, now with a bit of a understanding of his background. So remember, this is day 38 already. He's coming out of his encephalopathy. All the immunomodulated treatments have started working. He's waking up, his mental state is improving, his function is improving, and... Um, and he's got no more seizures. At that point, he starts developing OPD. Occasionally, we manage to catch these episodes of uh, psychiatric intrusions, sometimes becoming quite crazy and uh, almost like short, short burst of obsoclonus. It wasn't easy to, uh, to get nice recordings of his palatal movements. So you have to use a bit of imagination, but it synchronized very well with this uh, vertical pendular movements. And we were, we were quite surprised to notice that even his diaphragm was moving uh, in tandem with his eyes as well as his palate. So this is imaging. So at admission, as I mentioned, he had right basal ganglia bleed, which we, thought, we thought was probably garden variety hypertensive bleed as evidenced by uh, multiple uh, asymptomatic uh, micro bleeds. Um, well, there was also a possibility that, you know, he may have some, because we didn't know how severe his hypertension or how long his hypertension was. So we also will consider the possibility that he may have some form of amyloid angiopathy at the same time. As you can see, there's also quite a bit of white matter changes. But most interestingly, uh, even six months into the uh, six months after his initial presentation, the scan does not show any olivary uh, signal changes or hypertrophy, the, 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 the types that we saw in the early other patient, as well as the type that we saw in Carmen's patient. In terms of investigation, his spinal tap at the peak of his illness was significant for mainly uh, uh, increased white cells, but not much protein. His workup for autoimmune causes, uh, specifically autoimmune encephalitis and paraneoplastic antibodies associated with uh, obsoclonus like eye movements were all negative. But very interestingly, he had specific and non-specific 
uh, markers of uh, auto-inflammatory state. So for example, if D-dimer was very high, sorry about that. So D-dimer was very high. And you would also notice that IL-6 in the beginning of his uh, admission was within normal limits. But within two weeks, when he started developing all this uh, uh, physical findings that we, I, was, I was showing you, it had gone up uh, very markedly. Okay. Interestingly, he also had uh, uh, evidence of uh, raised double-stranded DNA, which we again think it's, it's a manifestation of an auto-inflammatory reaction than anything specific. So then eventually with all this treatment, his mental state improved and he was transferred to a rehab facility, but he continued to remain bedridden and required a nasogastric tube for feeding. At six months, his ocular palatal tremor remains. Patient is still chair bound and requires assistance uh, with the activities of daily living, but um, considerable recovery with regards to cognition. And he still uh, requires rouse tube. That's, this is his, uh, uh, a video of him just a few weeks ago. You can see that he still has the vertical eye movements. The palate is still moving at the same rate as it was moving earlier. And his diaphragm is also moving. Um, fortunately, it's not very symptomatic from that point of view, um, except uh, the dysphagia hasn't improved. How was his uh, horizontal motility? Horizontal motility was normal. Vertical and horizontal motility was normal. So I think this is very interesting what you've shown about the evolving of his uh, eye motility from uh, saccadic intrusions to obsoclonus to uh, vertical pendulum nystagmus. I mean, you could see all in one patient. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And and we were also perplexed by, uh, by the fact that the MRs didn't show any lesion. So, so I think, uh, I mean, I may, may skip this because Carmen had already explained oculopal, the, the basis of the oculopal tremor and pathology in the gilla molare triangle. Uh, in our case, we thought that the patient's encephalitis was a brainstem encephalitis for the reasons that I've listed there. You know, he had uh, an encephalopathy, he had intractable hiccups, he had fluctuating blood pressures, he had obsoclonus, you know, and then subsequently developed the OPT. Right? Now, but in spite of that, even with serial imaging up to six months, uh, we didn't see any changes uh, in, the, in any parts of the brainstem, specifically nothing in the olives. As we know, this OPT, the changes in the uh, olive takes a while to occur. And uh, the hyper, T2 hyper intensity occurs first, then the olives become hypertrophic. Then with, with time, with many years of this going on, often the hypertrophy reverses and become atrophic. But in this patient, we've been seeing him from the beginning to six to seven months, and we haven't noticed anything that's happening in the brain, brain stem. But can you get OPT without a brain stem lesion? Well, o o OPT occurring subacutely in the absence of discernible radiological pathology has been described in neurodegenerative disorders like Alexander's disease, um, progressive ataxia palatal syndrome, spinocerebellar ataxia twin, type 20, GM2 gangliosidosis type 2, and rarely the apology mutations. But obviously, he doesn't have any of those. What about COVID itself? You know? Unlike uh, obsoclonus and ocular flutter, which has been well described in COVID-19 related encephalopathy, OPT has not been reported so far in the presence of acute COVID-19 encephalopathy. Prior to this, we had a number of patients that we reported with COVID-19 encephalopathy. One of them, the, in fact, it's the first case that we reported, actually had this uh, episodes of eye deviation that I alluded to earlier. So uh, conjugate eye movements that either go down, downwards or left or right, up or rightwards, remains there for a while and then comes back to center and often induced by head movement or head shaking. So that was seen in our first patient. And subsequently, we did have two patients who had obsoclonus, saccharic intrusions, as well as myorrhythmia, you know, very resonant of what we would see in Whipple's disease. Now, we did look out for that in this particular patient. 
uh, but we didn't find it. Now, all these patients that I've described, although their clinical features are dramatic, the MRs were remarkable for being quite uh, normal, meaning there were no specific lesions in the brain stem as well as in the rest of the brain. But uh, inflammatory markers are often very high and they all, all, all of them responded very well to a sequence of uh, immunotherapy. And, and the usual sequence we start off with steroids, immunoglobulins, and uh, with greater understanding of COVID pathology, there is now a tendency when we discuss with the infectious disease doctors, there's a tendency for us to go to tocilizumab quite early. There was also a question about him. He was, because, you know, as I said, he's a, he was a patient who didn't really take care of himself very well. So he didn't really take care of his hypertension before. So apparently he was uh, also had, he also had very poor vision prior to getting this illness, and uh, it was uh, and we thought that he was probably chronic undiagnosed uh, glaucoma, uh, and his vision current vision is actually quite poor. So we wondered whether it could have contributed to his eye oscillations, but we don't think uh, the contribution can be is is is, is significant. If at all, it's a minor component that could have triggered off this um, pendulum movement. But we think it is most likely a COVID-related brainstem pathology uh, that, that, uh, that induced this problem. And uh, the, in terms of the pathophysiology, we think uh, in view of the fact that the actual vi viremia period was very innocuous, the lung manifestations were very benign, we think that the whole process was dissimune in nature. I think that's all I have to say about this case. And now I will um, uh, open the uh, discussion to the floor and to the experts for comments and advice. I think very nice, interesting cases and very well explained. Uh, just want a question for the Indian uh, friends of mine. Have you all seen uh, toline uh, uh, abuse in India? Is that commonly seen? I haven't seen even a single one and I wouldn't even have thought of asking the patient that do you inhale fevicol and clues. Dr. Mohanpati, can you stop sharing? Dr. Ambika or Shikha, anybody? Virendra? Uh, Dr. Jyoti, I have seen a case. Uh, uh, actually, that was the uh, sabotage by some dispute in the family. It was a factory where uh, the families have given Tolun. I don't know how they had the access for that. And in fact, uh, the whole family, they had hair loss, some severe AGE, and uh, it was like that. So in the family, almost three, four people have lost vision. And the patient who was brought to me had a bilateral vision drop and they were diagnosed as toluene toxicity and he had an optic atrophy with a constricted visual field. When I saw him, it was almost more than six months. And, uh, and I think apparently two of them died in that uh, group uh, poisoning, what they claimed to be. That is my only uh, experience, if at all. I have seen only as a bilateral vision loss and reported as a toluene toxicity. But how long do they have to inhale before they get symptoms? I mean, I don't know. This was not a uh, inhalation. In fact, they had they had claimed to have ingested two. I think interestingly, not commonly seen in India, though. Yeah, true. I think we can. Move I think the there's quite a bit of comments. quite a bit of discussion. Just one point. Quite a bit of discussion about treatment of the toluene toxicity. Yeah. So actually, this lady, most of her improvement was probably due to timing replacement and good uh, hospital food. And, uh, and, and she was much better. And she was happily walking around in the hospital ward with her eyes just going left, right, left, right, left, right. And she had no problems at all. She had no symptoms with regards to the pendulum nystagmus. So I think the only part that we fixed was the vernicase encephalopathy component of her presentation. Thank you. I think we'll move on to our next uh, speaker. So I'll now invite Dr. Luciano Simard, uh, who's an adjunct professor of ophthalmology 
at the Faculté de Ciencia Médicas de Minas Gerais at Brazil. And apologies if I've not pronounced it right. Uh, he's a specialty reviewer to ABO Journal. His areas of interest are demyelinating diseases, ischemic optic neuropathies, and vision-related quality of life. Over to you. You're muted, Luciano. Oh, here we go. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Uh, I would like to start uh, thanking Dr. Satya and our organizers for presenting here for the, the second time uh, during the global meeting. I'm really uh, proud to be here. Well, uh, we have a case of a 33-year-old woman with chief complaint, I'm seeing my baby double. Her history is a binocular vertical diplopia since the third month of her first gestation. She had tinnitus and she also uh, uh, denies uh, tr transient visual obscurations or headaches during that moment, nauseous or vomiting or only associated with gestation until the beginning of the diplopia. Uh, she denies other uh, neurologic symptoms uh, she had an eventful uh, delivery with cessation of the tinnitus by the second day of the delivery. Uh, her past medical history was relevant to cerebral venous sinus thrombosis after an international flight in 2018. This was diagnosed because she had a persistent and unbearable headache that made that make her uh, look for that symptom. Uh, she had no miscarriages, and the hematologic workup at that time of the, the flight uh, was completely normal. Varfarin was stopped because she wanted to get pregnant, so varfarin was used until six months uh, prior to pregnancy, and her family history was not contributory, including thrombophilia. Her first uh, ophthalmologic workup by a strabismo specialist at the beginning of the, the diplopia in the third month of the station uh, revealed the left fourth nerve palsy. The brain and orbits MRIs are, were normal, and, but however, several uh, uh, cerebral MRA and MRV revealed the recanalization within the left sigmoid, transverse sinuses, and internal jugular vein, vein attributed to chronic thrombos. Those findings uh, were considered the pre-existing radiologic findings and they were stable in comparison to the 2018 imaging. Uh, her first neuroophthalmic evaluation was done after two months of the delivery and eight months of the beginning of diplopia. Uh, her visual acuities uh, were normal bilaterally uh, pupils that were equal and no RAPT was found. Sleep lamp ex uh, examination and, and intraocular pressures were normal. Fundos uh, revealed tilted optic discs. However, ocular motility tests revealed the, the classical signs of a left for nerve palsy with head, right head tilt. Uh, as we he see here, we have the hypo function of uh, superior oblique and the greater deviation on her left uh, head tilt and on right deviation. Here are the, the pictures of the patient and we can clearly see the, hyper, the left hypertropia, uh, including on her left tilt, left head tilt. So uh, what will you do next in a 33 year old woman with the chief complaint of seeing my baby double, she had a uh, left nerve palsy already uh, diagnosed by the, the, the strabismo specialist uh, that appeared on the third uh, month of, of this gestation and tinnitus cessation after two days after the delivery. MRI and MRV uh, done at that moment uh, revealed no new signs of venous sinus, uh, thrombosis or stenosis and were considered stable in comparison to 2018 findings. 
So we decided to order a second uh, cerebral MRA and MRV, and surprisingly, duro arterial venous fistula uh, was seen between the left transverse sigmoid sinus and trunk branches of the posterior meningeal occipital and posterior trunk of the middle meningeal arteries. And indeed, no new signs of venous thrombosis or stenosis was, was seen. Uh, she was uh, referred to the neurosurge neurovascular surgeon, and he confirmed Conar fistula classification type 2A, uh, that uh, we can find retrograde follow uh, flow pattern in the sinus with the reflux of the uh, to the control of sinus and torcola. As we see here, the present case, uh, we have that uh, communication, abnormal communication uh, between those structures. And uh, the question arises: may fistula give rise to thrombosed sinus or vice versa, as she had that chronic CVST and with acute DAVF uh, symptoms? And the relation between them are like a chicken eggs issue, because we, we, we cannot affirm uh, precisely what comes first. Uh, indeed, uh, thrombosis are believed in some stages in the fistula development uh, happen due to a stenosis or thickening of the sinus walls. And in, on the other hand, thrombosis may promote opening of small physiological AV pathways in the wall of the sinus or abnormal uh, connection formation during recanalization. And, and what about pregnancy? Does it uh, potentially trigger the formation of the AVF? According to this case report uh, of dural arterial venous fistula during twin pregnancy, the relation between pregnancy and the AVF is not well known, but we can find uh, that there are some reasonable explanations to correlate them. Uh, as uh, we have venous hypertension by the compression of inferior vena cava by the uterus ravidarian, uh, increased the concentration of VAGF, hemodynamic shifting, as, a, as we can see, increased the cardiac output, output and blood volume, red cell mass, hypercoagulable uh, state, and also you can, you can uh, never uh, forget the complex hormonal environment that it's related to pregnancy. And what about the left for nerve palsy uh, and the DAVF? Uh, dural uh, arterial venous, uh, uh, arterial venous fistulas uh, causing isolated uh, trochlear nerve palsy is exceptional. It has been described in an isolated reports as a result of nerve compression of the level of the superior orbital fissure or secondary to a mesencephalic vascular malformation. But series of uh, AV fistulas of the tentorial region fail to report similar cases. And what are the, what's the uh, pattern uh, physiologic mechanisms involved with the fourth nerve palsy in this case? is the vascular compression of the trochlear, trochlear nerve by a duro arterial venous fistula. Here is her follow-up. I've seen, uh, I saw her in the last neurophthalmic exam, exam after the third month of the successful uh, surgical repair of the DA, DAVF by arterial embolization. She had relief of the diplopia by the first day of the, the surgery, and she almost had complete resolution of the fourth nerve palsy. Now she, she says that she, she sees uh, only one baby most of the time, uh, as she had diplopia only on the right gaze. Here are the, the pictures that uh, show improvement of her left uh, hypotropia. And we can also uh, see how uh, it improves here on her left uh, head tilt. And can, you can uh, compare here before and after the surgery, how she, she gets a better, uh, a better uh, gaze position uh, after the, the successful uh, procedure. So we have a 33 year old woman uh, that uh, had uh, that was in her first first gestation. No thrombophilia was was found in 2018. No miscarriages. 
the AVF in pregnancy uh, of this case uh, happened most likely previous uh, by the previous C CSVT causing the DAVF. And DAVF of dural sinus in pregnancy, only, there is only one case published uh, regarding superior oblique myokemia. So we don't have uh, the, the fourth nerve palsy as our case uh, been published yet. In most cases of carvernal sinus uh, of DAVF and pregnancy uh, uh, were reported until date only uh, eight reported cases. And the finding of fourth nerve palsy uh, with uh, DAVF is exceptional uh, occurrence. Bahut uh, shukriya, special thanks. From here, open to the discussion. Uh, thank you for a wonderful case. Incidentally, on Saturday, I saw a similar patient, but he has, he came after embolization was done for his DAVF and he came with a fourth nerve palsy. So let's see whether post-treatment that would change. He realized that after the embolization, he's developed a fourth nerve. So Ramesh, do you want to make any comments? Or any other, pa any other panelist or other faculty? And, yeah, Jyoti, thank you so much. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Luciano, fantastic case. Uh, only thing is, uh, I just wanted to know the patient had any kind of uh, disc edema, papilloma. She she is uh, uh, high. Uh, she has high myopic, so she had that tilted tilted disc only. Okay, because uh, the interesting part here is uh, with the left hypotropia of very tiny. Most people will think about uh, either trauma or decompensated or some kind of uh, traumatic where uh, I don't think so there was any kind of torsion because it can cause bilateral superior oblique palsy. So I'm just, uh, I'm just coming to the fact that why an MRV and MRI is ordered because if MRV is not ordered, we may not pick up in this case. So that was one thing uh, I had. And the second question is, uh, what are the risk factors? Obviously she had... Uh, some of this, is it uh, she has any kind of uh, prothrombotic risk factor she has or uh, she does not have anything? Because some of the th times we have seen the homocysteine, which can be an isolated risk factor at this age. That's one of the things I just wanted to ask. That's very, very good questions. Uh, she, she, she did have uh, uh, the MRA and MRV and then I... Uh, uh, I asked for the, the neurovascular surgeon to, to proceed with the investigation. And what about the, uh, the, the thrombophilia? Uh, she, she was uh, investigated by uh, the hematologist only in 2018. At this time, as she, as she uh, was not uh, uh, told to, to follow with him anymore, and she only uh, she only uh, got him back again because she wanted uh, to get pregnant. So she she was on heparin during all all, all pregnancy and uh, two weeks after the delivery. And then he he doesn't uh, uh, tell about uh, following with the, the anticoagulants again. You know. But uh, as, as we see, it, uh, uh, another uh, risk factor for, for the, her CSVT was that she was on, on estrogen contraceptives uh, yeah. on, in 2018. And after that international flight, maybe she was uh, flying to India and then we had to, to <laughs> keep <laughs> inside the plane. Uh, Going to check this with her. Uh, and then she... She, she had that uh, when she came back to, to Brazil. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Any? Uh, another, another concern, uh, if uh, like, we, like I, uh, I show uh, about that case uh, of, of uh, oblique superior myokemia during, pre during twin pregnancy, it was a challenge case for them uh, because they... Uh, they uh, uh, they had to to correct the fistula during pregnancy. So uh, and, and can we see here if the the fistula was diagnosed during during the pregnancy, 
uh, as it uh, was it uh, uh, performed. Uh, that's the I think that you, we we may we may face uh, everywhere, and and you see like that case that was successful repair, you know. Yeah, uh, only suggestion or uh, some kind of comment I had was uh, if there is myokymia, most of the patients will have kind of oscillopsia. It's not mm -hmm. like a typical double baby syndrome they will have, especially in the gaze of uh, superior oblique action or even in primary gaze. What they mm -hmm. see is mostly of oscillopsia. That, that's that's a common feature, especially because of the neurovascular compression and it can disturb the, the neuronal channels there. So that's the kind of subtle differentiating feature between the superior oblique palsy and this. And we also have seen uh, some of the patients with Arnold Chiari. And I, I still remember one of the patients with, uh, he was a horse rider. He had a head-on collision and he had this... Uh, papilledema with the superior oblique palsy. Again, it was bilateral. There it can compress on both the sides. So this is typically unilateral. It looks like because uh, the, the number of uh, you know torsion either with the fundus photography or with the double medox rod would have been uh, helpful to differentiate that aspect because the hyper is very, very minimal in the primary position. Yeah, Jyoti, you are saying something. No, I was just saying that in adult, in a young patient, it's important to also look for ischemic causes, more so in pregnancy as the possibility of thromboembolic could be there. You look out for other reasons, which is like in my patient, a patient after having undergone embolization had it. So we, in addition to see whether it resolves, you may also have to look at other uh, factors as you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Samant is asking a question about, uh, would you keep a diagnosis of ocular myasthenia gravis in this case? in the absence of papilledema, would you have considered? Oh, as she has uh, uh, a past med medical history of the chronic sinus venous thrombosis, I consider it unlikely, but my senior, you know, is, our, uh, is, is always a challenging uh, diagnosis, but by this time, <laughs> no, uh, I think uh, I can consider more as uh, uh, previous CVST as a as a risk factor to to the uh, DAV uh, fistula formation, and I don't know if she uh, would like to to get pregnant again. So that that's my concern. If when she comes back, and I will advise her, and maybe I'm gonna uh, try to to. To 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 uh, ask the hematology people or neurosurgeon uh, about this if it's uh, indicated or not, because uh, we won't have uh, any any bad situations regarding the, the mom and the and in the fetus, you know. But that, that's a concern. Uh, myasthenia is always on, on, on our mind. Yeah. Yeah, the rarity of myasthenia in pregnancy and the kind of in myasthenia presenting as superior oblique palsy is uh, two rare things, but still mm. we can do a serum assay. That's uh, nothing wrong in doing it, but uh, here in retrospect, probably we have an answer. I see some more question from Dr. Rambika. Uh, great case, uh, Dr. Luciano. But how soon you plan for a inner setting of DSA such a small angle of acquired fourth nerve palsy. Yeah, I think she had a, a great, a, a great uh, uh, result uh, as she is not uh, complaining about the fourth nerve palsy. And then I think she's quite well. Uh, and we can follow her uh, and see what uh, are the, 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 the things that she would like to to manage in the future, you know, but uh, I would like to, to thank all the devices, you know. Yeah, so okay, thank Dr. Amish and Dr. Luciano, we move on to the last case for this particular session. Okay, thank you. And for that, I'd like to invite Dr. Anand Moodley. He's an honorary associate professor 
an affiliated associate professor at the University of the Free State, University of the Kuala Zulu Natal, Durban, South Africa. He has previously served as a HOD of neurology at the University of the Free State, South Africa. He has a special interest in eye movement disorders. His focus of research lies in neuroophthalmology, and he takes much pleasure in the teaching of general neurology and neuroophthalmology to the undergraduates and the postgraduate students. He supervises masters and doctoral students and plays an active role in the South African College of Neurology as an examiner, convener, and moderator for neurology board exams. Over to you. Thank you, Jyoti. And um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, um, I've been enjoying the, the meeting so far and the cases have been absolutely excellent. Um, and unfortunately, I think my case um, is not as clear cut, but um, hopefully I can get some guidance from the, from the group in terms of what the diagnosis is. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, um, I call it the missing middle, and uh, you know the missing middle in South Africa has a different meaning. It actually refers to um, uh, uh, um, individuals who, who cannot afford to go to university were sponsored uh, by the uh, by the government, and um, and then you have people who can afford to go, um, and the missing middle is basically those who are not sponsored and still can't afford to go, and it's a major problem that we have here in the country. Uh, where tertiary education uh, is, is a huge problem. But I'm using it in a completely different context, um, and, and you'll see why as we go along. Um, my patient was a 53-year-old black male, and you find, I think this is the fourth out of the fifth case that we presented today with individuals in their 50s. Uh, it seems to be a, a horrible age for, for neuro-ophthalmological diseases. But anyway, a month prior to assessment, uh, while he was self-inducing his vomiting, it's, it's a practice by, by the Zulu culture in, in KwaZulu Natal to actually clean the, their stomach by drinking a liter of water and then inducing vomiting by sticking the finger to the back of the throat. And apparently it's supposed to clean the, the, the stomach and they do this probably about once a month and it's not by everybody. I mean, there's some people who do this on a regular basis and this was one such individual. And, um, and he lost consciousness while doing this. And on, on awakening two days later in hospital, he was experiencing visual hallucinations. He saw these wild animals running towards and then away from him. It, these episodes would last about five to 10 minutes and mostly involving animals, uh, springbok, kudu, a, a type of buck. They were non-threatening and but he was aware that these were unreal. Uh, but in addition to that, he had binocular horizontal diplopia in all directions of gaze bilateral ptosis and no diurnal fluctuation. Um, he was otherwise well, um, specifically he had no headaches, no constitutional symptoms, um, the typical binocular diplopia, uh, no fluctuation. He recently diagnosed hypertensive and he was HIV negative. He stopped driving since Christmas 2021 uh, as a result of, of uh, poor vision, which he described on the right side, but it wasn't clearly defined. And on examination, he was generally well. Um, his vital signs were, were normal. Uh, even his BP was fine, but he did have features of established hypertension. His pupils um, on the left was about four millimeters and on the right, two millimeters in ambient light. And in darkness, uh, the difference was about one millimeter. Direct and consensual light reflexes were normal. His visual acuity was intact. He had some hypertensive changes. Discs were normal and by confrontation, he had features of a right homonymous hemianopia. And in fact, by Humphreys, um, he had, uh, it confirmed that he, in fact, he did in fact have right homonymous hemianopia, as you can see. And this is what he looked like, quite severe bilateral ptosis, uh, no fluctuation, no fatigability. Um, you can see he's got a left exotropia as well, and it's hypertropic. And I hope this video plays well. I will play that again. 
So um, as you can see, he's got this left hypertropia. Looking to the left, he's got some abducting nystagmus as well as to the right with limitation of adduction. Some limitation of up gaze, but significant limitation of down gaze, as you can see. And um, convergence was lost. And there was some improvement to vestibular ocular reflex. Um, I seem to have lost that video, unfortunately, um, but you have to take my word for it. Uh, let's just stop that and go to the next slide. So there was no diurnal variability, no lid, lid fatigability, uh, no extraocular muscle fatigability, some improvement with BOR. And a lot of the signs looking for myasthenia gravis was negative. I like the bean frank sign. No ocular quiver type movements. Um, and in fact, the rest of his neurological examination was, was normal. He had no long track signs, intact facial sensation. So based on his signs and symptoms, where would you localize the lesion? Is this a frontal eye field lesion? Frontal eye field, certainly horizontal gaze palsy with a unilateral lesion, but bilateral frontal eye fields can give you vertical gaze problems as well. Is this midbrain, uh, pons, uh, subarachnoid space, cavernous sinus, neuromuscular junction or extraocular muscles that may be affected? Um, I will move on. Oh, brain. do we have an answer? Midbrain. Yeah, it, it looks like it's a midbrain problem, isn't it? I mean, he's got bilateral ptosis, most likely from central caudal nucleus involvement. He's got this bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, ophthalmoplegia with left exotropia. He's got skew deviation, most likely bilateral MLF involvement. He's got this down gaze palsy with some improvement in VOR. They have bilateral RI MLF involvement. There's loss of convergence. So it makes it midbrain as opposed to pontine. And then another possibility is bilateral nuclear fascicular third. So that's what, what we thought is most likely uh, was responsible for this patient's eye signs. And which vascular territory is involved? Well, midbrain, posterior circulation, certainly. Um, and that's what we were concerned about. And of course, he had this right homonymous hemianopia as well. We shouldn't forget that. Well, the next question is, how would you account for his visual hallucinations? Release hallucinations from an occipital lobe infant? Temporal lobe epilepsy, peduncular hallucinosis, or drug or toxin induced? Mr. Panelist. The hallucinations don't seem to be related to the, the midbrain lesion. Well, in a, a good point. But I mean, if you look at the hallucinations from an occipital lobe infarct, but remember, he's got this right homonymous hemianopia, and then he has what looks like midbrain ischemia. But in terms of the occipital lobe infarct itself, he could have uh, 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 occipital lobe uh, release hallucinations. Uh, remember, he, this problem has been from last year. Um, so these patients tend to have uh, unformed uh, hallucinations, lights, colors, shapes, lines, geometric designs. Occipital lobe seizures, very similar as well, simple hallucinations. Temporal lobe seizures, on the other hand, remember the temporal lobe is also supplied by the posterior circulation, um, can be complex. Uh, they have formed hallucinations, but it's seldom without other features of temporal lobe epilepsy, the typical rising epigastric sensation, uh, um, automandibular type of automatisms, uh, picking at their clothing, etc. cetera, uh, deja vu experiences, and, and they have other hallucinations as well. And then there's the next entity of peduncular hallucinosis. And peduncular hallucinosis actually arises from the midbrain. Um, and these patients with peduncular hallucinosis um, have complex visual hallucinations. They tend to be quite vivid and colorful. Um, they may have few to multiple per day, uh, can last a few minutes to a few hours. And this patient, it lasted about five to 10 minutes, can be self-limiting, fortunately for the patient. And the pathophysiology is perhaps that there's dysfunction of the, of the reticular activating system or this pontine geniculate occipital pathway. And, and this is basically what he was looking at. This is the springbok, it's a national animal. And that's a kudu, that's what a kudu looks like. And this is what he was seeing walking around him. Um, and fortunately for him, the, the number of these episodes was decreasing by the time he had seen us. And whilst we're getting them quite frequently in the day, by the time he had seen us, it was probably about once or twice a day. So this is about a month after the onset of the problem. Now we were told that he's, we went ahead and did an MRI scan of his brain and we were told that his midbrain was entirely normal. 
but that in fact he had um, a left occipital lobe infarct, and that would explain his lithomonomous amenopia quite clearly. Um, but I, I enjoyed this quote from, from the Journal of Neuro Ophthalmology, actually, that neuro ophthalmology has been defined as a field where one reinterprets previously normal images. So we had to look at it ourselves, uh, and this I'm, is what I'm, it looks I'm, like. I just ask during that episode of vomiting and you know binge drinking was there any episode, uh, issues with the sodium could he have could no. He have the, no no uh, the apparently metabolically was fine um but he did lose consciousness okay, and that that was of that was quite concerning but apparently metabolically was fine we don't have all the notes from the time he was admitted at the time so a lot of the history is sketchy and um and we didn't have collateral information from his family either so that that was also lacking um, but, uh, you. Um, you. I, 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 you know, I, I would say that perhaps metabolically was fine because he was being treated by, um, a, a well-known hospital in, in KZN. It's a district hospital, but, uh, run by, by very reputable people. So they would have done blood tests for him at the time and would have indicated if he had any metabolic problems. But coming back to his scan, as you can see, he, the, the occipital lobe infarct is quite clear. It's high point tense on T2-weighted image. Um, uh, and there's, there's, uh, there's atrophy associated, associated with it, as you can see, some hyperintensity, hypointensity, um, and there's some uh, traction glyosis causing um, exvacuo dilatation of the occipital horn. But in addition, one can see that the, the midbrain looks very good, actually. And even the, the thalamus, you can't see any lesion in the thalamus, none in the midbrain, um, and even going lower down in the midbrain, that's at the level of the superior colliculus, at the inferior colliculus level, once again, you don't see much. Uh, <clears throat> these are pictures higher up. Once again, you can see the infarct that he had. Um, and even on coronals, the midbrain looks fairly pristine. Um, this is a, a susceptibility weighted imaging, which shows hemosiderin, so you did have bleeding. This is a blooming artifact, and did you, have, you did have a hemorrhagic infarct involving the left occipital lobe uh, in December last year. Uh, T2 flare showing a very similar uh, appearance of the lesion as T2, uh, but in addition, you can see multiple white matter hyperintensities. So you had small vessel disease as well. And um, the MRA um, of the circle of Willis looked fairly good as well. The basilar artery, the circle of Willis itself looked fine. The middle cerebral arteries looked okay, and so did the ACA. Uh, in terms of the posterior circulation, the upper part of the vertebral artery looked okay. But if you looked at the extracranial part of the vertebral artery, that is severely diseased bilaterally. So this could account certainly for his occipital lobe infarct and uh, posterior circulation problems. Um, he had other investigations done. His acetylcholine receptor antibody was negative. We don't have anti-musk available, but it wasn't the typical presentation of a, a, a musk uh, type of myasthenia gravis. Um, repetitive nerve stimulation test, the obiculus oculi showed no decrement. And um, we did a neostigmine test, don't have tensilon anymore. Uh, and that was negative. Uh, his cardiac echo uh, was also normal, uh, apart from the left ventricular hypertrophy, and his thyroid function tests were normal. Uh, we did his EEG, which was, which was normal, and uh, CSF examination was entirely normal as well. So at this point, um, what is the possible cause for his eye signs in the setting of a normal brainstem MRI? Would we still consider myasthenia gravis in this patient? Thiamine deficiency, if he was over-enthusiastic with his, with his retching and vomiting of the, uh, of the, liquid, uh, the fluid that he was drinking and, and trying to clean his, his stomach? Could there still be a midbrain or thalamic infarct? We know that if it's done very early, you can miss it. But I mean, this was a month later and you couldn't see it. Um, or the slices are very thick, but these are contiguous slices. So we wouldn't have missed that. Um, could this be hypoxic ischemic involvement of the perineuronal nets? Something that has become a bit more popular in the last few decades. You can go through that. Botulism, drugs, Miller-Fisher syndrome, very unlikely in this patient in view of the history and presentation. This is a case we actually um, uh, had published in our, our local journal uh, last year, and we call it the vertical gaze maze. And, and this is a patient who presented in a very similar way, actually. Um, she had, um, uh, she, she actually had tuberculous meningitis and she complicated with, with a brainstem infarct. And you'd find that on primary gaze, she had this left hypertropia, she had this exotropia as well. 
Um, but otherwise on horizontal gaze, she had fairly good movements. So unlike our patient with bilateral intranuclear pneumoplegia, she had good horizontal movements, but marked limitation of down gaze, as you can see from the picture below. And she did improve uh, with vestibular ocular reflex. And you would find that um, her MRI scan did show a lesion where we were expecting to find one at the tegmentum of the midbrain. This is T1 showing hyperintense lesions bilaterally, T2 there's hyperintensity. On the sagittal view, you can see this hypo intensity as well involving the tegmentum of the midbrain. And on ADC mapping, there's no restricted diffusion. This wasn't an acute infarct. And there was some um, ectasia of the distal part of the basilar artery which you see in patients with HIV vasculopathy and she was HIV infected. In fact, we, uh, our, our theory behind this is that this is probably a, an artery of Percheron occlusion, the single vessel that comes from the, from the PCA um, supplying uh, bilateral medial thalamus as well as the RIMLF bilaterally, uh, the third nerve nuclei sometimes bilaterally as well, but here we think it is probably RIMLF bilaterally. And um, just to pull out your notes and, and look at um, uh, what causes down gaze palsy and up gaze palsy in terms of the nuclei involved, we know that you've got to have bilateral RIMLF involvement for a down gaze palsy, but unilateral RIMLF for an up gaze palsy. Posterior commission involvement can give you an up gaze palsy, and um, bilateral frontal eye field involvement can give you up gaze and down gaze palsy. Um, and in this case, we felt that there must have been a, perhaps a bilateral RIMLF lesion to account for the down gaze palsy in this patient. A bit on perineuronal nets, and, and this, this is really uh, throwing it out there, showing the, our uncertainty in terms of what was causing this patient's problem. Um, this has been described some time ago by Golgi, as you can see, and it initially in the 60s was thought to be part of the blood-brain barrier. But it actually uh, described the perineuronal net, it consists of chondroitin, chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans which surround fast firing neurons, the saccadic, saccadic burst neurons and omnipause neurons. It's a, what was described as past positive material surrounding the nerve cells. And they have various functions. They perhaps have a role to play in, in synaptic stabilization, the control of plasticity, because we know that the, when the perineuronal net is present, plasticity is not possible, but, but when it's absent is when the nerve is more likely to to undergo plasticity. So it's a feature of maturation of the nerve cell. And, and it's broken down in hypoxic and ischemic conditions. And, and there are case reports looking at perineuronal nets where um, commonly, well, in most of these case reports, it's following cardiac surgery. And this is a case where uh, it's a patient who had aortic valve replacement. And uh, after she recovered from the anesthetic, and she was in her 50s as well, actually, after she recovered from anesthetic, she noticed that she had difficulty with her vision and she was found to have saccadic palsies, both horizontal and vertical. And she was one, uh, on one of the, this is a, a paper published in 2015. Um, and about two years after she had developed the problem, she hadn't really recovered uh, from this gaze paresis, but um, she used to um, abuse alcohol uh, quite a bit, had liver failure, and she actually demised from very severe liver failure. And her brain was looked at pathologically. And what they found, or histologically, what they found is that uh, in the omnipause neurons and the RIMLF, so this is the control on the left, and this is the patient with the saccadic palsy, uh, you'll find that there's absence of this perineuronal nets, so the specific staining for chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. Uh, which appears black in this in this um, uh, histology specimen. And where they are absent or they fragmented, you can find that there's actually um, a gap there between the nerve and the rest of the uh, brain tissue. Uh, so it can be fragmented, it can be absent. And, and obviously it, it affects the, the functioning um, of the nerve cells. So even though the nerve cells are intact, um, their functioning is affected. Um, so it causes dysfunctioning of the burst and omnipause neurons. Uh, the MRI was normal in this patient, uh, but a, a, a saccadic, saccadic pathways are dysfunctional. And the, the omnipause neurons, the excitatory burst neurons, the inhibitory burst neurons are the ones are most affected by this. But in our patient, we've got MLF involvement. Uh, we've got, in addition, uh, uh, the central caudal nucleus involvement. So there's a lot more going on than just the excitatory burst neurons in the eye MLF. So um, this, this is the challenge that we were faced with. Uh, we, you know, we, ha we have a patient who has midbrain ischemia, uh, peduncular lucinosis, 
loss of consciousness at the onset uh, with eye signs suggestive of a midbrain disorder. I think the loss of consciousness is key here. Uh, it tells us that there must have been involvement of the reticular activating system in this patient for him to have lost uh, consciousness if we believe that the metabolic profile was normal. Um, so is this midbrain ischemia or are we looking at just straightforward bilateral nuclear or fiscular third nerve palsy? But in, that, in, such case, in such a case, I, I would expect that you would find uh, long track signs in those patients. You know? the, the, the classic um, third nerve eponyms of midbrain, the Weber and the Benedicts and North Nagel syndromes from fascicular involvement uh, or even nuclear involvement, unilateral nuclear involvement with bilateral ptosis and elevation weakness. Uh, there was a lot more going on in this patient. Um, and I think uh, in, it may be just straightforward third nerve palsy, or it could be midbrain ischemia, which is more extensive. But why we were not seeing it in imaging, I'm not certain. Some things to ponder about is that we know that myasthenia gravis is a great mimicker. Um, I thought we did sufficient uh, amount of investigations to exclude the diagnosis. We didn't do single fiber EMG. In our unit, um, you've got to do it yourself. Uh, I just didn't get down to doing it. Always consider the possibility in external ophthalmoplegia. Consider myasthenia gravis, especially when imaging and clinical signs do not match. I think that's important. So apart from the fact that eye signs don't fit in with a particular nerve palsy, uh, imaging doesn't match your clinical signs, you still think of myasthenia. Following up these patients to check the changing clinical signs is important. Don't rely on MRI reports. The uh, problem with radiologists is that they don't know where to look for the pathology, so you've got to guide them. But in this case, they were spot on. The midbrain looked normal. Could this be hypoxia to the perineuronal nets? Um, we're not certain. And uh, what should we do? Present such patients at conferences like this to solicit learned opinions. So that's where I am. Thank you. Jyoti? Yeah, I think very interesting case. Uh, as classically mentioned, the left occipital infarct correlates with uh, the hallucinosis, which you saw, and also the right uh, homonymous hemianopia. But what incidentally I felt regarding the ocular motility is that when you were checking the saccades, the patient was looking, the adduction, you could see that there was an abrupt stoppage. If you're looking at something where there's a palsy, we would expect something like a floating saccade, which was not seen. So what my consideration is, that is one we can keep in mind, is a break of fusion. A patient who's gotten through so much can have a loss of fusion happening where a patient otherwise like an intermittent exotropia lands up getting into a permanent uh, alternating exotropia. Could that be one possibility that we can think of? Yes, however, it doesn't fit the possibility of a down gaze uh, limitation, which he also had. But if you look at the motility, it is so perfectly stopping at minus two adduction. So my thing is, are we really looking at a palsy or something like the fusion is broken up and over time he's having a limitation? So that's one thing I'm yeah, that, I understand where you're coming from in terms of the horizontal movements, but I think yes, one right. can't ignore the vertical movements. Exactly, I said, that is not fitting And the in. bilateral ptosis, the significant bilateral ptosis that developed, um, and the fact that he had um, this, what I thought was pedunculate hallucinosis. They were formed hallucinations, more in keeping with the midbrain type. You know, the, the occipital lobe uh, hallucinations that the patients experience when they have a homonymous myanopia tends to be in the in the blind hemisphere. Um, this this patient had uh, hallucinations of involving the entire field. So I, 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 I thought it was less likely to be occipital lobe. And once again, with occipital lobe seizures and occipital lobe hallucinations, they don't, they're not so well formed where you would actually see animals, more likely to see lines and shapes and colors and flashes and that sort of thing. Um, I, 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 you, you're probably coming from, could this be just a decompensated squint that he yes, had? Yes. And, and that's what I'm we're talking about the horizontal, but yes, there are a few things, as you mentioned, down gaze, limitation, all that. But if we're yeah. not able to pick it up anything on a, uh, you know, on a MRI, then are we looking at uh, myasthenia as the other option? But having yeah. symmetrical uh, involvement to eyes is a little, uh, you know, we're not very classically of myasthenia. We'll have absolute yeah. symmetrical ptosis and down gaze uh, limitation and the adduction limitation. So. Yeah, and what I feel to, to include is that we've followed him up for, for a month. Uh, so we've seen him now for two months and there hasn't been any change to his eye signs. It looks almost identical. Um, we tried him on, on um, and, uh, mesting on when he was in the ward, which had no effect whatsoever. Um, and there's no fluctuation, you know, there's no fluctuation in his eye movements. There's no fluctuation in his ptosis. Um, and this was sudden onset. I mean, he collapsed and then it de developed. And we know that sometimes myasthenia can, can present quite acutely. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that the, the dramatic presentation that he had suggests his scheme. Right. So any other comments from any other faculty? There is a question in the chat from Daniel. Yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Jyoti and Vivek here. Yeah, Vivek. Yeah, I was wondering, like, you know, as there is no lesion in the, you know, the suspected areas, what we are thinking, the way this patient has presented clinically. So what about, you know, the supranuclear control on these nuclei? Like, if you look at the, you know, the occipital and the parato-occipital infarcts, which are representing, like, kind of AMC and PCA territory infarct. So... Does that uh, has implication of like supranuclear, uh, you know, the control over these nucleus, which we are looking for, but, you know, clinically they are presenting as if the midbrain is being involved. This is a direct question to Dr. Anand Murli. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of, of uh, supranuclear control of, of eye movements, uh, well, certainly saccadic movements, we're looking at the frontal eye fields. Your question is, could we, could you have, uh, Brodmann's area eight affected, and therefore he's got a gaze paresis. I would expect it to be bilateral for vertical gaze problems, unilateral for horizontal gaze problems. I mean, it's not that clear cut, but um, frontal eye fields uh, are, are better described with horizontal gaze palsies than it is with vertical. Uh, your question, could it be from a, the, a, the occipital lobe lesion? Very unlikely. Um, but you could see that the lesion was more than just occipital and perhaps extended into the parietal lobe. Uh, could that have resulted in a supranuclear gaze palsy? Not that common as well. Um, and then, of course, the other structures in the brainstem itself, uh, the RIMLF, the PPRF. Well, we know that it looks like he's got bilateral internuclear thermoplegia and loss of convergence. So MLF is definitely involved. It's got the skew deviation on the left side, also in keeping with an MLF lesion. So um, if, if anything, it, it could be a bit of, you know, and, and I, as a neurologist, I, I quite commonly see patients with lesions involving the thalamus and the midbrain, whether it's ischemic or it could be toxoplasmosis in HIV-infected patients, and we call this the diencephalic mesencephalic syndrome, uh, mostly because, you know, trying to tease out individual structures that are involved is so difficult. They present with a combination of, of clinical science, with uh, skew deviation, with sometimes with acute thalamic esotropia, uh, uh, patients will have what looks like vertical gaze palsies, horizontal gaze palsies, and it quite, quite can be quite a challenge trying to tease out what, what's really involved, because I think the structure is so small and, and you've got a large infarct in that area, so it must, must be involving a number of structures. And we know that, you know, the paramedian vessels that actually arise from the basilar artery can give you a tegmental type of infarct. We know the MLF is, is in the midline. We know the, M- the uh, RIMLF is close to the midline. The third nerve nucleus is close to the midline. So a number of these structures can be affected. But we had a normal MRI scan of the, of the midbrain. Uh, Dr. Anand, there's a question in the yeah. chat uh, by Dr. Daniel Gold. Uh, when was the MRI uh, done relative to the symptom onset? And was the uh, second MRI done? Yeah, the, the, the MRI was done a month later. So he had this collapse and everything uh, a month before pre- presentation to us. So the MRI was done a month later. So there's sufficient time for the lesion to be there, more than that. Okay. Uh, and you can see the occipital lobe infarct is quite old. I mean, that's from last year. Okay. And Dr. Ambika is asking if there is any role for diffusion brain or spec studies in such cases. Um, well, the diffusion scan uh, would have been done largely to see if this was an acute infarct or not. Um, and mind you, after uh, seven to 14 days, um, you wouldn't get restricted diffusion anymore. So, um, and um, uh, it was done at the time. I don't think it contributed much to, to uh, trying to establish what's wrong, wrong because it didn't show any mid-brain, midbrain lesion. Um, a spec scan, um, spec scanning of the brainstem is more difficult than of the cerebral hemispheres. Um, you'd see them more easily with cerebral hemisphere uh, involvement than, than brainstem because of the smaller structures. But um, no, we didn't do a spec scan. And is there a role for functional MRI in this? Uh, talking about uh, PET scanning, PET scan of the brain, looking at metabolic or SPECT again, SPECT looking at perfusion. No, no, functional MRI. Functional MRI, oh, okay. No, we, uh, I'm, I'm not certain actually whether uh, a bold uh, scan uh, would add more, but certainly it's, it's a thought and uh, it's something that we can look into. 
probably functional MRI keeping in mind the ischemic component that we are looking at, the perineuronal nets. I mean, this is a new concept that even we've heard, but maybe that gets picked up in a functional MRI. I'm not sure, but probably can be considered. If you're looking at a hypoxic ischemic event, but then so many days later of the event, we are not sure whether we'll be able to pick up now, right? That's great. All right, fine. So I think uh, we've come to the end of the session. I'd like to thank all the panelists, all the speakers for making this wonderful. And uh, now I hand it over to Dr. Jaspreet to start the next session for day two. Dr. So Satya will introduce him. Yeah. Dr. Jaspreet Sukhija is a professor, advanced eye center, pediatric ophthalmology and neuro ophthalmology division at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, India. He is also the president of Chandigarh Ophthalmological Society and a joint secretary of the North Zone Ophthalmological Society. He has more than 120 publications in peer reviewed index journals and I've also contributed in books. All India Ophthalmology Society International Heroes Award, Delhi Ophthalmology. Society Award, Orbis International Gold Medal, European Society of Cataract Refractive Surgery, and also Best Video at ESCRS, Om Prakash Award of Pediatric Ophthalmology by AIS are some of the awards that he has received. Over to you, Jaspreet. Thank you, Dr. Satya, for this kind introduction. And moving on with the second session uh, of the second day, uh, I'd like to first uh, introduce our uh, wonderful panelist and uh, is Dr. Preeti Patel Chablani. She's an associate professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah, and she did a fellowship at uh, Shankara Nitrale, uh, Chennai and at University of San Diego, California. She was a former faculty uh, at LVP for almost seven years, and her research interests include uh, pediatric neuro-ophthalmology, strabismus, and CVI. So our second panelist, Dr. Murli Dharbi, is the chief of uh, Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Neuro-Ophthalmology at uh, Coimbatore, India. He received uh, his training in strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology at uh, New York Eye Infirmary Hospital and Moran Eye Center. He was a previously senior consultant at Sankara Nitralai Chennai. And of course, he has, uh, to his credit, many publications in national and international journals and uh, conducts uh, in, in instruction courses at uh, national and regional conferences. So next is, uh, we have Dr. Savita Rath, uh, who's a consultant pediatric ophthalm ophthalmologist, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmologist at Shroff's Eye Center. Uh, she's done a fellowship training in pediatric ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmology from LPPI Hyderabad. Her areas of interest include optic neuropathies and cerebral visual impairment. She's actively involved in uh, teaching activities and training programs at uh, Shop Hospital and has many publications and awards to her credit. Uh, we have Dr. Rebecca Dimon, who's a budding uh, ophthalmologist, assistant professor at Ames, Delhi. Uh, she's had a training there and has authored more than 75 publications and several chapters and books related to strabismus and uh, neuro-ophthalmology. And she's uh, presented several papers in national and international conferences and won several awards. So with that, we come to our first speaker, who is going to be Dr. Zoe Williams. Uh, she's an associate professor of ophthalmology, neurology, and neurosurgery, and the chief of neuro-ophthalmology at the University of uh, Rochester Medical Center in New York. She serves on the American Board of Ophthalmology, Neuro-Ophthalmology Exam Development Committee and an oral board examiner. She's also the section editor of uh, what we most of us would be seeing on the, um, on the internet that's a novel, The Virtual Education Library. She's authored uh, over 30 peer reviewed publications, several book chapters, and is a recipient of uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award and Dr. IV Dresden Leadership Development Grant from the North American Neuro Ophthalmologic Society. And then with that, I would invite uh, Dr. Zoe William to please uh, start her case. Thank you so much for the kind introduction to present at this great conference. I've certainly learned a lot from everyone so far. I have no financial disclosures, 
And the title of my case is Rapid Blindness, Not the Sinus. Our patient is a 62 year old with ovarian cancer on chemotherapy since 2018 and a history of chronic sinusitis, status post endoscopic sinus surgery at an outside hospital in July, 2022, who developed progressive vision loss in her right eye over one week. Two days before I saw her, she reports that she had discovered she had no vision in the right eye when she occluded her left eye. She had not noticed any vision change in her left eye. On review of systems, she reported right orbital pain and headaches since July. She had a two-day history of right-sided ptosis with no double vision. She also reported jaw and right ear pain, anorexia with an eight-pound weight loss over six weeks, malaise and fatigue. Of note, she denied any fevers or jaw claudication. Her past medical history was significant for stage 3C ovarian carcinoma sarcoma, which was treated with hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy and infracolic omentectomy uh, due to mental studying. Her only other surgery was her endoscopic sinus surgery. She was on chemotherapy and bevacizumab and she was taking antibiotics and steroid rinses, nasal steroid rinses since her surgery. The only prior neuroimaging that she had was this preoperative non-contrast CT of the sinus. It actually was performed five months before her uh, sinus surgery in July uh, because of the um, delays that were incurred by her chemotherapy. And basically what this had shown was bilateral small osteomas in the frontal sinus. And because of a history of uh, recurrent sinonasal obstruction, her ENT had recommended surgery. So in July, 2022, she underwent uh, bilateral frontal sinusostomy with removal of the left frontal os osteoma and also bilateral total ethmoidectomy, maxillary antrostomy, and sphenoidotomy. And the pathology was largely unremarkable and her culture did grow strep and staph. So she was started on antibiotics and at week one, her endoscopy looked good. And then at week two, she reported increasing post-operative pain. And at that time, her ear, nose and throat uh, specialist started her on prednisone 30 milligrams daily. By week three, she reported significant facial pain and pressure, right ear pain and fatigue. Endoscopy was performed and there was some thick crusting along the right ethmoid roof, which was partially debrided and uh, cultures were performed and showed acromobacter and stenotrophomonas. So at that point, her antibiotics were switched and she was also started on narcotics for pain and an ID consult was placed. Week four, she reported worsening pain in her head, ears, face, and teeth. She was started on tramadol and referred to the pain clinic. And in week five, she called her ENT and reported total numbness in her mouth, as well as continued facial pain and headaches. She was told that the numbness was normal postoperatively, and she was seen for endoscopy, um, which again showed crusting. The cultures were performed this time, including fungal culture, which was pending, and her aerobic culture came back with the same bacteria. Uh, she was again switched on her antibiotics and started on hydromorphone. And then at week six, she called to report vision loss in her right eye. At that time, she was told the sinuses were clear. This is unrelated. And so she sought care with her primary care doctor for her persistent pain, headaches, and now vision loss. And he drew ESR and CRP, both of which were elevated, and then uh, did a same-day referral to ophthalmology. So on exam, her visual acuity was no light perception in the right eye. She was 20-25 in the left eye with full color vision. She had no anisocoria. Her right pupil was sluggish. Uh, to direct, and she had a three plus uh, front pupillary defect on the right. Interocular pressures were normal. In the left eye, she had a dense nasal uh, visual field defect without any corresponding change in her optic nerve or retina. On the efferent exam, she had a mild exotropia and ophthalmoplegia of the right eye. Her left eye motility was normal. To cotton tip, her facial sensation was intact and symmetric. Uh, she had slightly decreased right brow elevation with symmetric orbicularis oculi strength, and she did have ptosis on the right with decreased levator function. Her exophthalmometry was mildly asymmetric uh, with one millimeter of increase on the right side. And her anterior and posterior segment were completely unremarkable. 
So just to summarize, this is a patient with ovarian cancer on chemotherapy with mouth numbness, progressive vision loss in her right eye over one week to no light perception, followed by right sided ptosis. Her exam shows no light perception vision in the right eye with a normal appearing right optic disc and macula and right ophthalmoplegia in the pattern of a non-pupil involving right cranial nerve three paresis and right cranial nerve six paresis. So she was sent to the emergency department for admission and urgent neuroimaging. And this was her official read from her imaging. So um, the MRI showed dural thickening and enhancement of the anterior skull base with T2 hyperintensity of the left gyral rectus. And the findings were compatible with basilar pachymeningitis and early cerebritis. Of note, you can see on the right side there that the cavernous sinus looked normal. And I did review the images with neuroradiology uh, who indeed felt that the cavernous sinus was normal. Looking at her orbital MRI and the axial cuts here, I thought that there might be some right optic nerve sheath enhancement, but on review with neuroradiology, it, this was felt to be artifacts. And then with a little help of a recent article in JNO, I looked specifically um, for these findings on her diffusion weighted imaging in ADC. And I think that this does show that she's got loss of the normal mucosal enhancement in her right posterior ethmoid and in the sphenoid sinus uh, with corresponding um, segmental diffusion restriction on DWI and ADC. For her sinus CT, this is kind of hard to see, but on the far left, uh, this is supposed to be showing that there is some osseous thinning here, uh, which was felt to represent osseous invasion. And then on the axial cuts, just to show you her uh, orbital apex and canal, and then to show you uh, her sphenoid sinus. So at this point, we could briefly stop and just ask what the differential diagnosis is felt to be. Yeah, I mean... Uh... That's interesting. Uh, uh, just wanted to know, uh, like uh, this patient ha was on chemotherapy, Taclitaxel, you said. And uh, she had sudden loss of VN with a normal fundus, probably such uh, uh, acute loss of VN uh, probably uh, would go more in favor of, uh, you can say, uh, meningeal carcinomatosis, probably having uh, uh, such, such an acute with a normal fundus, otherwise, uh, if it's a, sl a slow growing process, probably you might see some changes in the fundus over a six week period, like some kind of disc edema or a disc pallor would develop. So um, I would consider that possibility, but considering she has an ear infection and uh, so much antibiotics have been given and she's not responding, uh, maybe something else going on. So I've just opened it up to the panel and the faculty, what they, what they think so, your comments. So I think you can uh, go on with the differential diagnosis and we can have a further picture. Okay, absolutely. So our main concern at this point was that this was something infectious. And so at that point, she was it was recommended that she have an urgent LP, um, including fungal cultures and also um, an investigation for TB. Uh, urgent infectious disease and ENT consult was also ordered. Her lumbar puncture was actually pretty unremarkable. She had mildly elevated opening pressure, um, but eventually her fungal cultures did result negative. The AFB smear was also negative um, and nothing grew from this. And there was no sign of malignancy. Interestingly, on the day that she went for her LP, which ended up being uh, basically the middle of the night, uh, that day that I saw her, um, her prior fungal culture came back from the outside hospital. So this was from her fifth post-operative week after her endoscopic sinus surgery, and it showed aspergillus. Um, so ear, nose, and throat saw her uh, and did a right nasal endoscopy, and at that point found that there was dark debris and fungal spores within the right maxillary sinus. They did biopsy with fro frozen section, and this showed diffuse inflammation and necrosis with numerous fungal elements, but no definite angioinvasion. And on the left side, no fungal elements were seen. And cultures were performed and then later resulted in aspergillus uh, niger. Infectious disease, as soon as the lumbar puncture was performed, started her on empiric IV amphotericin as well as vancomycin and cefepime. And uh, she was taken for emergent endoscopic sinus surgery and was consented for probable rate orbital exoneration. 
The interoperative report was the dead mucosal tissue and bone involving the posterior septum, bilateral inferior turbinates, entire sphenoid bilaterally, ethmoid cavity, including the mucosa over the lamina bilaterally was seen, as well as frank fungal debris and black spores throughout the sphenoid and ethmoid. And there was frank purulence in the right um, orbital apex, which ENT told me was encasing the optic nerve. On pathology, there was evidence of invasive fungal sinusitis, uh, both in the posterior septum and in the sphenoid. But the right eye, which was exonerated, showed uh, just focal chronic inflammation of the extraocular muscles. No actual uh, invasive fungal forms were found. And the retina showed degenerative changes, which consisted of ganglion cell loss. So she did quite well postoperatively. She still had significant pain. Uh, she developed some elevation of her liver function tests, which prompted her to be switched to intravenous voriconazole. And then uh, prior to discharge, she was switched to high dose of oral voriconazole. And there's a plan for indefinite therapy because she does need to unfortunately restart chemotherapy soon. Um, she had repeat neuroimaging while she was hospitalized, and it showed a slight decrease in her uh, pachymeningeal enhancement, uh, but really very minimal improvement otherwise. Her left orbit on clinical exam still shows no involvement. I did repeat her visual field, um, and there were still nonspecific defects there, but uh, this is from the same day. Her OCT and her macular uh, scan don't show any correlating difference here. So I'm not sure if this is a fatigue issue, but I can't really find anything correlating with her visual field defect in the left eye. So obviously we'll repeat that again. I wanted to highlight a few articles in the literature. So this one is from uh, Mark Dinkins' group, and they describe an orbital apex syndrome uh, occurring from direct bony invasion with sinus sinus involvement uh, from invasive aspergillus. And I think this is probably the pathophysiology in our case, although it is hard to explain the, um, numb, the numbness of the mouth without cavernous sinus involvement that really should be the second and third division of the trigeminal nerve. So maybe there's sort of sub uh, MRI appearance involvement there. But in this paper, they reviewed that the most common presentation is in fact headache, periocular or facial pain in association with visual disturbance. So in the setting of an immunocompromised patient, really important for us always to remember that this is on the differential. And they also importantly pointed out that the sensitivity of tissue biopsy with histology is only 75%. So patients should always have culture sent as well. Just to review, invasive fungal sinusitis usually occurs with immunocompromise, and there's usually or generally two varieties. So one occurs in poorly controlled diabetics, uh, which is usually due to the zygomycetes, including mucor, and that's because of mucor's affinity for an acidotic environment, such as in DKA with high glucose. And then the other variety occurs in the setting of either neutropenia, HIV, AIDS, hematologic malignancy, or patients on chemotherapy, and that's usually due to aspergillus. There is a very high mortality rate, and in general, the treatment uh, consists of reversing the predisposing state of immunocompromise, if possible, antifungal therapy, and surgical debridement. And the role for orbital exoneration is controversial, so it's generally not been shown to improve survival. Um, and so it's only considered if the eye is non-functioning. And this is actually one of my questions for the panel because when the um, exoneration pathology came back and I saw that it was just ganglion cell loss, I had wondered if this was compressive, should we have actually uh, had the exoneration performed or might she have been able to save the eye and just been treated uh, with medical therapy and extensive debridement. So, it's a question uh, that I'd love to pose to our panel at the end here. And then I just wanted to highlight this really great paper that came out just this year in JNO uh, from Jonathan Trobe's group. And they were basically um, espousing that this sign is something very uh, specific that can be looked for if you suspect invasive fungal sinusitis in addition to kind of the typical signs that we look for of paranasal mucosal thickening, uh, bone dehiscence on CT, extraconal orbital invasion on CT, and then sometimes restricted diffusion in the optic nerve and brain parenchyma, which was not seen in our case. Uh, so they said, if you see loss of the normal sinus mucosa enhancement and corresponding dis, uh, restriction diffusion on DWI, then you should be thinking invasive fungal sinusitis. 
And this is a sign that is not commonly called by neuroradiology. And I believe it was uh, present on our in our, in our patient's case. So just something very important. Uh, this paper really helped me to look for. And at this point, I'd love to ask the panel about whether they think that the exoneration was necessary in this case. She did have very severe pain. And um, we had talked with ENT before, actually on the way to surgery, and we're kind of debating whether that should be done. And, um, you know, as the mechanism for the no light perception vision in the setting of a normal appearing uh, fundus um, was, you know, sort of arguing for something compressive. And basically, we had said if it looks necrotic, you know, then basically to go ahead. And they had said when they opened into the orbit, it all looked necrotic. So they, they took the eye at that point. But I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. Uh, thank you. So that was a very interesting case, no doubt. And uh, yes, uh, it's a puzzle. Why did she have acute loss of vision of no light perception with the normal fundus and hardly anything on the MRI? I think uh, we have a uh, faculty who can answer some of these questions. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, Zoe, the 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 um, these are always super difficult cases. I mean, if you we've always assumed that you're trying to save the patient's life, and in that case, doing less than an exaggeration is always a difficult decision to make. There are dozens of cases reported where they were treated just with antifungals and the patients did well, but there are others that, that uh, claim that there's a, you, you've got to do a big operation. The fact that the sphenoid was involved would certainly suggest that, that this was beyond, and, and I agree with you, you know, with the with the trigeminal involved, I would have called this a sphenocavernous syndrome, uh, as opposed to a pure orbital apex, just with the trigeminal. But um, I would have done or recommended an exaneration and uh, work because it's the only chance you have to save the patient's life. Good. I'm glad to hear that because it did make me a little bit concerned when I saw that that maybe we had done a little too much. But she is you know, alive and well at this point. So that's great. Um, did you, did you consider um, uh, infusing antifungals at the time of surgery? We sometimes would do that just to bathe the thing in, in, in an uh, antifungal. I don't, think, I don't think that was done, uh, but I certainly will consider it for next time if I have another case like this. Any other comments from the panel, from the faculty? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zoe, for that uh, interesting case. And uh, now we'll move on to the uh, next speaker. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes, thank you. So uh, our next speaker here is Dr. Dean Sisteri. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, he's an associate professor of ophthalmology, uh, director of neuro-ophthalmology and, and adult strabismus at the Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts, Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, he's board certified by both the American Board of Ophthalmology and the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. His areas of interest uh, is neuro-ophthalmological vision disorders and thyroid-related strabismus. He's also the author of the book, Learning Strabismus Surgery, a Case-Based Approach. And he's a mentor to many fellows and residents. Uh, over to you, Dr. Dean. Dean, your audio and video both are muted. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> greetings from Boston, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak, especially Dr. Satya. This is a great conference. Uh, these uh, cases are incredible. I'm learning a lot, um, and I'm really happy to present this case. I think it's a pretty straightforward case, but it has a couple of really good, important learning principles. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. And this is a case of a 75-year-old woman who presented with the chief complaint that her eyes were moving around and the world was shaking, and sometimes she saw double. About two months prior to her presentation, she said that her eyes started to intermittently dart around. She said it occurred spontaneously, and there really were no recent changes in her health or medications, no changes in her vision. This was just a spontaneous symptom that occurred. Two weeks prior to presentation, she developed light sensitivity of both, her, both of her eyes, and approximately one week prior to presentation, she described many explosions and fullness in her head. In terms of her past ocular history, there, there was nothing relevant. Her past medical history was significant for ulcerative colitis, status post to partial colectomy. She had a history of breast ductal carcinoma in situ, status post mastectomy with negative sentinel nodes. And she had a history of a quote unquote spontaneous pulmonary embolus, possibly due to the ductal carcinoma. Her medications are listed there. She had no known drug allergies. And her family history was significant for her mother had a history of Parkinson's disease. In terms of her afferent examination, it was really normal except for a refractive error. Um, her slit lamp exam was normal as was her dilated fundus examination. On efferent examination, her, her ductions were full, but this is a video of her eye movements. Just let it play. And I have a zoomed up video here. I'll describe this in a minute. But I think for a lot of general ophthalmologists and our residents and fellows, these, these eye movements can be challenging, although we had some great cases and some great presentations um, and some talks about this uh, this morning. And really the main differential here is gonna be nystagmus versus psychotic intrusions. When we're talking about psychotic intrusions, really it's ocular flutter versus opsoclonus and square wave jerks. In this case, this was, um, I'll play it again, really a small amplitude, high frequency horizontal movement without an interpsychotic interval, and they're not sustained. And this is consistent with the diagnosis of ocular flutter. Now, given her past medical history of uh, breast cancer and the known association of ocular flutter with um, paraneoplastic disease, we started a workup that included an MRI of the brain with and without gadolinium, which was normal. Uh, CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis actually demonstrated small mass in her right upper lobe that was 1.8 centimeters in its widest diameter. And a PET scan showed that there was mild uptake of this lesion in that area. So she was referred to a thoracic oncologist who said we should just observe this. It was a small lesion and he was not impressed and not concerned about it. Um, many phone calls uh, back and forth trying to explain to him the significance of ocular flutter and the fact that it could be a sign of paraneoplastic uh, syndrome and that this is likely to be or could really be uh, cancer pushed him to actually do a, a fine needle aspiration of this lesion, which came back uh, with lung adenocarcinoma. And she ultimately underwent um, a lobectomy in which the pathology showed a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, the right upper lung with possible pleural invasion. And so she was then lost to follow-up and comes back to see me about four years later, alive and well, because her lung cancer was diagnosed early. Um, so this is a great, case for I think, especially residents and eye doctors in terms of a, a simple eye exam leading to a, the, a, the diagnosis of cancer. So in terms of these abnormal eye movements, you know, there's 
these can be complicated, I think, even for neuro ophthalmologists with a lot of experience, but they can be simply broken down into, uh, is there a slow phase or is it just a fast phase, right? Nystagmus, and we've heard a lot of talks about this, really is an excessive eye movement, either in the horizontal or vertical plane, um, that by definition really has a slow phase and it may or may not have a, a fast corrective saccade, or saccadic intrusions really only have fast phase movements. And so when you're looking at eye movements, trying to figure out is it a nystagmus or saccadic intrusion, that's what you're kind of focused on. And the video that I've been describing, as I said, it's described or characterized as intermittent, rapid, small amplitude horizontal movements without a saccadic, um, uh, intersaccadic interval. And this was first described by Dr. Kogan who I'm sitting at Mass Ionia right now in my office and Dr. Kogan was here as a pathologist and he described this in 1954. Um, the second type of saccadic intrusion, as we, we all know, is opsoclonus. And these are chaotic saccadic intrusions in all directions. Kogan called these saccadomania. And as we know, they can be associated with myoclonus. This and this is Shirley Lay describing vertigo. her patient. Vertigo and severosomopsia. She has rapid, multidirectional, back-to-back -back saccades, characteristic of opsoclonus. And as we know, um, ocular flutter and opsoclonus, really, there are no good diseases that cause this. It's so making the correct diagnosis is very important because it's often paraneoplastic or due to a tumor or significant infection um, or medications. There's a long list. But sometimes ocular flutter is really confused with these square wave jerks. And square wave jerks are pairs of small amplitude horizontal saccades. And the first saccade of the pair takes the eye away and the second one returns it. And the important uh, way to differentiate it is it's slower and there is a normal intersaccadic interval. You it's, might think they look like ocular flutter, but they're much slower because they're square and not triangular. And this is Dr. Darrow describing this. Is very this. common square wave jerk. And what happens, usually you don't see them when you're examining the patient. I suggest that when you're doing fundoscopy, and looking at the optic disc and trying to look at, let's say, a vein to see if there's venous pulsation. And you get a little upset with the patient for not fixating properly. Rather than get upset, look at the pattern of instability. And if you see the optic disc going, you're seeing square wave work. And so that's a really great um, uh, way to uh, diagnose these. And again, they're very common. We see these in a lot of diseases. They, they can be seen in cerebellar disease, Parkinson's disease, PSP, um, amblyopia, schizophrenia. So the take home point, psychotic intrusions can be defined as an excessive eye movement with only a fast phase of movement. Um, an ocular flutter and opsoclonus can be a manifestation of a perineoplastic syndrome. And this case is a good example of how your diagnostic workup really should be aimed at finding or excluding cancer and always uh, remembering that a thorough eye exam can sometimes be life-saving. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, quite a nice case. I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, you can see a good learning point there that how you diagnose it and how you can uh, mistake, mistake it for uh, square wave jerks, probably um, uh, just a few comments, like how would you, when you have micro flutter, mi micro flutters, and uh, then you have a square wave jerk, sometimes it becomes really difficult to diagnose uh, what the patient is having, because uh, probably uh, the other, the second part of the question would be, uh, or both these things uh, would do investigate in the same way, or there's a difference how you would go about. So you're, you're asking in terms of micro flutter versus ocular flutter? Micro flutter versus uh, square wave. 
where it's very difficult sometimes, as was said in the presentation, that it's sometimes very difficult for the naked eye to see unless you do a fundoscopy. Right. Well, I think it's really important to differentiate because, um, you know, square wave jerks, really, you want to do a full examination. But a lot of times patients will come in with symptoms of almost oscillopsia and you see square wave jerks and there's really no treatment. It's a little frustrating for the patient, but what you want to do is make sure that they don't have an underlying neurologic disease. So what we see occasionally are patients that have early stages of, you know, Parkinson's disease um, or PSP and it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not diagnosed or you're diagnosing it really early or you're sending them to a specialist to try to work them up for that. Um, so the, the ocular flutter, it's really the perineoplastic component. We've seen a number of patients throughout the years and I'm sure you know this group on here has seen this also. Um, it's really making sure differentiating ocular flutter um, from square wave jerks and working up that ocular flutter very thoroughly looking for uh, perineoplastic or, uh, or you know, tumors themselves. So there's a question in the chat box that uh, do we need to go through a thorough malignancy workup in all cases with such ocular movement? Like so it was cutting out or not, but um, a thorough malignancy workup. Well, you know, there is a broad differential diagnosis, it can be from infections, it can be from medications. So if the history points in that direction, then I don't think you need to work that up. But when a patient comes in without an obvious history of a meningitis or um, uh, uh, multiple medications, then yes, you really have to go through that workup. And you know, here at Mass Air, just our faculty, we have these case presentation, uh, presentations every week, probably, one a year or two a year, we see uh, very rare malignancies um, that were only found on uh, a thorough workup, including PET scans, and then sometimes pushing the outside services to biopsy a lesion that otherwise looked fairly benign and that they just wanted to watch or observe. Thank you. Any comments from the faculty? Yeah. Uh, I comment just, about uh, yeah. yeah, comment about fundus examination in neuroophthalmic cases. I found it very interesting that the indirect ophthalmoscope is one go-to instrument for all kinds of examination in a neuroophthalmic patient, especially those who are in the ward. You know, you just carry your indirect ophthalmoscope and your twenty D lens with you, and with the bright light of the indirect, you can assess the pupils. You can look at the fundus. You can look at the uh, torsion, you can look at the um, nystagmus, you can look at the ocular movements when you, uh, you know, if a patient is cooperative and you're asking him to look in all directions to examine the periphery, uh, you can assess the ocular movements. Uh, so all the examinations required for neuroophthalmic purposes can be done with a single indirect ophthalmoscope examination. I totally agree. The problem in the United States now is you can't find a medical student or a resident or even another faculty member besides a neuro-ophthalmologist who can use them and trying to even teach our fellows to use them. Um, it, we all know it's a dying art. Um, so, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, there's another question that, uh, uh, what are the common medication toxicity uh, you've seen with the, these abnormalities? Um, you know, I haven't personally seen it. I know that the books kind of list various medications. I mean, I think a lot of times it's, it's, uh, the seizure medications and when they're given in higher doses. Um, but I would put that out to the audience or Neil, if you're there, um, have you commonly seen that with, uh, medication toxicities? I mean, we often blame it on the anti-seizure medications and the dosing being yeah. too high. Yeah, it's really rare. Yeah. I, I think by far the most common settings are either perineoplastic or the obsoclonus myoclonus type of uh, thing. I think the flutter issue is tough because there are, it, with obsoclonus, it's multiple planes, as everybody knows, no intersaccadic interval, et cetera. 
with Flutter, you have cases like yours where it's really tough to tell because they're little intermittent bursts as opposed to some Flutter, which is almost constant right. like Opsoclonus, but in a single plane. So I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a great um, point distinguishing Flutter, uh, at least horizontal Flutter, Right. from either square wave jerks or macro square wave jerks. So what about doing a VNGs in these cases where you are in doubt? Doing what? A VNG, a video nystagmogram. Uh, yeah, I, we don't really have that available to us, but I think that's a great idea if you do. Any other comments from the panel or the faculty? Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful case, Dean. And uh, now we'll move on to our uh, next speaker. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, Dr. H. Selling, who's a professor of ophthalmology uh, at the University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, he's, he did his uh, MD and residency at, in Canada, and he's done um, fellowships at Wills Eye Hospital, Mayo Clinic, and Pittsburgh as well. He's done his MPH from Harvard and has a, and a PhD from the Kingston University, London in Epidemiology and Diagnostic Prediction Model for GCA. Uh, he's also done a Master's of International Affairs and Diplomacy, and his MBA from the Louisiana State University, Shreveport. So a lot of uh, degrees, and uh, we look forward to your case, uh, Dr. Edsel. Uh, can everybody see the screen there? Yes. Yes. Great. So uh, this is a very simple case, and I'm just going to present uh, three little twists. Uh, greetings from Toronto. I have no financial disclosures. My wife's a dentist, and she says I have no finances either. So this is a 67-year-old woman who first presented to ophthalmology in March 2020. They found she had narrow angles and she underwent peripheral iridotomy. Over the ensuing months, she phoned the ophthalmologist again saying, my right eye is getting quite red. Is it because of the uh, laser? Um, and, and they worked her up. Eventually she filtered to neurology. Neurology at the time was still doing mostly online exams because of COVID. Um, eventually they found that the TSH was normal. However, they thought that on this uh, MRI here that the medial recti were slightly uh, enlarged. So their provisional diagnosis was a euthyroid thyroid associated orbitopathy. Of note, she was not taking any systemic medications. She had no hypertension or easy bruisability of her face. There was no history of Euler's Danlos. On her imaging, there was no fibromuscular dysplasia suggestion, and there was no history of trauma. She was not a smoker, and there was no personal or family history of this thyroidism. So I first saw this patient about 11 months later. And on examination, she had no lid retraction. However, as you can see, her right eye uh, has 360 episclerovenous venous congestion that extends to the limbus. Um, her uh, acuity had declined to 2140, best corrected. Uh, she had difficulty seeing the Ishihara color plates. There's a suggestion of an RAPD. The intraocular pressure was about uh, 20. Uh, confrontation fields were intact. Um, her Humphrey perimetry was surprisingly, didn't show any neurofiber bundle defects, uh, just a slightly decreased mean deviation. I could not explain her vision loss from her uh, very age appropriate nuclear sclerosis. Um, on acclination tonometry, I could not detect bounding Myers. She admitted to having an intracranial brewery. I could not auscultate this. On examination, I expected there might be an abduction deficit, um, but uh, all I could see was mildly decreased uh, eye movements in all directions of gaze. Uh, on fundus examination, there was venous tortuosity, as you can see here uh, from the OCT, and her uh, 
optic disc edema was 153 microns in the right eye compared to 113 in the left eye. So I ordered a CT angiogram, which was performed about a month later, and they saw a slightly enlarged superior ophthalmic vein, and there was increased vascularity in the cavernous sinus, but they couldn't identify a fistulous tract. Uh, I did not perform a carotid Doppler study, or, or a, sorry, ocular Doppler study. Uh, we went on to get a digital uh, uh, subtraction angiogram, however, and this is the injection on the right side. So uh, they thought there was a right cavernous sinus dural uh, fistula, but there was no feed from the right internal or external carotid uh, system. So they injected the other side and they found there's a feed from the left external carotid branch um, and an intercavernous shunt. The uh, neuroradiologist, oh, sorry, things aren't advancing here. Um, uh, uh, the neuroradiologist did not see any cortical venous reflux. Um, in terms of trying to ablate the lesion, he could not uh, um, uh, find a direct endovascular approach and thought he would have to tunnel through the right inferior petrosal sinus and didn't want to do this. Um, so uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, the embolization didn't happen and he asked the patient to massage his eyeball. I'm more used to massaging the carotid. Uh, I thought that this patient might lose vision. She eventually came back about a month later telling me what she'd done and she had gotten better. Was it because uh, uh, many of these uh, dural AVFs eventually close off spontaneously? Was it the viscosity uh, of the uh, DSA? I'm, I'm not sure. Or was it the actual massage of the globe? And uh, by April 21, um, her vision had improved to 2060. She had much less of a hyperopic and the OCT average nerve fiber layer had come down to 129 microns. So here's a very simple case, but unfortunately uh, three twists for this spontaneous, indirect, low flow type C fistula. So approximately 10% uh, of patients uh, with uh, low flow fistulas are initially diagnosed as thyroid associated orthopathy. Uh, the second little twist was the fistula tracks are off and not seen on CT angiogram. And I've always found this a bit frustrating. Apparently only 87% uh, of low flow fistulas will be detected by CT angiogram. And on uh, DSA, uh, the fistula filled from the contralateral side. So um, if for some reason the neuroradiologist phones you and say, hey, something's funny here, just say, please inject the other side. So in terms of cortical venous reflux, the uh, risk for intracranial hemorrhage is apparently 8.1% per annum. If you're doing uh, MRI with diffusion weighted imaging, uh, there's a significantly decreased apparent diffusion co coefficient in patients who have cortical venous reflux. This might be seen as hyperintensity of the brain parenchyma on T2 weighted images. Uh, uh, if for some reason this patient had continued to lose vision, um, um, stereotactic radio surgery. From this recent made analysis, they say that your likelihood of complete obliteration is about 70%. Uh, vast majority of patients will notice symptom improvement. Uh, hemorrhage after radio surgery uh, is approximately 1% and perhaps 1% uh, of patients might get infarcts. So I'm sorry, my dog is pining away for something that I'm not sure of. Um, in terms of uh, the sensitivity for detecting in fistula tracts, uh, it's thought to be 94% for DSAs, 87% for CT angiogram, and about 80% for MRA. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you for that uh, wonderful case, uh, no doubt. I mean, um, so you do not have a, a pulsatile exophthalmos in this case. Uh, it's like an indirect fistula. Uh, you said the limitation of, uh, there was my limitation of uh, movement and probably uh, adduction you were saying because the medial rectus was thickened. Uh, uh, probably in a thyroid case, uh, uh, we would expect uh, more limitation in the direction of up case, probably when, the, because the inferior rectus thickens first, that's the most common muscle to thicken. 
and uh, okay. having a conjunctival hyperemia in such a setting no doubt i mean uh, but with a disc edema with the rapd uh, yes it's a pointer uh, towards the fistula uh, any other comments from the panel from the faculty dr murli uh, yeah, I have a comment, Dr. Edsel. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, case to start with. Uh, I have a few comments. One is that this distinction between thyroid uh, eye disease and uh, CCF is very important uh, because you should not do a forced duction testing in CCF. Uh, you can uh, trigger an uncontrolled bleeding. Uh, whereas doing a forced duction testing actually uh, is essential to make a diagnosis of thyroid uh, eye disease by demonstrating the restriction. Uh, have you had any... Um, you know, uh, anybody doing a forced duction test uh, in a falsely diagnosed uh, patient of thyroid eye disease like this, because uh, this was, of course, diagnosed on the net, uh, online that it was uh, a thyroid eye disease and later noted to be a CCF. Sometimes the distinction could be a little more blurred, especially if it is an indirect uh, CCF. So have you had any occasion in which an, uh, a forced duction testing was accidentally done in this patient, in these kind of patients? Yeah, uh, Morali... That's an excellent point. I, I must admit, I only do four sections in the operating room now, just because I also get uh, subconjunctival hemorrhages even without a big fistula there. Uh, perhaps if we're trying to differentiate it from uh, things like paranoid syndrome, uh, would you think that just doing a doll uh, needs a four section? Because I, I, I'm doing mostly doll's heads. Uh, and then if I am operating on them, like I do the force duction in the operating room, but perhaps I am missing something. So I defer to the panel here. Uh, okay, and uh, one more uh, question I have uh, is regarding, uh, in this patient, you elected not to do embolization, uh, but should you elect to do embolization? Is it enough to uh, diagnose it on uh, uh, this MR angiography? Uh, because there is a new modality called time of flight, TOF MRA. Uh, which was also mentioned in the presentation that you sent across to me, or CT angiography, if you are able to locate the fistula tract, do you still need a, a digital subtraction angiography before you uh, elect to do the embolization, or can it be done during the procedure? Um, uh, so, so excellent questions. Uh, for this patient, um, it, it, because they're having vision loss, and because uh, by history it was progressing, I thought that they, they should get sent for a DSA. Look, they, they have the caput medusa, and, and, uh, but they're, they're not having venous tortuosity or vision loss. The interactive pressure is controlled. I'm willing to watch them, even though the radiologist says, I can't see a fistulous tract on the CT. I think your diagnosis is wrong, even though clinically, when we look, like it's an obvious uh, low flow fistula. So because this patient was getting worse, I think you know, she had to go see the interventional neuroradiologist. If he could have embolized it safely, he would have done it at the time. But he said he'd had to go through the petrosal sinus. Um, the uh, superior ophthalmic vein was too small to cannulate. Uh, and, and the fistula was coming from the other side anyways. So, so that's why they, they decided to watch it. Um, I am not familiar with globe massage, I would have been a bit worried in this patient. I thought, you know, she might infarct the eye globe uh, massaging it that much. I always thought. No, I, I mentioned carotid massage. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I only really better. Many carotid. of these low flow fistulas do spontaneously improve. Um, so it is it cause malality of the DSA? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, Morale. Did I, uh, I misheard something? No, no, I mentioned uh, carotid massage. Maybe I, I meant carotid massage. I didn't mean globe massage. Oh, oh no, at this patient, this patient got ocular massage. So the radiologist, uh, I thought she would, might infarct something, but that's what, when she came to see me about three, four weeks later, I thought they'd already embolized it. And she goes, no, they didn't embolize it. They just told me to massage my eye. And she was, she was much better at their theme I had resolved. So, um, uh, what was the reason for vision loss in this patient, Dr. Edson? What was the reason for vision loss in the right eye? Yeah, I, I think in, in retrospect, see if there's some retinal edema. Um, like she is back at 2060. Part of it was the hyperopic shift. Um, you, you know, I, I wasn't really sure because her perimetry was so good. There's no nerve fiber bundle defect. There was a decreased uh, mean deviation on the Humphrey. Um, but uh, she hasn't come back. Uh, she actually belongs to other uh, ophthalmologists and, and such. I, I think they're planning some cataract surgery for her. 
Uh, I saw her at month 11. It's just her, this was during COVID. I guess some people weren't seeing patients in person. Um, so. So uh, can I say something? Uh, Doctor, it's an interesting case. Uh, regarding carotid massage, uh, we had patients and we were always advised them not to do the massage, you know, same side together. It's always you know, one side at a time. So otherwise the brain flow, uh, blood flow can uh, get obstructed. They can uh, become unconscious. So uh, it's always uh, one side and... Uh, so it, it works, it, it reduces the blood flow, and that's, I think, quite logical. And the uh, fistula then closes spontaneously, as in your case. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this very esteemed group has had patients that uh, had a stroke after carotid massage. Has that happened? I um, think anybody got in a cerebrovascular accident from it. But I, I, for this patient, it'd be interesting. I guess you'd massage the contralateral side to the, uh, the fistula if you're doing the neck that uh... well as you know you're Maybe. you're supposed to do it with your opposite hand so that if you reduce the blood supply significantly uh, it'll fall away there was uh, i just reviewed a paper i don't know if it was from somebody here um, claiming that they had successful closure of dural fistulas in something like 70 or 80% of patients in whom they use carotid compression. So uh, it, it apparently is a very uh, good procedure. Conservative measure probably, uh, which is quite effective uh, as um, Dr. Neil is saying, he's uh, reviewed a paper. So probably can be tried. Uh, May when you I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, I would like to know from the panel, like uh, how frequently you have clinically suspected a low flow vascular uh, malformation and have turned to have a negative neuroimaging. In that case, how would you go about it? Yeah, so from, from the papers, they said for CT angiogram, it was about 13% uh, where, where they didn't uh, pick up the fistulas tract. Uh, they said for MRI, and I don't know uh, whether they're doing the or the time of low MRI, uh, they said it was 20% miss rate. And for DCA, uh, DSA, I, I think there's a 7% miss rate if I remember to figure. So it happens commonly. And, and our, our point was, if your patient's in trouble, there's a lot of retinal venous tortuosity, the intraocular pressure is uncontrolled, they have a brewery and they can't sleep at night. I think those people, I would tell them to go on to, to get the DSA. The other people, if there's not a lot going on, and since so many of these concerns, uh, I find uh, a lot of the radiologists, they're not so enthused to go on. You have to, uh, fortunately, um, um, I had a connection to this track and they sort of stopped there. Um, some of them even have to go and just can review the scan just to make sure there's no cortical venous reflux. Um, so so I, I think it depends on, on your team and how the, the patient's doing. Um, but if they're, if their vision's stable, they're not having a lot of uh, symptoms, there's not a lot of venous tortuosity, intraocular pressure is controlled. I'm willing to watch them for a while because some of them do improve with time. Maybe sleep the head of the bed up too, maybe that might help. Yeah, particularly when they have this asymmetric glaucoma and we have a negative imaging because our glaucoma friends would like to know the cause for the raised epistolar pressure, but we end up having a negative imaging in such cases, actually one of our patients, we just waited and then it spontaneously resolved. And we didn't even have to go for a second imaging. So that is the reason I wanted to know, like, would you think of a second imaging in a condition when we have only asymmetric glaucoma, not that much of vision threatening conditions? I, I think you can follow them clinically unless you suspect there's another diagnosis going on. Um, because the, if you see 360 engorged vessels extending to the limbus, it, it, it's, um, can someone else think of another diagnosis? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So, so if you think there's a differential for that, uh, so you can follow it clinically. In,
the intraocular pressure is a good barometer. She noticed that her uh, spontaneous intracranial brewing, she noticed it was getting softer with time. Uh, I guess she could also do uh, orbital uh, Dopplers and see the document reversal of flow and see if there's thrombosis there. Some of these paradoxically worsen while they're thrombosing off, and then you may have to give them some steroids. That, that might be a bit scary, and maybe you'd be repeating imaging then. Thank you, Dr. Etzel, uh, for, for that interesting case. Uh, we'll move, up, move ahead now. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Samira Irfan. Uh, she's a consultant, pediatric ophthalmologist, trabismologist, oculoplastic surgeon, an ocular surface disease specialist in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, she has 72 index publications uh, written for books on strabismus and oculoplasty. And she's the editor of the SEO Chronicle, Indian Journal of Clinical and Investi Investigative Ophthalmology. Uh, she has a, a good amount of awards to her credit, which is the, the gold medal for the best pediatric ophthalmologist, the SARC Excellence Award. Uh, she's won the gold medal for excellence in ophthalmology and gold medals at the research and development for research and development in Pakistan, the best editor award in India. So with that, I'll invite Dr. Samira to please present her case. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaspreet. And uh, I'm so grateful, Dr. Satya, for arranging this meeting and inviting me. So very kind of you. So I'll share my screen. And uh, after a very interesting talk by Dr. Edsel, I mean, this is again going to the orbit and uh, share. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. So my patient is a 22-year-old male university student, and he presented to me with a gradually increasing proptosis, which is what he was having for the last three months. And uh, recently, uh, he started developing double vision, pain in that eye, headache, and slight blurring of that vision. Uh, and uh, for this, this made him seek the consultation. In the past, uh, uh, he admitted that he had mild proptosis about five years back. And uh, he had an MRI at that time, and uh, which showed that uh, he had some vascular pathology in the eye. And uh, because he was very busy in his studies and the problem was only mild proptosis, so he refused any uh, surgical treatment, which was offered to him at that time. And he went on to join the university. And this time he uh, uh, was uh, going to the gym regularly. And after a strenuous uh, exercise at the gym, he uh, developed this problem of uh, blurred vision and pain in the eye. And so when he came on examination, his uh, vision was uh, six, six in the right eye, but six, nine in the left. His color vision was equal in both eyes. He could read all the plates, but th there was slight uh, red desaturation from the left eye. Uh, there was mild leptosis, axial proptosis of two millimeters, and slight dystopia, as well as a slight exotropia of the left eye. On retropulsion with the closed eyelids, uh, there was fullness felt, a marked fullness, but no tenderness. Pupils were blessed, brisk. There was no RAPT uh, on the slip examination. The conjunctival vessels were engorged and chemoged, uh, especially towards the furnaces. And uh, there were dilated episcleral as well as conjunctival vessels. Intraocular pressure in that eye was slightly raised to about 22 millimeters. So his uh, fundus examination dilated the pupil and uh, saw that the uh, vessels were, the retinal vessels were engorged. The disc was slightly swollen and congested, but there were no choroidal folds. And uh, urgent uh, ultrasound, B-scan ultrasound was done in the clinic and it showed uh, a, a regular oval uh, uniform uh, uh, swelling, which was uh, away from not pressing the globe, but uh, pressing on the uh, optic nerve. 
and uh, so it was a regular oval. Uh, the Humphrey visual field was done and it only showed an enlarged blind spot. The uh, rest of the field uh, was okay. So we arranged an urgent uh, MRI of the orbit and uh, brain and uh, which showed there was uh, on the T1 images On the T1 images, uh, there was uh, uh, um, <clears throat> there was a roughly oval intracoronal mass which was abutting the globe, but not deforming it and pushing the nerve as well as the lateral rectus laterally, and it was uh, slightly hyper intense as compared to the brain on T1 as well as on the T2. And uh, it demonstrated progressive slow filling and delayed enhancement with contrast, which was a highly suggestive of a cavernous lymphangioma, of a cavernous hemangioma. So, and there was uh, this uh, septal extension uh, uh, going into the upper lid. He, said he had his, we asked him to bring his previous MRI report and uh, th that was done in 2017. And it showed that it was an irregular lobulated lesion involving the intracoronal, extracoronal, and the preceptal spaces. It was uh, iso intense on T1 and hyper intense on T2, suggestive of a lymphangioma. So now, lymphangioma is a lobulated structure and uh, it does not uh, have a, a capsule. And on ultrasound, it doesn't appear to be regular. But uh, in, uh, uh, at this uh, presentation, uh, as you see in this ultrasound, it was a regular oval with, homo with homogeneous intensity. So we thought that uh, uh, either the previous diagnosis wasn't uh, correct, or this was a cavernous hemangioma, or it was a, a mixed variety. Because in uh, these uh, uh, cavernous hemangiomas and lymphangiomas, they were classified in 1999 by the International Orbital Society as uh, in relation to their hemodynamic relationships, which decides uh, actually the clinical appearance and the management. If there is absolutely no flow, then it's a lymphangioma which is unencapsulated and they creep into all the tissue spaces available and they keep on growing. But uh, they are usually seen in the first decade of life uh, in infants and in young children. So appearing at, at this stage uh, in uh, late uh, teens or 20s, it was uh, unlikely. On the other hand, venous flow malformations, which are uh, hemangiomas, they are well circumscribed with a studio capsule and they appear in uh, late teens and uh, early uh, 20s or 30s. They are more predominant in uh, menopausal uh, women uh, because of uh, hormonal imbalance. But uh, being present, uh, the lymphangioma at uh, this age is uh, unlikely. And then there are those malformations which have arterial flow and then it's a mixed variety. So because uh, this patient, our patient, uh, he had uh, both uh, 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 an orbital component as well as a, the uh, uh, eyelid component in which it was extending into the preceptal space. So it was considered a mixed variety. So uh, we considered uh, management. We talked about the management with him, which is mostly surgical for the human geomas. And uh, because he was in his final year of engineering university, he, he declined uh, any surgical intervention. He said, you can treat me conservatively, but not uh, surgery at that moment. So in the past, I've treated many kids with uh, hemangiomas, uh, late hemangiomas, which are extending into the orbit with topical as well as uh, oral propranolol. And uh, they had all settled down over the one to two years and uh, we have avoided uh, amblyopia and strabismus. 
the response to topical as well as combined oral beta blockers is excellent it's uh, immediate and uh, we can avoid the uh, surgical intervention uh, people inject steroids intra lesional but steroids uh, lead to scarring of the lip tissue the eyelid tissue becomes hyperpigmented and it then becomes uh, aesthetically unacceptable so it may need a skin grafting later but uh, uh, applying uh, beta blockers uh, onto the skin of the lid margin as well as giving uh, orally it um, it leaves no scar no deformity and it settles down very nicely so i discussed the option with my patient and he said okay uh, you can uh, try that and uh, we started with oral propranolol 20 mg twice daily and uh, to be gradually increased uh, every fourth fifth day to 50 mg twice daily we especially asked about whether he had any cardiac problems or asthma but uh, he didn't along with that he was advised to uh, use a topical timolol and uh, dorsolamide eye drops twice daily as his iup was high as well uh, he was uh, then also uh, advised supportive therapy like ice packs applied to that eye avoid straining bending down uh, the head down and then must he must follow up weekly and we are at uh, on every follow up we monitored the vision color vision pupils visual field and b scan ultrasound so the response to was uh, uh, surprisingly very dr dramatic in 3 weeks his vision was normalized and uh, the disc uh, swelling was reducing gradually the uh, retinal vessels were looking less angry and engorged and this on serial ultrasound the size of the swelling had reduced and in 3 months he was almost uh, normal uh, looking and uh, the eye congestion has reduced proptosis diplopia uh, it disappeared after 6 weeks so we tried the same treatment with another patient who had uh, who didn't uh, who only came for cosmetic disfigurement he was a 33 year old person and uh, oh, his only problem was this uh, swelling lid swelling and uh, uh, proptosis axial proptosis but he didn't have uh, any diplopia so mri showed that uh, it was a uh, hemangioma which was extending into the eyelid and uh, extra corneal space so he was also given the same treatment oral as uh, propranolol along with topical beta blockers and uh, it gradually reduced so uh, now uh, what happened was he my patient came uh, on the seventh month follow up and uh, the pictures he shared was that uh, in the morning the swelling increases and uh, he develops a, a blurred vision as well as double vision and uh, then uh, uh, during the day it settles down the proptosis reduces the swelling reduces when he came to see me the other day uh, in the morning he had these lymphangiectatic vessels and uh, which were filled with blood so but the vision was fine no color vision deficit we did the ultrasound and uh, the uh, the orbitals uh, swelling had reduced from markedly so i was wondering what's uh, happening why is he having this uh, problem during sleep when he wakes up in the morning the swelling increases i asked him not to sleep prone or to sleep on the left side but on the right so i have advised him to take two pillows but i was wondering if it was really a component of uh, lymphangioma in addition to uh, hemangioma the hem orbital hemangioma is obviously very much reduced but uh, i think it's the lid component which is mainly lymphangiomatous So now, uh, opinion from the faculty: If uh, the, these vascular malformations, they can present uh, at any age. I think um, we cannot label them that capillary uh, hemangioma has to be in infants and young children. 
while uh, vascular malformations or lymphangiomas, I mean, they, they can all be there and uh, they appear, they can be triggered by contraceptive pills, by trauma, by exertion. And uh, another thing is that beta blockers, uh, uh, people have not tried uh, beta, oral beta blockers in uh, hemangiomas. I was going through the literature search and only found one report, one case report in 2012, which they, in which uh, they had tried uh, oral beta blockers for uh, uh, hemangioma, orbital hemangioma, and it had responded very well. So, but now I had uh, four consecutive cases I've tried and it really works. And so uh, my question is, should I continue with this treatment? Should I go for sclerotherapy? Because beta blockers, they have to be continued for a long time, for at least one to two years. And uh, I was worried, why is it uh, increasing? And the patient is also worried that when he wakes up, the swelling increases and um, he has problem with his vision slightly, slightly and then it improves uh, with the passage of time. Surgery is for such an extensive lesion. I mean, I am reluctant because uh, I believe that um, we should do minimal harm to the patient. And if this beta blockers and everything is working, then why should we go for surgery? Because it, it, going into the orbit with the, next to the optic nerve and with all the other uh, ocular nerves, it's, uh, it's tricky and uh, we should restrict to the no harm policy. What do you think? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samira. I mean, that was interesting. Um, I, I just want to uh, know something whether uh, imaging is diagnostic uh, for making a diagnosis, whether it's a lymphangioma or a hemangioma, or you need a biopsy? I think Tricky because as in my patient, it's it's a mixed variety, and uh, the radiologist also said yes, uh, it could be both lymphangioma or hemangioma. I think when it's a mixed component with uh, one orbital component which is encapsulated and uh, sh showing uh, low flow, but uh, it's a septal component which is uh, it, it, which is irregular without a capsule. Uh, so uh, mixed variety, you, you can't be really sure. Samira, I'm if confused. I, are you talking about a cavernous angioma or a capillary? Because propranolol is great for capillary angiomas. I'm not so sure about cavernous angiomas. Those are the things that um, we would tend, if at all possible, to remove because they are encapsulated. But are, are, are you talking about capillary or cavernous here? Cap, I have been giving care for capillary hemangiomas, propranolol in kids for a long time. So this was my first patient in whom there was a, a mixed variety. And uh, there was an orbital component as, as well as a lid component. The orbital component was uh, lobulated and uh, uh, it had a pseudo capsule, but the lid variety, the lid component, it, it wasn't, it was just a, a mixture. So I said, why not try this? Because the patient, he wasn't keen on having surgery at this time and it was affecting the optic nerve. It was compressing the optic nerve. So I had to do something. So we started on oral propranolol. I said, let's uh, get on with it. And in two weeks, his vision, his eye congestion, retinal congestion had improved. And I was really amazed. And so I, I mean, for the last seven months, we have continued with that. And now we gave it to two, uh, three more patients and it worked. So then I said, okay, let me present it because we can never be sure whether it, uh, these are capillaries or cavernous or uh, lymphangioma. They can all be together. They are just sitting there and they can pop up anytime. So maybe we need to revisit the pathology and, uh, our, and uh, that we, we cannot distinguish them into three different entities. I, I think we cannot. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Preeti has some 
comments? Yeah, I mean, it was this, I think the same point that Dr. Miller raised. Uh, I have seen it being used uh, for capillary hemangiomas uh, in children. I had not seen it being used in cavernous. Um, another point was, do you think the dorzolamide that was given could have contributed also to the decreased congestion? Um, and one more question that I had was, while we were waiting, since we weren't really sure if this was going to work, uh, would you or anybody else on the panel consider giving steroids, knowing the impending optic neuropathy? I didn't go for steroids because I, I, only one week after starting uh, oral propranolol, uh, his vision uh, wasn't uh, deteriorating. And the, uh, the, lid, the, the disc swelling wasn't worsening at all. So I said, okay, let me wait another week. And in the second week, vision has returned to 6-6. The disc congestion has reduced. Disc edema had reduced. I think dorsolamide, if you're giving topically, it cannot reduce the size uh, in the orbital of the orbital component. It was the orbital component that was pressing on the optic nerve. So how can topical either reach the orbit? It cannot. It was the oral propranolol, which, has, which had reduced the size. Even on the second ultrasound, which we did in the second week, the size had reduced. And then on serial ultrasounds, it kept on reducing. So which was, I mean, surprising and amazing to me as well. And then in the second patient and in the third patient, so it was shocking actually. Thank you, thank you. That's interesting, okay. something new. Yes, any comments from okay. the, yeah? Um, I think there's a comment in the um, chat box from Dr. Carey about that there are reports of increased risk of hemorrhage from cerebral cavernous hemangiomas with propranolol. Um, so do you think you would need to screen patients uh, for this before using propranolol for orbital lesions? Yes, we did the MRI for that purpose. Uh, in the brain, there, there was no lesion. And uh, uh, there is a particular syndrome, Mafusi syndrome, as well as face in children, in which they are associated with uh, multiple hemangiomas at multiple sites in the brain and face and other parts of the body. So MRI, I think, is important. Uh, brain as well as orbits to rule out whether there is any brain involvement and then yes you should start which is, has to be an urgent MRI and then I mean uh, if the optic nerve is being compressed then uh, surely you, you cannot wait so you and, have to do something uh, yep. so the next, yeah so point. again you were, uh, the one question is coming up uh, obviously how long would you continue this treatment I think uh, I will, uh, on the seven months, the size has reduced a lot. But now I'm worried about this diurnal variation because he wakes up in the morning and the swelling is increased. And I think it's, it's the lid swelling. So I was hoping that uh, from the panel, uh, whether I should go for sclerotherapy just to the lid lesion uh, or just persist with the timolol, oral and topical. Because the orbital has definitely reduced. But you say, you, as you are saying, it could be a mixed mixed variety. Yeah. So uh, lymphangiomas uh, actually they respond to steroids. People have said uh, there is steroids or then sclerotherapy. But sclerotherapy is again not without uh, harms. It can cause a lot of damage as well. And when you inject the sclerosing agent, it can suddenly increase the proptosis. It can suddenly increase the swelling. So there is a period one to two weeks. It can increase the diplopia as well. So I have to uh, inform the patient that this is going to happen. So it's uh, actually the patient's choice because this is now a cosmetic issue. It's not visual threatening or diplopia or that is all settled. It's, it's just the diurnal cosmetic disfigurement, which is more in the morning and then settles by midday, he's okay. So what about giving a so trial of steroids? If you, like you were saying, it responds to steroids. Mm, okay, uh, yeah. I, I can, yes. <laughs> but then again, steroids, they have other problems. He's a young man. And uh, uh, how much dosage should I start with? 
time per day and stay for a week. Okay, I think I, I should do that. Yeah, it's better than sterilizing yeah. agents. Okay. <laughs> so any other comments from the faculty panel? Okay. Um, Okay, thank you, Dr. Samira. And uh, very much thank you for, for that wonderful case and uh, something new what you presented. Uh, so we move on to the next speaker of our session. And uh, it's Dr. Daniel Gold, uh, who's an associate professor of neurology, ophthalmology, otolaryngeology, head and neck surgery, neurosurgery and emergency medicine at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's also the director of Ocular Motor and Vestibular Autoneurology Fellowship Program and is doing fellowship training in neuro-ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania and additional training at John Hopkins. He's deeply involved in the academic curriculum and education of residents and fellows, and he's received awards for the same for so much of teaching and clinical excellence and for outstanding educational contributions to the neuro-ophthalmology virtual education library. He's also the author of the book, Neuro-Ophthalmology and Neuro-Autology Case-Based Textbook, which was published this year. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. Excellent, thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, a couple things. Sorry, my my son's soccer game just started seven minutes ago, so I'm going to have to drop off after this. Although the next session looks great, and all of the sessions so far have been great, so if Dr. Miller or somebody else asks me a particularly difficult question and my screen goes black, it's because I went to the soccer game, not because I don't want to answer that particular question. <laughs> also. Um, I felt bad because everybody else's titles are so much better than mine. So I threw in a second pseudo. So it's not just pseudo ophthalmoparesis and a young confused man. It's pseudo pseudo. All right. So this is all you're going to get. A 30 year old who was found minimally responsive on the lounge floor of an ice skating rink. He was brought to the ED where he had a Glasgow coma scale score of eight, where 15 is normal for poor responsiveness. And this is his exam. This is all you're going to get. Different format today, or for mine. And I want you to look up at the ceiling. Look up at the ceiling with your eyes. Good. Look down. Hopefully, at the floor. you can hear the audio. I don't know Best if you can. You can look at the floor. Look at the ceiling. Somebody could give me a yes, maybe. Yes. Look at the floor. Excellent. Okay. Good. Look at the ceiling. Look at the floor. Good. Look right at the light of the camera. And I'm just going to move your head down a little bit. Look right at the light of the camera. Good. Look right at the light of the camera. Right at the light of the camera. Good. Look right at the light of the camera. Right at the light of the camera. Look up. Good. Right at the light of the camera. Look down. Look at each line. Good last time. Look at each line. Look at each line. So this is an optokinetic flag uh, that's being moved vertically in front of his eyes. You, you can't see that. I want you to take all of that in. And finding number one, which of the following is false? Think, think about each of these. I, I'm sorry, there's no pulling system. Um, when psychotic slowing is seen in a patient with an ocular motor palsy, slowing is usually proportional to the amount of ophthalmoparesis and cannot be overcome by the VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex, that is moving the head vertically in his case. Think about that. Bilateral upgaze paresis can result from a unilateral ocular motor nucleus lesion. Unilateral down gaze paresis can result from a unilateral ocular motor nucleus lesion. The most likely localization for this finding is the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, the INC, a unilateral rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus RIMLF lesion should not abolish upward saccades. Okay, so now let's let's talk about these answers. True or false? 
This is true. Generally speaking, it is proportional. Let's say you have a, a, a nuclear sixth, um, or for instance, um, a, a fascicular six or a peripheral six, you're not going to be able to overcome that lateral rectus paresis with the VOR, in that case, the horizontal VOR. Bilateral upgaze paresis can result from a unilateral. Yes, we talked about this before. Um, we talked about the fact that there is bilateral innervation uh, for the superior rectus. They decussate these fibers. So if you have a unilateral ocular motor nucleus lesion, that can cause bilateral superior rectus paresis. This is also true, right? You can affect the, the ipsilateral inferior rectus. What about this? No, that's, that's just wrong. The INC wouldn't be expected to cause what we just saw here. And finally, this is true. A unilateral RIMLF lesion should not abolish upward saccades. So let's keep going. And I want you to look to the right. This is I want you to look to the finding left. number two. Look all the way we to the left. had a little difficulty finding directions. As far as you can look. But adduction. Look all the way to the left. Over at the light. With versions with ductions. As far as you can look. Over to the left. Over to the left. Again, adduction was normal. Look all the way to the right. Look all the way to the right. As far as you can look. And this was a little trickier. It was, it was a, a young gentleman who was a little hard to examine. Here it is in slow motion, a horizontal OKN. And he does have slow phases. He does have fast phases. I'll let you watch that one more time here. It's a little hard. It's a little quick in slow motion. But he does have slow phases and fast phases in both directions. And the robustness of the quick phases, the saccades, look pretty darn good horizontally. All right, question number two, which of the following is true? The most likely localization for this is the ponds. And also given what we know about finding number one, which uh, I guess at this point is kind of an exercise in whether or not you paid attention to Dr. Moodley's uh, presentation as well. So I think that these two are complementary. The AB ducting saccade seen with a horizontal optokinetic stimulus is consistent with a lesion involving the fascicle of the sixth nerve. Eyelid retraction, third nerve palsy, and or pupillary light near dissociation may be associated features with this. AB duction will not improve with the horizontal VOR. The patient will have an exotropia. So what do we think about this? So this is false. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in the midbrain, referable to the midbrain. Again, given what we know um, from Dr. Moodley's excellent, very comprehensive overview of the, the midbrain. The abducting saccades seen with a horizontal can are, are consistent with a lesion involving the fascicle. This is also false. It was quick, but, but the abducting saccades, the fast phases um, with the optokinetic were actually quite robust and, and pretty good. Eyelid retraction, third nerve palsy, light nerve dissociation may be associated features with this. Yes, absolutely. Uh, with finding number two, abduction will not improve with the horizontal VOR. That's false. Oftentimes it does. Oftentimes those abduction parases that that patient had that I just showed you can improve or resolve with the horizontal VOR. We'll talk about why that is. Patient will have an exotropia, uh, that's false as well. This patient had normal adduction and abnormal abduction, abduction. So here are the answers. And I want you to look up at the this ceiling. This patient has a vertical saccade pulse. Look up at the ceiling with This your patient's eyes. rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus, RIMLF. Fast as you can, look at the floor. Very unhappy. Look at the ceiling. No vertical saccade. Look at the floor. No upward. Look no at the downward. ceiling. But clearly, look, head down a little bit. Look with right the, the vestibular the ocular reflex, clearly he can look up and down. Look right at the light so of the camera. This can't be third nerve palsy. This can't be bilateral thirds. And obviously, it would be atypical Deep in point. the absence of mandriasis and ptosis. And here point. you look see the slow point. phase, which are, is the pursuit system working, but no fast phases. So this is a psychotic problem. Finding number two, this patient and has pseudo-abducens right. or pseudo-six nerve palsies, 
which I didn't, all the way didn't to the demonstrate left. here, but could be overcome by a horizontal view. Look all the way to the left. Just, Over at the light. Take a good video of it, unfortunately. As far as you can look. But he just couldn't make left. it all the way over with over either eye. And this is also referable the way to, to the, the right. midbrain and is commonly look seen all the way in to the conjunction right. with other midbrain as far as signs. You can look. And he did have normal optokinetic response. So if you had abduction paresis um, that was that significant from six nerve palsies, for instance, you would not see abducting saccades, quick phases like he has. Again, this is quick. It's not the best example, but it's the best I could get. So this is kind of too good for a six nerve palsy. And here's what he had. He had bilateral mesodiencephalic strokes rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus, the, the rostral midbrain going into the thalamus, bilateral. And here's the diagnosis. He had bilateral um, strokes, uh, presumably from artery or percheron, which we heard about before as well, which uh, it is um, has a distribution that's bilateral due to vertebral artery dissection causing pseudo six and a bilateral rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus vertical saccade palsy. All right, now we're going to talk about that. So, and what happened? He was found in the lounge of the night, the ice skating rink. He actually fell and hit his head. That's how he had a vertebral artery dissection. He had an artery to artery embolus, which resulted in a top of the basilar syndrome, which uh, it, um, affected his arousal, which caused a, a decreased responsiveness, uh, presumably the reticular activating system there. And this is what he had. So the midbrain, we, we heard about the midbrain. It's more than just a place for the third nucleus. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. You can have a paranoid syndrome. Um, where you can have primarily the upward movements are affected, right? You have an upgaze palsy, you can have convergence retraction nystagmus with attempted upgaze. And, and here we're talking about thinking about the posterior commissure. What about the rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome? Typically downward greater than upward saccades are affected. Here's the RI on the left. But if you have bilateral complete RIMLF lesions, then you're not going to be able to make saccades upward or downward, like in our case. If you have an interstitial nucleus of Cajal, if they're bilateral and complete, you can have all sorts of vertical gaze palsies, but not specific to the saccades, the vertical saccades. If you have a unilateral interstitial nucleus of Cajal lesion, you can have problems with vertical gaze holding. You can have utricle pathway um, imbalance, which results in a skew deviation and an ocular counter roll. And uh, when you're talking about the midbrain, always fun to throw in the uh, PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy here. You can see the Mickey Mouse sign here, this sort of atrophic tegmentum of the midbrain. And initially, one of the first signs that you'll see are these poor uh, vertical saccades or a loss of the vertical uh, fast phases, especially downward with optokinetic nystagmus. Um, as if, in case you couldn't tell, I really like OKN. I check in every single patient. Conclusion, pseudo times two, not times one. Finding number one, vertical saccade palsy, RIMLF. And this is a pseudo vertical gaze palsy. This is supranuclear because it can easily be overcome with the VOR. And clearly with the pursuit system, you can get the patient to look up and down. So we know that it can't be a, a nuclear or an infranuclear problem. If you have a unilateral RIMLF lesion, then you'll have slow downward greater than upward saccades. This is due to dual innervation, this redundancy of the upward saccade pathways. But if it's bilateral and complete, you can abolish everything, all vertical saccades, as in our patient. What is my pearl, um, practical pearl? You really have to evaluate all classes of eye movements in all planes and all these patients. It takes an additional 20 seconds. Finding number two, pseudo, our, our second pseudo, pseudoabducens palsy. This is thought to be primarily due to a lesion of the descending, these inhibitory convergence pathways. 
And if uh, a pseudo Sixner palsy, again, is supranuclear, you can also um, overcome this typically with the vestibular ocular reflex from this disinhibited convergence pathways that causes an increased convergence or medial rectus tone, kind of a, a hyperconvergence, too much convergence. And that can look like, again, pseudo abducens palsies. It can look like a, an abducens palsy when in fact it, it is not. It can be contralesional because these pathways decussate. It can be contralesional if it's up high in the thalamus. It can be ipsilesional if it's um, caudal to the decussation in the midbrain. So in our patient, it's hard to know where exactly it happened. He has bilateral. So is it bilateral because it was bilaterally above the decussation or bilaterally below the decussation? Clinical pearl, these patients are almost always going to have other midbrain signs. And this is a supranuclear abduction deficit. If I have another minute, this is probably something that, that might be new to some people, may, perhaps not. But RIMLF and torsion, two findings that you're also going to see in an acute RIMLF syndrome. One is that if it's unilateral or asymmetric, you'll see a spontaneous torsional nystagmus with the top holes beating toward the contralesional ear. This is in distinction with an INC lesion where the, the uh, top holes will be towards the ipsy lesional ear. But the, the second interesting bedside finding that, that you should uh, look for is the loss of ipsy torsional quick phases. So this is my wife last night because I realized I didn't have an example of normal and it's always nice to have an example of normal. This is just simply me tilting her head slowly, the right ear towards the right shoulder, the left ear towards the, the left shoulder. And there's this physiologic ocular tilt reaction that moves the eyes, but then there's a quick phase, an ipsy torsional quick phase. This is normal. Everybody can, hopefully you can see these little quick phases, these quick torsional phases, these are all normal. My wife is very normal. She's got perfect uh, ocular motor function. So this is what you should see. This is what you'll see in a patient who has an RIMLF lesion. This is another patient with bilateral RIMLF lesions. And here's our technician doing the same thing, rolling the head. And there's the slow phase. There's the slow movement. This is a roll VOR. This is the, again, physiologic ocular tilt reaction, the ocular counter roll that you're seeing. But there's no quick face. And if it's a unilateral RIMLF lesion, you'll have no ipsy torsional quick phases. This patient has none in either direction because this is a bilateral RIMLF lesion. And if I have 45 more seconds, because Dr. Moodley threw this out, um, this is another patient I saw who has horizontal and vertical saccade palsies. Can't look and in any direction with saccades, but clearly her vestibular ocular reflex is normal. She can move the eyes. And her smooth pursuit system demonstrates that horizontal and vertical movements are otherwise normal. This is a pure saccadic palsy. But this isn't just vertical. This isn't just horizontal. This is everything. So what is this, right? So it can't just be, um, it can't just be a lesion involving the RIMLF and the PPRF because they're so far apart. Is there a unifying diagnosis? And that unifying diagnosis is maybe this is these are probably these perineuronal nets which Dr. Moodley mentioned in passing. This is a patient who didn't have a um, cardiac surgery, but a young woman who woke up from a pulmonary thrombectomy surgery and couldn't move her eyes. Um, the other thing that I really love about this case, this is a telemedicine consult. Um, I love optokinetic nystagmus, and this is the perfect opportunity. She's in a car, and she's the passenger. And so this is the scenery, the visual scenery, moving the eyes, the pursuit system working, but she can't generate that fast face. She doesn't have saccades. And interestingly, this patient was on her way to see my colleague, Dr. Amanda Henderson in neuroophthalmology at Wilmer. Um, so it, one hour uh, before I, or one hour after I was seeing her. So only at Hopkins can you see two neuroophthalmologists in, in two hours for the exact same thing. So thank you for your time and attention um, through the North American Neuroophthalmology Virtual Education Library. I also have a, a collection of eye movement videos. All the videos that I showed and many more can be found there. 
Um, also, my book, uh, everybody can feel free to buy my book, but also I just want to let you know that there are lots and lots of free pieces of my book that can be found in my collection, including all the videos, electronic supplemental materials, and now a lot of the figures as well. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dan. Dan, that was uh, too good a case and uh, so many interesting points from that case, uh, no doubt. I mean, doing an optokinetic testing for uh, picking up subtle points and doing a VOR to know the supranuclear inputs, uh, no doubt, I mean. So how was this patient on follow-up? I mean, did the, did the movements improve? So unfortunately, they, they normally don't. Um, I've never seen a complete resolution Unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to see this particular patient in follow-up. Um, he was kind of lost. Obviously, the stroke follow-up was most important for him. But um, of the patients who I have seen longitudinally, including that patient who had the complete saccade palsy, horizontal and vertical, I just saw her yesterday. And this is two years, exactly the same. No, absolutely no improvement. That being said, it's a different pathophysiology in her case. Yeah. Any comments from the faculty panel? Then video, Dr. Gold. I had one very basic question. When we label it as pseudo abducens palsy, did we do a duction test? These were all versions what we saw in our videos, but was it yep. duction? Yep, absolutely. You should always always test for ductions and any sort of uh, funny ophthalmoparesis, and, and there was no difference. Um, with ductions, it, it looked about the same. And can any infranuclear deficits also present in this way? I'm sorry, say that one, say that again. Infranuclear parasites or infranuclear deficit can present in the similar fashion where we would only differentiate by the basis of the BOR and the optocaine. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, if it's a nuclear or infranuclear, you should not be able to overcome it with the vestibular ocular reflex um, like this patient. So. And I that immediately tells you this has to be supranuclear. This has a history of uh, trauma. There can be another etiology, a stroke. What else do you want ophthalmologists to look for when we think of when we think of a pseudoparesis of sixth nerve or a pseudo vertical gaze palpable? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I guess I would say it's all about the company that it keeps. Um, so th there's a lot that's referable to the midbrain here. So would it make more sense that you have one more finding that's referable to the midbrain that is a pseudo abducens palsy rather than saying that this patient also has pontine lesions? That being said, he did have a, 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 an embolic etiology. So you can certainly have a shower of emboli to multiple parts of the brain stem. But for uh, nicely, there was a, a, a parsimonious explanation, and these lesions, in his case, explain everything. The videos are wonderful. We learned a lot. Sorry. Uh, yes, I, I have a question. When do we have a skew deviation in such cases? Or when do we look, when, when should we look for it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, so the RIMLF uh, is pretty close to the INC. And if you hit the INC, that's part of the pathway for those utricle ocular motor pathways. So I have a really nice case in my collection of a patient who had a complete RIMLF syndrome in addition to a complete INC syndrome. And so that patient had the, the typical RIMLF features that we just discussed, in addition to a skew deviation and an ocular um, tilt reaction with ocular counter roll and a head tilt as well. So absolutely, there's a lot going on in the midbrain. Uh, it's a, a smorgasbord from an ocular motor standpoint. Yeah, any, any, any comments? I think it was... Uh... It was a very nice session. And uh, I thank uh, all the great speakers from which uh, who were in this session and uh, contributed uh, to this uh, session. And the panelists uh, where we had a wonderful discussion and all the faculty, uh, thank you so much. Uh, with this, I, will, I would hand over the, my, this session to the uh, next uh, co uh, moderator and Dr. Satya Kanna would uh, take over. Dr. Satya, thank you. Thank you, Jaspreet.
Let me introduce the next moderator, Dr. Virinder Sachdev, who is a consultant ophthalmologist and pediatric ophthalmologist at uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute, GMRV Campus, Vishakapatnam, India. He has 87 publications in peer reviewed international journals, 10 book chapters, including textbook chapters in your ophthalmology. He is a reviewer for AJO, BJO, Ophthalmology, BMC Ophthalmology, IJO, JCRS, and MEAJO. He is also an editor for Frontiers in Ophthalmology, Pediatric Ophthalmology section. His areas of interest include optic neuritis, including atypical optic neuritis, MS, NMO, IIH, and neuroimaging. Over to you, Virendra. Thanks, Dr. Satya. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I think we have had wonderful sessions over the last two days. And uh, we, as we go to the last session, I think it is going to be another uh, great session for all of us. Uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure to be there for the meeting. I've been listening to all the sessions. And it's a pleasure to introduce the various panelists and the speakers for this session. Uh, I just give me a second. I would like to share my slides to introduce the various speakers. Um, okay. okay, it's not displaying on <laughs> the share mode. One second. So then no, no, the slides are open. Uh, Sunil, can you help? I yeah, hope the slides are visible now. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, for all the panelists, uh, I'll begin by introducing the panelists. Our first panelist is Vivek Varkat. He's a great friend and uh, my colleague at LVPA. Bhuvaneshwar campus in India. He did his fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology establishments and near ophthalmology at LV Prasad Institute, Hyderabad. And he did his international fellowship in complex establishments at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. His special focus areas are complex establishments, including craniosynostosis, CCDDs, and pediatric near ophthalmology and pediatric cataract. He is serving as reviewer for many peer reviewed journals and has many peer reviewed publications. Our next panelist is Dr. Swati Fuljale. She is an additional professor of ophthalmology at RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi, India. She has been awarded with AIOS Singapore National Eye Center Fellowship in Neuroophthalmology. She serves as a section editor for Neuroophthalmology section of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. And she is also the managing editor, editor for INOS Times, uh, an e-publication of the Indian Neuroophthalmological Society. She has 80 peer reviewed publications and 25 book chapters. Her areas of interest are near ophthalmology and strabismus. Our next panelist is Dr. Vashni Shankar. She is a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and near ophthalmology. She works at Shaw Fai Center in New Delhi and at Vivo Vision, New Delhi. She did her DNB, FICO, and fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus from Shankar Netralya, Chennai. And her special focus areas are disorders of convergence and accommodation, complex trabismus, and unexplained vision loss. Our next panelist is Dr. Satya Karna, whom we all very well know has been the brainchild about this great meeting. He is the director of the Department of Ophthalmology at JP Hospitals, Noida. He has authored the Shankar Netralya Atlas of Neuro Ophthalmology, two editions, and also step-by-step uh, -step near ophthalmology examination and diagnosis. He's a joint secretary of Indian Near Ophthalmological Society. He's moderator of the Near Ophthalmology Special Interest Group and serves as the reviewer for the Near Ophthalmology section of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. With this, I take great pleasure in inviting our first speaker, Dr. Prem Subramanyam. Uh, we all very well know him uh, with his active participation over the years with the Indian Near Ophthalmological uh, Society and meetings. Uh, he serves as a professor at, uh, he serves as a professor of ophthalmology, neurology, 
and also as the vice chair for academic affairs at University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is currently on the board of directors of NANOS and the current president of NANOS. He serves as the vice chair of the Council of American Academy of Ophthalmology. He is a member of AO Board of Trustees. He has over 230 peer reviewed publications, many book chapters, and web based educational materials. He is the founding member of the Marcus of the medical staff of the Marcus Institute of Brain Health and with focus on traumatic brain injury. And his areas of interest include progressive thyroid ophthalmopathy, IIH, inter increased intracranial pressure, visual and balance dysfunction after traumatic brain injury. So uh, I, I invite you, Dr. Prem, to begin with your case. Uh, over to you. You can share the screen. Uh, I think you need to unmute. We are unable to hear you. There we go. Yep. Okay. So thank you. And uh, very happy to be here today to share this case with you. I have no uh, financial disclosures here. Let me just go back. And so I've titled this, The Diagnosis is Clear. Uh, this presents a little bit of a diagnostic dilemma over the course of a few years. As you will see, it ultimately becomes an obvious diagnosis, but I'd like to talk about the process and uh, hopefully give some ideas and get some ideas from the panelists as well as to why this could have been a little bit challenging. So this is um, a 22-year-old man. We saw a 22-year-old man earlier with a, now this one has a right eye redness and a little bit of pain and swelling for several days and uh, developed a little bit of decreased vision, um, no diplopia at that time. Uh, the pain would come and go. He was able to go about his daily activities. He had no systemic symptoms, but because of the health system in which he was, he went to see a family nurse practitioner first. And this family nurse practitioner examined him. I don't have those records, but uh, no testing or imaging was done. He was <clears throat> thought to have this red eye and was given a diagnosis of orbital inflammation. And amazingly enough, this non-ophthalmologist gave him a periocular steroid injection. The patient is very clear that uh, a needle was passed into the orbit through the eyelid and that steroid was injected. And he said that his problem improved, his eye redness was better, his pain and swelling resolved, and all of this went away for about two or three months. So he was very happy and did not seek any subsequent care at that time. Unfortunately, over the next three years, he would develop pain in his right eye. It would come and go. And he did notice that his vision in his right eye also seemed to be declining slowly. And again, he's not entirely clear as to whether it was stepwise, whether it was just slowly over time, a little more blurry. But then he began to notice double vision when he was looking to the sides. And he's not clear on the timeline of that. But at the same time, he noted that his right eye was becoming more prominent. He was developing mild eye redness again. So over three years, and again, he didn't really pay much attention to this because he's a young man, he's working, he's busy, he didn't feel like this was particularly important, and it certainly was not preventing him from doing anything at that time. So this led to some delay in his seeking care. Well, eventually he did go and see an optometrist who sent him to a comprehensive ophthalmologist who then ultimately sent him to an oculoplastics specialist. And that uh, oculoplastics specialist in a, a nearby city saw the patient and found mildly reduced visual acuity in the right eye, uh, found also that the patient had an RAPD on the right with poor color vision in that eye. There was a general limitation of eye movements of the right eye. And again, I have not seen this patient yet, so I don't have anything more to share with you other than this photograph, which the patient had six millimeters of right eye proptosis by her tell. But I think you can appreciate perhaps why this patient was not too concerned with his condition, because even though objectively that right eye is definitely out, and if you pay attention to some details in the photos, you can see that there's a difference in the upper um, you know, the superior sulcus appearance, the inferior appearance that goes along with this axial proptosis. He just didn't really notice too much. And then on fundus exam, it was thought there might be some mild pallor of the right optic disc. 
So at this time, given that this patient has had this chronic condition, that he had this proptosis, he had this limitation of eye movement and RAPD, neuroimaging was certainly the next step to be performed. And so a CT scan was done. And this CT scan clearly demonstrates this nice axial proptosis and shows a relatively ill-defined process in the intraconal space. The extraocular muscles themselves appear to be intact and the globe appears to be intact. And uh, interestingly, the extraconal aspect also appears to be relatively normal. If we look on coronal images of this CT scan, again, this is a non-enhanced uh, CT scan. I don't think that's a, a drawback in some of these orbital diseases. You can appreciate on this soft tissue window that again, there's just this generalized process within the orbits by uh, on the right, in the right orbit, and maybe some uh, mild sinus mucosal thickening, not too impressive. He had no sinus symptoms. Uh, everything else was interpreted as normal. So he went on to get an MRI scan as well. And this MRI scan recapitulates what we saw on the CT, not too much in the sinus on either side, nasal mucosa looks good, visualized brain looks normal, I think you can appreciate with contrast, no intracranial lesions, no thickening of the meninges as we have seen in some of the other cases, cavernous sinus not well visualized on these cuts, but cavernous sinuses were normal, but clearly this diffuse process within the right orbit. Uh, it was distinct from the optic nerve, certainly some enhancement of the optic nerve sheath. And then again, just a general process, which is separable from the extraocular muscles, uh, perhaps infiltrating them a little bit, but still really an intraconal process. So what next steps why, might we pursue at this point? You know, we can consider laboratory workup, we can consider uh, biopsy, we can consider a number of different things, repeat neuroimaging with dedicated scans. Zoe Williams showed us how DWI and other images sometimes might be useful in the diagnosis of orbital cranial disease like this. But he was in the hands of one of my dear colleagues, an oculoplastic specialist. So of course he went to biopsy. And interestingly enough, he's a fantastic surgeon. And in his operative note, he went in through an upper eyelid incision, had found it difficult to find anything that looked grossly abnormal, and then went transconjunctivally, inferiorly through the fornix. Still, you know, found fat, but did not find anything that was grossly abnormal. So wisely took chunks of tissue from both the upper and lower approach and sent them off to the pathologist. Pathologists found inactive and sclerosed granulomas with associated chronic inflammation. I don't have the image to show you, but this was the interpretation. And so this was thought to be an idiopathic orbital inflammatory process based on this. And he was started on oral prednisone, 20 milligrams to, uh, BID for about two weeks, and then slowly tapered down. And his condition improved, but then recurred. And he had continued visual worsening. He was having more pain. He was having progressive proptosis. And so my colleague reached out to me and said, well, we need to do something else. Well, let me send him to you and see what you think. So at this point now he comes to see me and he has visual acuity of 2070 in his right eye, normal in his left eye. He's able to appreciate no color plates in the right eye and normal in the left and RAPD. He has, again, still generalized moderate ophthalmoplegia of his right eye, now seven millimeters of proptosis. He's been treated with a round of corticosteroids and yet his proptosis has worsened. He has two plus conjunctival injection, dilated surface vessels, and I felt that he had optic disc edema and no pallor. And I don't have a photograph to show you, but I do think this OCT demonstrates nicely for you that the left optic nerve is completely normal in appearance as well as retinal nerve fiber layer. While in the right eye, you can see that maybe there is a little bit of temporal thinning, but there is definite swelling superiorly and inferiorly and goes along with the fundus appearance that I saw. His macular ganglion cell complex, though, shows that there is a marked thinning in the right eye compared to the left, and so explaining the RAPD and the decreased vision and the setting of this optic nerve swelling. 
So I ordered a repeat MRI scan. I saw this patient, now he's 25 years old. He's again, still actively working, but he's now worried because he's losing more vision in the right eye and it just isn't responding well to therapy. And I think you can appreciate that now this process appears to be somewhat more dense in the right orbit than it was before. It's harder to see little pockets of fat like there were previously. The poor right optic nerve is definitely being compressed within there. I don't think you can see any cuff of CSF around it anymore and a generally concerning finding. So at this point, we did pursue a little more of a workup for him because he's had imaging, he's had biopsy, which showed something that was felt to be nonspecific. But it's important to go back and just take a broader approach and to say, well, you know, this doesn't look like thyroid eye disease, but we'll just check that anyway, just to be sure. Uh, IgG4 disease is one of those things that can always fool us and present in a number of different ways. It can be steroid responsive marginally, but then prove to be steroid resistant. He got an ESR and CRP, which of course are non-specific indicators of inflammation. And in part, just because we were searching for a diagnosis, we got an ANCA with reflex to uh, MPO and PR3 antibodies. Then just more basic laboratories, the uh, CBC with differential, basic chemistry, treponemal antibodies, uh, ANA and rheumatoid factor. Uh, I, the ordering of the ANA, I tend to avoid that. I do have a good friend who said once, if the neuro-ophthalmologist is ordering an ANA, you know that they have no idea what's going on. But nonetheless, we were trying to cast a broad net here to see what might be happening with this patient. And so we felt at this point, like no one particular diagnosis was going to be most likely. We did have this prior pathology showing sclerosing and inactive granulomatous inflammation, but we were surprised to get back that he had a positive Cianca at a high level of significance, one to 640 with a positive PR3 antibody, very consistent with the diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangiitis. And Unfortunately, at this point, the patient took a turn for the worse. He now has light perception vision. This was within about five weeks. Light perception vision without projection in the right eye and 2015 vision in the left eye. His pain was persisting. He still had optic disc swelling, but no disc pallor. So in the setting, and we did get a copy of his pathology, the pathology slides and had them reviewed by our neuropathologist who said, oh yes, you know, now that I know that there is this one to 640 positive C anca. I'm looking carefully at this pathology specimen and seeing that there is indeed evidence for great uh, vasculitis. And so it went along with these laboratory findings. So we continued him on corticosteroids, but this is a disease that can be corticosteroid resistant, of course. So we were interested in starting him on further immunosuppressive therapy. So while in the past, drugs like cyclophosphamide were the mainstay of treatment for GPA. We sought to start him on treatment with rituximab or potentially methotrexate. And there is a new drug that was just approved by the FDA in the US at the end of 2021 called Avacopan. And this drug is an uh, approved as an adjunctive treatment for ANCA positive vasculitis. And I had not uh, encountered a patient yet with ANCA positive vasculitis after this drug had been approved. And it was in fact, my rheumatology colleague to whom I sent this patient who alerted me to the availability of this medicine. And it is an oral C5 and a C5A antagonist. And those of you who uh, immediately will recognize that's blocking C5A is one of the things we do in patients with neuromyelitis optica with uh, one of the new drugs that is available to treat it. And so it's interesting that ANCA positive vasculitis is being approached in this same way as, uh, I don't know if eculizumab has been tried in echopositive vasculitis, but just something to keep in mind. But granulomatosis with polyangiitis, of course, has two forms where if the kidneys are involved, it is considered to be systemic disease. 
And if the kidneys are not involved, regardless of what else is involved, it's considered limited disease just by definition. And upper and lower respiratory tract, eye and orbit, skin, ears, heart, and other organs can be involved. And this is an example of the classic pathology that one can see with the granuloma here within the biopsy tissue. This is a lung biopsy, not an orbital biopsy. And this is associated uh, perivasculitis. And so we read about this in the textbook. It's, you know, we think about it as, oh, it's an obvious diagnosis, right? The patient comes in, they have something like saddle nose deformity, or they have terrible sinusitis, or they have respiratory symptoms, they have renal dysfunction. In this case, this was limited just to his orbit. I showed you on his imaging that there was maybe a little of sinusitis, but it was not very impressive and certainly not symptomatic. And we see such findings on many patients who come in for a variety of reasons. So he had a biopsy, he had a biopsy that showed granulomatous inflammation. Why was the diagnosis missed on the initial biopsy? Well, a friend and colleague, Victor Elner, who is an orbital specialist and pathologist at University of Michigan, has written about how there are a number of factors that can lead to missing this diagnosis. Because again, half of cases of GPA can have eye and orbit involvement. So we need to have high suspicion for this disease when patients show up with orbital inflammation. Steroid treatment can mask the vasculitis. And this patient had been on steroid therapy off and on before he was biopsied. We tend as orbital surgeons to take small biopsies because we don't want to cause harm. We, that's a, one of our principles, as you heard earlier. But it's important to get an adequate biopsy in order to get the answer and then an inadequate search for vascular changes for that perivascular or vascular vascular inflammation can lead to missing the diagnosis. And I think the combination of these things, and finally, this patient's age was somewhat unusual. Although this disease can occur at any age, characteristically, it does tend to occur in patients who are somewhat older in their 40s or 50s than it does in a patient who is only 22 years old when this disease process started. So the clinical challenges I think that this case posed to me were that I was seeing him late in the presentation of his disease. He had had a number of interventions that had already been done, and there were questions about how likely we were to get positive results to give us an answer. He was treated with an orbital steroid injection without a clear diagnosis. And I certainly think that no one who is participating in this conference would do that. But to those listening out there, uh, again, uh, something that may not be the best approach when you don't know exactly what it is that you're treating. And then finally, the oral prednisone treatment before biopsy may have reduced our sensitivity for picking up the characteristic changes of GPA. And then some systemic challenges that we had is that this patient, because of his work, uh, had limited follow-up with the healthcare profession and did not have any medical insurance, making it difficult for him to pursue further treatment and to get uh, studies done at some point. So what I think I take away from this case is that we think of GPA as being a relentlessly progressive, aggressive disease that over the course of months causes tissue destruction, necrosis, and becomes very obvious. And in this case, over the course of three years, it was much more indolent with recurrences and had to really be sought out as a diagnosis. The steroid resistance or dependence can occur in a lot of causes of orbital inflammation, and GPA is one of them. The limited form of disease disease is frequent. And it's important, again, to not overlook it because there are no other systemic signs. And we must have a high level of suspicion on pathology to make the diagnosis. So I'll be uh, happy to entertain any comments from our panelists. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Yeah, wonderful case, Dr. Pem. Uh, I think uh, you highlighted many important issues that uh, it was a gradually progressive uh, a subtle course as compared to the what we normally see in GPA. And I think that was causing a difficulty in establishing possibly diagnosis and not seeing it that as the first primary differential diagnosis. But also I think the patient was first seen by a nurse practitioner who had given a steroid injection at that time also that gave relief for a long period of time that caused a delay in seeking the advice. Uh, the, uh, what was quite surprising was also that it was pro all totally confined to one orbit. There was nothing yes. in the other side also, despite being a systemic disease. So how often do you see 
something like uh, vasculitis affecting only one orbit. Yeah, that, that was clearly a challenge here, right? Uh, we, or those who'd seen him before us were steered away from the diagnosis because of the lack of other findings, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, I'm Vivek here, Dr. Subramanyam, yeah. So very uh, interesting case. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, like uh, looking at the presentation, I would definitely think about like NSOID or IgG4 disease. That's what, you know, routinely we usually think about. But if you look at, you know, the carefully the MRI plates, I mean, there is no enlargement of the muscles. And I'm sure, that, you know, there were no hyper intensities of, you know, like uh, extraocular muscles. So that would uh, give me to think probably I'm not dealing with what routinely we do see. And then uh, always like it's better to look at like other organ involvement, like, you know, the kidney and lung. So as you said, like if they are not involved, then probably we are dealing with, you know, the limited form of uh, GPA. And uh, in this particular case, interestingly, like uh, ANCA, that to a very specific, uh, you know, those protease T, uh, that comes out positive, that gives you, you know, the more clues probably that is going something like, uh, you know, the polyangitis. And that is the reason probably in this particular case, there was an optic perineuritis that was causing the damage to the nerve and uh, a loss of vision. So that's quite interesting. Thank you for presenting uh, and giving this rare case. Probably our thinking process would add this entity as even if it is a uniocular or atypical presentation, along with these two common entities, probably we need to add this in our differential and really look for it. And uh, that's how we can make a difference. Great uh, case. Thanks, Vivek. Uh, Dr. Supremaniam, uh, maybe uh, I missed out. What was the urine sediment and other things uh, normal for this patient, not suggestive at all for Okay. And, uh, his urinalysis was completely normal. His pulmonary function was completely normal. And we, we really did not find evidence of tissue damage elsewhere in the body other than the right orbit. Uh, I would like to share here two experiences. One patient I saw uh, that was very challenging for, and I saw first time and final diagnosis was granulomatous, uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis. So that patient had presented with multiple episodes of cranial nerve palsies. And uh, recurrent uh, polycranialis was the diagnosis with the patient was working. And with a lot of difficulty, there were episodes of vision loss. We could finally seek opinion from an immunologist. And then finally, with the workup, it was established. So I would like to say that possibly very different forms can do occur. And they can respond to steroids that make it difficult to establish the diagnosis. And second experience is of an elderly man I have seen last year with very similar picture, unilateral, confined uh, orbital inflammation, what muscles were involved. So we couldn't get that tissue diagnosis, but the systemic workup with ANA and ANA profile was positive for systemic sclerosis antibody profile. So we did treat, but finally the immunologist came back and said that this is possibly not related. It's just a general finding. So how do you go about it in such a situation? Do we obtain a tissue diagnosis and then only we can say, or would that immunological finding be not significant in that? In a finding like that, I, I would be still inclined to try to get a tissue diagnosis. I think that some of those diagnoses of systemic sclerosis and such tend to be somewhat broad. And I don't know, I, I, I would seek a little more guidance as to the specific process in the orbit if possible. Uh, before to help me to guide therapy. So that, that would be my approach. I don't know if any of the other panelists or speakers have a different opinion on that. And thank you very much. Uh, any inputs from other panelists, any other, other speakers? Well, there was a question from Dr. Ambika about the cause of the optic neuropathy. And it's a great question because I think initially we thought it was primarily compressive because of that worsening orbital process. But ultimately, he went to no light perception. And I, th I think that has more to do with perhaps uh, vasculitis involving the blood supply to the optic nerve, unfortunately. And that can happen in these patients. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think there are reports of, uh, you know, the uh, development of like uh, ischemic optic neuropathies in the form of like PION or even AION because of, you know, the vasculitic uh, component. There's another question uh, from Dr. Ed Selling. Uh, has the group seen GPA improve with SEPTRA? Would like to add anything more on that? I have no experience with treating with uh, that agent with SEPTRA or Bactrim. I defer to others. No experience either. Uh, but yes, our immunologists do primarily prefer cyclophosphamide as the first agent. Okay, uh, so yeah, if there are no other comments, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Subramanian. Uh, wonderful case and a lot of learning with that. With that, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Andrew Carey. Uh, again, uh, I think there is some issue with uh, slide sharing. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for the technical uh, glitch at my end. Uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, uh, I would uh, introduce Dr. Andrew Perry. He's assistant professor of neurology and ophthalmology at Wilmer Institute, John Hopkins, Baltimore. He did his uh, training in medicine and ophthalmology at University of South Florida. He did his fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at Bascom Palmer Institute, Miami, and fellowship in medical retina at University of Iowa. His main focus areas are optic neuritis, uh, uveitis related papillitis, ischemic optic neuropathies, hereditary optic neuropathies, and many retinal disorders, including diabetic retinopathy, AMD, and retinitis pigmentosa. With this, I would uh, like to invite Dr. Kerry for uh, his presentation. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me and I hope the uh, panelists and audience will enjoy my case. Uh, it's entitled Recurrent Bouncing Ouches. I have no uh, financial conflicts regarding this case. Um, so it starts off with a 60 year old uh, Latina lady who comes in. She has an eight month history of increased in photophobia, migraineous headaches and dizziness, as well as uh, two months of vertical binocular diplopia and a left sided ptosis. Interestingly enough, 11 years prior, she had an episode of transient vision loss with exotropia, possibly a third nerve palsy from the notes, but I don't have any of the details regarding it, lasting maybe less than seven days and then reports it had returned to normal. Again, no uh, intervening um, uh, detailed eye exams and, and she's not a great historian. Um, she does have a history of bipolar diseases on lamotrigine and type two diabetes for two years pre uh, which is diet controlled. Her afferent exam was uh, essentially normal. Um, she did not have any uh, concerns about recurrent vision loss as far as her sensory and motility. She did have left-sided trigeminal reduced um, sensation to about 20% compared to the right side involving the forehead, cheeks, and mandible. Um, there was no uh, pupillary asymmetries. Um, she did have a uh, pretty marked ptosis on the left side with a palpebral fissure of only two millimeters and her levator function was reduced to three millimeters. And on Maddox rod testing, she had a marked left hypotropia um, that was, and with limited elevation of that left eye. She also interestingly had some downbeat nystagmus worse in down gaze as expected in a left sided head tilt. And she did have um, intorsion on, on down gaze. Um, so in summary thus far, it's a 61-year-old female with eight months of worsening migraineous headaches, two months of double vision ptosis and a pattern of a superior left third palsy, as well as a left trigeminal neuropathy of unclear duration and asymptomatic downbeat nystagmus, worse in down gaze also of unclear duration. And I guess for the, the panel, can anybody think of a localization for this single lesion to give this presentation? Yeah, hello, Dr. Carey, I'm Dr. Swati here. 
yeah since it's a diffuse and when i read about the abstract your abstract i got puzzled because it difficult to localize this kind of a lesion when you have a third and that to not a complete third nerve whilst it's a partial third with fifth nerve and also some other signs neurological signs especially nystagmus so i was thinking if it could be some you know generalized inflammatory or infective process or for that matter even a demyelination would i am not sure maybe that could have been a differential to start with yeah, absolutely. I had uh, trouble localizing to a specific lesion as well. So, you know, downbeat nystagmus, we typically think posterior fossa, particularly cerebellar. The third nerve palsy, we all know, runs, you know, anteriorly. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's a divisional thing, something anterior to the cavernous sinus, like the fissure or intraorbital, possibly an orbital myopathy mimicking it. And the trigeminal neuropathy involving all three fit branches has to be posterior to the cavernous sinus, Meckel's cave, prepontine cistern, and the CSF or pons. And then migrainous headache, we all, you know, very nonspecific with the recurrent meningeal branch of the trigeminal nerve. So again, thinking something disseminated like the CSF or vasculitis um, uh, was, was kind of my thoughts. And then a specific etiology. Um, I know uh, we, had, we had mentioned demyelinating uh, is, is, uh, something of, we always think about, um, uh, I don't know if there were any other thoughts from the panel about a potential etiology for this, or perhaps we need some more information. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on. So, you know, the greatest concern, even though if it may not be the highest probability in aneurysm, uh, compressing the third nerve could be life threatening, although for in this particular case, low likelihood, given its pupil sparing, it's divisional and, and it's and it's a chronic, chronic double vision. Um, something inflammatory given the headache, like sarcoid, we just had a case of uh, GPA with vasculitis or IgG4, some kind of chronic infection. Um, and then Hickam's dictums, you know, the patient can have as many diseases as they damn well pleases. Um, so could they have multiple etiologies, downbeat nystagmus, perhaps from an anti-epileptic drug, although lamotrigine is not commonly associated with that, perhaps something like thymine deficiency could be contributing to some of this picture. So the prior workup, the patient had previously established with neurology and had an MRI of the brain with and without. By the time she came to me, I only had the report which said there were small vessel white matter changes with no enhancing lesions, infarct hemorrhage or mass effect not appreciated. So at least it ruled out a bunch of big, scary things. Um, and so I had an extended discussion with the patient about how we should proceed with her evaluation. There's a lot going on and some of it is very scary. Um, and, and I try to keep patients out of the ER if possible, especially in a, during a pandemic when there's a lot of sick uh, patients in an ER that might make your patient more sick versus, but versus doing an expedited outpatient workup. You know, she had a lot of chronic symptoms, um, but the neurologic deficits and the potential causes could be very serious. And she really did not want to go to the ER. So I said, well, then here are going to be our next steps. I need for you to get me your MRI images. I would like to do an MRA at the head to make sure there's not an aneurysm. A CT chest to rule out sarcoid, some infectious tests, um, because those are easily treatable and, and can lead to further neurologic deficits. And then inflammatory labs, a CBC, ESR, CRP, given her age, IgG4, ANCAs, and a urine creatinine protein ratio to make sure we don't have any nephritis. And then to think about a lumbar puncture if all of the above is negative. So everything came back normal. Um, and then we decided, okay, well, let's do an LP. Um, and, and could this be MOG? I know there's been reports of MOG causing orbital inflammation. And she didn't really have any orbital signs, but MOG is a new disease that I, I don't normally keep in the differential of nystagmus. But um, we don't know everything there is to know about MOG at this point in time. I know we have one of our esteemed MOG experts online with us today. Uh, I don't know if John is uh, able to speak. John, have you had any cases of MOG presenting with um, nystagmus as an ocular motor dysfunction? Um, not in isolation. I mean, if you had, you know, diffuse inflammation of, you know, the cerebellum and brain and parenchyma, those kinds of things, but not if there's not a pathology you can see on MRI. I haven't seen it in isolation of, you know, MOG floating around the CSF and causing these kinds of things. Well, that's good to know. That's one thing we can we can say. Probably not mog the next time we have a differential. Then, 
Um, so the further testing, she had a lumbar puncture, actually two of them, normal opening pressures, her CSF protein, white cells, cryptoantigen, Lyme, viral PCRs, myelin basic protein, a VDRL were all normal. Um, despite having normal white cells and protein, um, the flow cytometry read that there was 85% lymphocytes, 83% were mature B cells, and there was perhaps a monoclonal B cell uh, population with co-expression of CD5 and CD23, suggestive of uh, CLL or small cell lymphocytic lymphoma, and she had four plus CSF-specific oligoclonal bands. Um, and that was from the initial lumbar puncture. And so that's why the second one was done to reevaluate for this. And even on the second one, the white blood cells, there were only two. Um, her serum testing, as we had discussed, had all come back uh, essentially normal. The outside neurologist did test acetylcholine receptor antibodies and the modulating, while blocking was normal and striated was normal and binding was normal, the modulating came back at a level of 50 with the upper limit normal of 32. And we can see her, her A1C minimally elevated. She was sent to uh, hematology oncology, given these uh, concern for a systemic uh, leukemia or lymphoma. And they, she had a peripheral blood smear that came back with no clonal or abnormal phenotypes. And the CT chest, as we had discussed, including a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis was normal. For our panel, a borderline acetyl receptor, acetylcholine receptor modulating antibody. Um, it, does anybody think this could be myasthenia? This would be the strangest case of myasthenia I've ever seen, but we all know myasthenia can do well, almost anything. Um, we have nystagmus in myasthenia. I'm not sure. This kind of downbeat nystagmus. Yeah, I've, I've not heard of any cases of downbeat. Um, my uh, colleague, Dr. Bosley, has, has reported a few cases of uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo nystagmus, and we all, we all know about the pseudo INO you get with myasthenia. I think it would also be exceptionally strange to have pain with, exactly. with myasthenia um, and it'll try geminal sensory neuropathy and the oligoclonal bands, I think, suggest that there's much more likely a CNS inflammatory process and not a peripheral neuromuscular junction process. Um, although you could have more than one condition. And then abnormal CSF flow cytometry, could this be a CNS lymphoma or leukemia infiltration? We didn't see anything on the MRI and I apologize, I didn't include the pictures. You'll just have to take my word, they're exceptionally boring and what you would expect to see in a 61 year old um, uh, patient. Um, so you didn't see any lesions and, and the CSF protein and white blood cell count would be very atypical. So further course, her infectious workup was negative. We really didn't think it was lymphoma um, given, you know, we thought we were pretty, pretty thorough and, and she was getting worse. Uh, we decided to do a course of IV steroids for her, even though we hadn't reached a definitive diagnosis. Um, her, after following the IV steroids, she had total resolution of pain her trichomonal neuropathy, the ptosis, and the left eye elevation deficit. Her hypotropy improved from 30 prism diopters to 10 prism diopters in primary gaze. However, her downbeat nystagmus still persisted, although she didn't really report any oscillopsia. Um, so partial response to steroids um, probably doesn't rule out a le leukemia or lymphoma. Uh, even though we didn't think that that was going on. I don't know if the, the panel has any additional thoughts about further testing or further treatment we should do at this point in time. Nobody wants to give it away. Well, I appreciate the uh, moment of suspense. So we said this was an incomplete recovery and thought we should work her up for autoimmune encephalitis, including GED65 and anti Purkinje antibodies, and also that could help guide additional treatment, you know, um, uh, for, for what we should do for this patient. And uh, finally, we did get a diagnosis for her. Of course, you all knew we were going to have a diagnosis, because why would I bring a case without a diagnosis? Um, so her, uh, in both her CSF and her serum, uh, she had markedly elevated GAD65 antibodies. Um, so the final diagnosis is uh, uh, an autoimmune encephalitis associated with GAD65 with the 4-plus CSF oligoclonal bands presenting with 
painful diplopia in the pattern of a partial third palsy, downbeat nystagmus, trigeminal neuropathy with partial improvement after IV steroids. And so we went on to start her on uh, IVIG uh, for um, to see if we can make further improvement in her um, uh, double vision and, and nystagmus. And this, this has been reported, it's not totally novel, um, although it's relatively uh, recent uh, with two, two big reports. And I think there was a series reported at Nanos uh, two years ago. Um, with my colleague, Dr. Gold and Dr. Newsom um, evaluated a large group of patients with anti-GAD syndromes, um, uh, some of which had stiff person syndrome phenotypes and others had what they called a cerebellar ataxia phenotype. And uh, eight out of the 22 patients had uh, the cerebellar ataxia um, uh, phenotype. And um, uh, while well, many of the patients did have ocular motor uh, symptoms, the, the patients with the cerebellar ataxia had pretty dominant features of ocular motor dysfunction, of which the downbeat nystagmus was the most common, although they did have one patient with upbeat nystagmus. And then a uh, separate series um, looking at patients with gaze holding deficits and anti-GAD antibody. Uh, also reported 11 patients with ocular motor dysfunction, downbeat nystagmus, again, being the most common and one with an upbeat nystagmus. So um, that is my case. I think that's a puzzling case, uh, Dr. Ryukeri. Uh, very challenging. So, uh, so in such a case, after this workup, do, uh, what is the experience of the panel? The CSF remains totally bland all the time, even with autoimmune encephalitis. Does it help in any analysis? Would you like to repeat it? And uh, which, which all cases would you like to possibly consider doing further testing uh, in a, like as a message to all of us, where would you consider anti-GAD uh, workup first? Where would you recommend that we check for these antibodies? Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Maybe you can start, Dr. Andrew Kerry. And, uh, uh, is... Yeah, so um, what, uh, when discussing these, these uh, cases with um, uh, Dr. Gold, uh, uh, who has a, a little bit more experience with it than I do. Um, uh, he, he certainly recommends patients, uh, anybody with a downbeat nystagmus that doesn't have a, uh, uh, a clear explanation. Um, you know, they, they don't have a, a mass lesion. Um, they haven't been on, um, uh, you know, one of the co more common anti-epileptic causative medications for, for decades, they all get checked for, for GAD 65. Um, because uh, otherwise you're just left calling it idiopathic, in which case you're not going to have a treatment for them. Um, and you'll have a misdiagnosis and a mis mischance for treatment. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the nystagmus in, in, in my case, and, and I actually have another case with upbeat, is, is the patients were not symptomatic from the nystagmus and it was very subtle. Um, uh, you know, it was of a, 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 a low amplitude uh, nystagmus. And so you, we really had to look for it and, um, uh, on examination, uh, and, and carefully. So, um, uh, uh, I, that would be my recommendation for, for, for which patients need testing, which is all patients that don't have a, a clear, a clear answer. Thank you. Dr. Swati, any other comments, questions? I just have one question, Dr. Carey, is that would you go ahead and do MOG antibodies as well before we consider for GAD antibodies in such patients or the down gaze nystagmus is the key point in such a case? I think the nystagmus was definitely a uh, very, uh, was, was the thing that tipped us towards, um, towards GAD 65. Um, and uh, I think in the future, um, uh, and, and, uh, you know, nystagmus without having an explanatory lesion is, is probably not going to be, a a atypical presentation of demyelinating disease. Um, even though the demyelinating, some, some of our more typical, um, uh, 
the MRI sequences we depend on for, for identifying demyelinating disease may not be as good in the posterior fossa, and sometimes we have small lesions that you may not pick up, right? We have patients with, with MS who classically will come in with yeah. skewed deviation INO and you can't find the lesion, um, or even in ischemic disease. Um, but I, I think the, the nystagmus is, is a really key feature for GAD. Um, That's a huge uh, learning yeah. point, I think, for all of us. And I have another query why, because most of these patients have type 1 diabetes, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, your patient uh, had uh, type 2 diabetes, so I mean, I don't know if they get go with each other, or they are just two different processes. One is GAD, the other one is type 2 DM. Yeah, that's a really good question, sir. Type two diabetes is uh, very common in the United States and and, and among other countries. I, th I think it's um, pretty endemic. Um, certainly, we do know that that GAD antibodies are associated with with autoimmune diabetes, um, and uh, I think you know some patients are initially diagnosed as as type two, and then we find out it's really more autoimmune, and they become insulin sensitive. And 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 um, uh, for this patient and my other patient that, that I didn't present that had the upbeat is also a type two diabetic Latina female. Um, it, it could be early, the early manifestations of, of, of type, um, you know, type one, uh, and, and time will tell if it, if it ends up being an autoimmune, um, that at this time is just mild and, and diet controlled, so to speak. Um, so we will see. Okay. Thank you. That was indeed a very interesting case, I would say quite huge learning experience. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Swati. I think uh, there are a couple of interesting comments from Dr. Miller. Uh, he says that combination of downbeat, nystagmus, and latexia is very suggestive of GAT65. So I think that's possibly we should keep in mind that's coming up in the discussion also. And Dr. Bart has some interesting comments. Dr. Bart, you would like to unmute and speak? Um, yeah, I, I mean, just uh, I, I can certainly comment here. The um, uh, GAT65 antibody, I think, should be checked in everybody of downbeat nystagmus. Um, we recently compiled all our cases of downbeat nystagmus, and that was the, uh, one of the more common identifiable causes. And there's another large uh, series from Germany. They, that was one of the com more common identifiable causes. And you also, um, I wanted to comment that um, when you find it, you need to look for the other features of a GAT65 antibody syndrome, and they may not be obvious, such as stiff person syndrome, gait ataxia, or small fiber neuropathy. So a good for, you know, neurological exam uh, and, and history will be um, recommended in these patients in addition to checking for type one diabetes. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Bart. Those are great comments. Um, you also had commented about the, uh, you know, a, ways we could be more thorough in evaluating for, for CSF uh, uh, leukemia lymphoma evaluation. Have you, have you have any cases of perineoplastic GAD65? Like once you find it, do we need to do further investigations or do you think this is a, um, uh, it's a syndrome in itself and, do, and doesn't need to have a, an underlying trigger or cause for GAD65? Yeah, I struggle with this one, right? So, so it can it is described as a paraneoplastic syndrome, but um, for instance, in the fifty cases of uh, downbeat nystagmus that we compiled, uh, overall, um, we didn't identify any you know new paraneoplastic syndrome that wasn't already known. Um, you know, like you know, so I niche when I started my practice, I would do whole body scans and all these patients um, with everybody with downbeat nystagmus, but it may be overkill. And with GAT65 antibody syndrome, uh, you, you could do it, but it's, it, it may also be overkill. Yeah, great, great, great point. I think the, um, the, the one challenge we find with the, whether or not the cancer is known is, is how, how much healthcare the patients already received. Uh, and uh, depending on your, where you're practicing and, and, and your patient populations, right? a lot of people, if they're getting their annual mammograms, they know if they have breast cancer and if they're, uh, uh, in, uh, if they're rare, 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 rarely using the healthcare system, they may not, may not know, but uh, great points. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for a great case and great discussion. I think we'll move on to the next case. And uh, OK. Yeah, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Chen. And uh, he is a professor of ophthalmology and neurology at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. He did his fellowship in ophthalmology from University of Iowa. He has over 150 peer-reviewed publications, and his focus areas include ophthalmic imaging, IH, optic neuritis, especially NMO and MOG antibody-associated disease. He is the fellowship director for neuroophthalmology at Mayo Clinic. He chairs Upper Midwest Neuroophthalmology Group, and he's on multiple committees for AO. He's a board member for NANOS, and he has achievement award from AO. Over to you, Dr. Chen, and uh, welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much for that invitation. And it's really uh, an honor and privilege to be chatting with all of you today. So uh, the case that we're going to describe today is something called Bouncing Eyes and a Masquerade Ball. And we're actually going to stay kind of in the same theme as Drew Carey's wonderful case we did earlier. But this is a newly described entity that I think it'll be important for us to be aware of. Um, it's a pretty short, sweet, but pretty striking case. Um, this is a 43-year-old male who presented with a history of left testicular torsion, but he presented with two weeks of worsening imbalance. Yeah. We are unable to see your screen. Okay. Let me share again. Can you see the screen here? Yeah, but it's not in the slideshow mode. Yeah. Okay. No, How about now? Wonder if I apologize good. about that. Um, so again, this patient presented with uh, two weeks of worsening imbalance, gait and coordination, diplopia, vertigo, and right lower extremity weakness. And then the symptoms worsen. Over six to twelve months, he now started developing osteopenia, dysarthria, jaw dystonia, ataxia, hypersomnolence, and langrospasm. And it came back so bad that it st he started having choke choking episodes, nocturnal strider, and hypoxia, and ultimately ended up with acute respiratory failure necessitating mechanical ventilation. And, and so that's when we found our 43-year-old previously healthy gentleman, really over a span of six to 12 months, went from a normal healthy individual to being in the ICU intubated. So on exam, I'm just going to show the video here. Um, you can see this prominent jerk seesaw vertical nystagmus. Um, also not in this video is that he also had prominent horizontal gaze palsies that was not overcome with vestibular active reflex, which obviously with uh, Dan Gold's excellent discussion, kind of know where that might localize. And so even after he was extubated, he could not, um, really look to the left or the right, uh, either with smooth pursuit, saccades, or vestibular active reflex. And again, this prominent jerk seesaw, vertical nystagmus. So I thought I would just turn over to the panelists in terms of, you know, maybe we can start off with localization and then we can maybe talk about some potential etiologies. But any thoughts in terms of localization for, for this patient's symptoms? The interstitial nucleus of Kahal. So somewhere in the brainstem area there. Yeah. But then yeah. uh, that won't explain all the multiple other symptoms, including the respiratory uh, paralysis, as well as the hypersomnolence, the jaw dystonia. No, absolutely. It really seems pretty more widespread. Absolutely. But really, it, instead of maybe just the pons or, or just the medulla, you know, it was actually a lot of brainstem centers. And that's what we, we thought ex exactly as well. You know, just like you mentioned, there was multiple things going on. Obviously, we're kind of drawn to this horizontal gaze palsy look like to the pons. But, you know, the patient also had, just like you mentioned, jaw dystonia, dystonia dysarthria, all these things. So again, a pretty widespread brainstem etiology. Any thoughts on differentials? So obviously now we're thinking brainstem, but instead of this being acute, this was really kind of progressive over 12 weeks, just kind of, I guess more of that subacute onset. Any thoughts on, on any kind of general differentials or general things we might be looking for? 
Is it demyelinating? Yeah, so demyelinating could be on the differential for sure. Um, he's young, you know, he's only 43. So we're thinking, you know, this is probably not going to be a stroke. It was, of course, too slow to be a stroke as well. So we want to, you know, demyelinating should definitely be on the differential diagnosis for sure. Um, yeah. Usually that gets mm -hmm. worse over about a week or so, but this seemed to kind of get worse over 12 weeks. So a little bit of a, yes, yeah, subacute, but a slower onset than your subacute that you get with demyelinating disease. Metastatic or uh, perineoplastic? Yes. Dr. Yes. Miller is commenting perineoplastic. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think these are all wonderful thoughts. And again, you know, this subacute onset, we were kind of thinking the same thing. You know, could this be neoplastic? Could this be autoimmune? Could it be perineoplastic? Of course, we'd have some other things like toxic, infectious, inflammatory on there. But, um, you know, just looking at a large differential of brainstem pathology, uh, let's go back here again. Um, you know, these are kind of things that can occur in the brainstem, but a lot of this, we know it's not going to be the case. You know, it's not going to be a stroke. It's not going to be a hemorrhage. This is just happening too fast. You know, neoplasm, lymphoma, carcinomatosis, certainly that can be in the differential diagnosis. And then we just heard about an excellent case of GAD65. So, you know, we've got perineoplastic in our brains already. You know, could that be on the differential? Um, we talked about, um, and then sarcoidosis, you know, obviously that can do anything at once. We know that. Um, and then some other odd infections that can mimic anything. And then some brainstem disorders. So again, this is kind of our differential going in pretty broad. But of course, um, we know we're going to be looking at the brainstem. We're going to start off with imaging first. And so uh, I just have some representative images here. And you can see that this patient had T2 hyperintensity extending from the pons all the way to the cervical cord. But it was striking. There was no enhancement. There was no mass effect. Um, and so it was a very interesting lesion, again, extending through the brainstem exactly where we thought the lesion would be. Now, of course, we've got to still figure out what this could be. Um, obviously, a lumbar puncture is going to be important. Um, we're going to be looking for you know, things like lymphoma and other, other signs of infection, inflammation. And we did see pleocytosis. There's 37 white blood cells, uh, protein of 59, just mildly elevated, uh, normal IgG index and synthesis rate. Uh, and there were four CSF oligoclonal bands, not specific, but just indicating some kind of process, uh, especially with the pleocytosis going on. Again, you know, perineoplastic was brought up. And again, we just had a case of GAD65, which, you know, usually is not per perineoplastic, but occasionally can be. So again, perineoplastic was pretty high in our differential diagnosis. We did a PET CT of the whole body, did not show any abnormalities, surprisingly. Um, of course, we went back to his prior history. In fact, completely healthy, other than a history of testicular torsion but did ha he did have a pretty thorough investigation. And um, we did an ultrasound. It showed an atrophic testis, again, that testicular torsion. Interestingly, he was found to have an enlarged inguinal lymph node. And again, not hot on PET, but that's the only thing we have right now. So that's what we're going to go after. Sometimes we may find the answer. So we did a biopsy of the inguinal lymph node, and what we found is large nuclei with prominent nucleoli. And the SAL4 was immunoreactive and positive, consistent with germ cell tumor. So going back to the panel now, any thoughts on the diagnosis in this patient with worsening ataxia, brainstem involvement? Uh, prominent oh. nystagmus, horizontal gaze palsies, and now this germ cell tumor, history of testicular torsion. Well, perhaps an optoclonus myoclonus as a paraneoplastic syndrome? Yes, it absolutely. Would and I, that axia as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is going to be a perineoplastic panel and a perineoplastic syndrome. And actually, interesting, he did develop opsoclonus. Again, early when he's intubated, I forgot to mention that he had prominent jerk seesaw and nystagmus, but he did develop obstaclonus later. So this is a perineoplastic panel uh, syndrome. Now that we know he's got a history of testicular torsion and a 43-year-old previously healthy male with a germ cell tumor, any thoughts on the potential perineoplastic syndrome that was just described about two years ago? 
any testing you could do in the CSF or the serum to look for a particular antibody. We just heard about GAD65, which we've known now for a little bit longer. Again, this one's just right hot off the press. Sometimes these patients can have hearing loss in about 40 to 50% of patients. And the ataxia, ophthalmophagia, and hearing loss in a male. These are the things that are going to make you want to think, looking for this entity called antibodies against Kelch 11 protein, a Kelch-like protein 11. That's what you're going to be looking for in the antibodies. It's a newly described perineoplastic syndrome. So that was our diagnosis of our gentleman. He had Kelch 11 protein 11, or Kelch-like protein 11 perineoplastic rhomboencephalitis. And, um, you know, this is a perineoplastic syndrome. They tend to, um, we tend to treat these with immunosuppression uh, and of course the cancer as well, treated with IV methylprednisolone, alone, and he was treated with cyclophosphamide. He did get near resolution that snagmus and the opticlon opticlonus, but unfortunately had persistent gaze palsies. His mobility did improve from, um, you know, being wheelchair bound to being able to walk with a gait belt, but he certainly had some persistent deficits, which is pretty common with this condition. So I thought I would just take a couple, you know, maybe a couple minutes just to talk about Kelch-like protein 11 antibodies, because it's it's really, I think, one of the newly newest described entities just a couple years ago. And this is typically going to be uh, a male. In fact, it only affects men because it's 100% associated with a seminomena, germ cell testicular neoplasm, as in our patient, or pre malignant testicular microlithiasis. And patients present with ataxia, vertigo, um, and any pattern of diplopia or nystagmus, and about 40% have hearing loss. <clears throat> Median age is 41, but we've seen ranges between 27 to 68. And from a neuro-ophthalmology standpoint, it's gonna be double vision, ophthalmoplegia, as this patient had you know, that prominent horizontal gaze uh, palsy. <clears throat> Really any form of nystagmus, we've seen ocular palatal tremor. This patient had that prominent jerk seesaw nystagmus. Uh, we've seen periodic alternating nystagmus. So again, any form of diplopia nystagmus, especially if there's prominent ataxia, especially if there's hearing loss in, in a male, you're gonna wanna think about Kelch-like protein 11. It was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, just a couple years ago, this entity, for two reasons, one, it's a newly described entity. And in retrospect, you know, about eight years ago, I remember seeing patients with this entity. I remember a male with ataxia, hearing loss, nystagmus, and, and I didn't know the cause. We called it idiopathic. But in retrospect, that was Kelch 11 protein. We just didn't know. Uh, but this got publishing in New England Journal of Medicine, not just because of, you know, obviously describing the entity. It was because of the way this antibody was discovered. And what it used is something called bacteriophage immunoprecipitation. So you have this phage display of bacteriophages where um, these bacteria actually express um, the proteins in the human genome um, in, in, in this array. And then you add on the, parent, uh, the patient serum and CSF that may have these antibodies, and you're looking for the antibody protein interaction. And then essentially you go and identify which phages bound to the antibody, and then you sequence it. So you know what peptide that was bound to. And so this was published here. You can see these are the patients that had this couch alike 11 phenotype, and they were all had um, some enriched uh, sequencing of that peptide. And then this is further confirmed with Western blot and a cell-based assay showing both the co-localization of the antibodies in a, in a patient and, uh, and, and couch protein. And, and so that was our confirmation that this is Kelch-like protein 11, the, a, a newly described entity, again, causing a perineoplastic uh, encephalitis. And so again, you're going to want to think about it in a male um, that has ataxia, diplopia nystagmus, especially if they have hearing loss, and, and just something that we should put on our differential diagnosis. And again, you know, I think there's going to be new antibodies to be discovered over time with new techniques. So it's really a pretty exciting time to be an ophthalmologist and see these new breakthroughs come through, through. So I'd love to answer any questions you might all have. Uh, I think uh, we all have uh, been amazed with the two wonderful cases over the 
the last two months, uh, they have been like eye openers for all of us. Any questions from any of the panelists, moderators? I just have a very basic question. Um, a lot of these uh, syndromes, of course, are paraneoplastic, but in some of them, you cannot find a primary, you cannot find the neoplasm as it is. And uh, so if you decide, um, then those are considered as infectious or post-infectious. So is that a diagnosis of exclusion, whether it is paraneoplastic or if we are thinking infectious or post-infectious? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I think, you know, first, obviously, we have to get into that, that mode that this is, could this be perineoplastic? Could this be autoimmune? And I think, you know, this entire audience really kind of steered that way. You know, in, in terms of the presentation, you're thinking perineoplastic. But, uh, and, you know, let's say we saw this patient five years ago, we wouldn't have known about Couch 11. And yet we still would have said, you know, what, I think this is some antibody mediated process. So then that would have driven a look for cancer. And, you know, obviously the best thing we've got are PET scans, um, obviously the general exam, taking the history with that testicular torsion, and obviously that directed us. Uh, but let's say it's an antibody that we don't know. Um, we still would have fallen down into, yes, this is some kind of autoimmune process, some antibody media process with that subacute onset and MRI findings. Then we would have looked for cancer. And if we don't find cancer, then, you know, we would probably put it in, you know, the post-infectious, the autoimmune, and we'd still treat, you know, we'd still treat with IV steroids, we'd still treat with, um, you know, immunosuppression to try and get some recovery. Of course, before I did that, we'd have to rule out true infection. Um, so obviously we'd be looking for infectious processes. But yes, um, you know, if we saw this patient five years ago, obviously, we, you know, this patient ended up, we find it cancer, but there's still some antibodies out there that we don't know, and they're not driven by cancer. And yet we know it's in that, that phenotype of autoimmune and we, you know, we would still treat it. This is an excellent question. So any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you. I think then uh, with this excellent question and excellent discussion, we move on to the next case. Thank you. Uh, thank our you. next. Yeah. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Bart Scholes. He is uh, he's an assistant professor of neurology and ophthalmology at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, Boston. He has an illustrious career studying medicine in the University of Illinois, Chicago. He did residency in neurology and then did fellowship in advanced general and autoimmune neurology at MGH. He did fellowship in neuroophthalmology from Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. He has focus area on inflammatory, infectious, and autoimmune disorders that affect the eye, base of the skull, and the nervous system. And he's the founding director of inflammatory neuroophthalmology and skull-based disorders. Welcome, Bart, and over to you. Um, thank you for having me and allowing me to speak. Um, and uh, you know, also thank you for promoting me to assistant professor. I hope that my boss heard that because I don't have a title yet, although it is currently, okay, I have been proposed for it. Um, so <laughs> that was the only inaccuracy in that what was presented there. Um, but uh, but I really appreciate being able to talk today and present this case um, that I entitled uh, Checkmate um, uh, of a 71 year old man with diplopia and ptosis. I don't have any financial conflicts. Um, so the pertinent history before we get into the history of the presenting illness was that this patient had an oncologic history of a choroidal melanoma that was in the right eye diagnosed in 2017. He had a um, preparatory surgery for radiation and an intravitreal biopsy performed shortly after. And then he underwent uh, proton beam irradiation of the right eye and 70 gray and five fractions. And um, then was stable for a couple of years, but in July, 2019, uh, developed a new lesion in the liver that was biopsied and confirmed to be metastatic melanoma. Uh, he had additional medical history of hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease believed to be due to the hypertension, borderline dyslipidemia, and hypothyroidism. And so um, this is a case that I saw a couple of years ago, but this is the timeline of the initial presentation. Um, so as he had just been diagnosed with uh, metastatic melanoma, 
Uh, he was started on checkpoint inhibitor therapy for melanoma with ipilimumab and nivolumumab, or ipinivo, at the end of October in 2019. Uh, two weeks later, he was hospitalized for um, acute on chronic kidney failure. Um, the kidney was actually biopsied, and it was a combination of acute tubular necrosis and acute interstitial nephritis pathologically. And he was started in the hospital on 60 milligrams of prednisone. About a week later, so whilst hospitalized, he developed um, diplopia and then uh, severe ptosis, and I progressed uh, within days to dysphagia, dysarthria, and nasal speech. And um, then he was, um, a couple of weeks into this course, he was evaluated um, in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic. Um, so here's his exam, and I do have some additional pictures. So the ophthalmic exam, um, the right eye was 2050 acuity, left eye 2020. There was no APD, but he did have mild dyschromatopsia in the right eye. Uh, visual fields appeared full to confrontation with the eyelids held up. Um, and then I'll show you the fundus in the extraocular movement. He had severe bilateral ptosis. Um, neurological exam was additionally notable for nasal voice, uh, weakness of jaw closure, uh, neck flexion and extension weakness and proximal weakness in the del deltoids, biceps, triceps, iliopsoas, quad, and hamstring. But his distal hand and foot strength was intact and his reflexes were normal. And he also had intact sens sensation to pin. Uh, he was able to ambulate with a walker. So this is a fundus image, you know, the right eye here on the left, and you can see that uh, superior to the disc is a large um, melanotic lesion. So that is the persistent of, persistence of the melanoma. And these are his eye movements. So in the middle is a picture of a patient, and I'm trimming him look right, left, up, and down. And you can see not much is happening. Okay, so he has a severe ptosis, and he has an, an almost complete ophthalmoparesis. Um, with uh, um, maybe slightly, um, relatively better preserved upgaze in both eyes um, and um, a slightly uh, slight abduction, but not a lot of adduction, not a lot of um, introduction in either eye. Uh, so an ice pack test was performed in the clinic and was negative. There was no improvement in the ptosis. And uh, MRI of the orbit was performed. And so you can see um, that these are T1, uh, these are non-contrast, um, not fat suppressed images um, on purpose here of the orbit in the um, coronal plane and the axial plane. And what I would like you to draw your attention to here is um, that the extraocular muscles are small and they appear to be, uh, to be more um, T1 bright here than, than as usual, and that would normally be consistent with um, atrophy, with um, fatty inf infiltration of the muscle. Um, and uh, that affects all the muscle groups, um, especially uh, the, you know, the inferior rec rectus muscles, I think you can see that most prominently, but you can see you know, the medial and lateral recta also are shrunken and have the same, what appears on MRI as um, maybe fatty replacement. Uh, of course, we're dealing with an acute problem. So here's a here's a, a timeline um, of additional workup that is performed in the hospital. Um, so the um, MRI already showed you. Uh, lab testing on admission was notable for a CK of um, 876 and a troponin T of 3,217. His EKG and uh, cardiac um, echocardiogram were normal. He had negative acetylcholine receptor and musk antibodies and a negative myositis antibody panel. An EMG was performed um, that showed a, a negative repetitive stimulation, but increased insertional and spontaneous activity of the right deltoid and thoracic paraspinals consistent with a myopathy. And then an endomyocardial biopsy was performed a little later in the course that showed a low-grade cardiac myositis. So this is where... Um, I would like to turn to the panel of, you know, this, my discussions here, Dr. Karn and others, and see what what do you make of this presentation um, that I'm showing you so far? Dr. Sathya, you need to unmute. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, Bart, um, it's quite clear that the patient uh, seems to be having signs suggestive of an acute myasthenic situation because he has uh, forehead uh, elevation and trying to lift his eyelids, uh, which is a sign in myasthenia. Um, though this is quite an acute presentation of bilateral limitation of ocular movements and bilateral ptosis. as you can see in this picture. So, I mean, that's not the usual presentation of myasthenia, right? I would agree with you. And then, of course, there are some uh, laboratory and um, paraclinical abnormalities here that we don't see in myasthenia. Um, but yeah, the, the clinically, initially, I thought this looked very much like a, um, what would be a hyperacute presentation of myasthenia gravis, you know, very unusual. Um, all right, there's no other comments. Maybe I'll, I'll continue. Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting this case as, uh, a patient that has checkpoint inhibitor induced orbital myositis and systemic myositis and cardiac myositis overlap syndrome, and arguably also has myasthenia uh, gravis associated with this. Although, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies um, and the EMG uh, did not support this the diagnosis of myasthenia. But clinically, I think all of us would gravitate towards there being a myasthenic component um, because I think it is unusual to have um, ptosis, for instance, um, to this degree within acute myositis. Um, but, uh, but this is an overlap syndrome and it can have all these features. And um, it is important to identify this. And so um, probably many people in the audience are familiar with this new class of medication, the immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, medications. Uh, but just to refresh your memory, um, so if these medications uh, rely on the, on the idea that um, a T cell um, requires multiple signals to become activated. So of course, the main signal is the T cell receptor uh, connecting with the um, MHC molecule presenting an antigen, um, but there are additional um, second signals. And then of course, also cytokines that um, help activate the T cells. And so specifically this uh, CTLA4 B7 interaction and a PD1, PDL1 interaction uh, are important in that. And so these interactions would inhibit uh, a T cell from um, becoming activated. And um, that can stop the effectiveness of a T cells, for instance, in fighting cancer. So we all knew that the immune system does more than just fight um, you know, microbes, it also fights cancer. And we all know about you know, paralymplastic antibody syndrome, we just discussed them as a consequence of this immune reactivation. But in this case, um, the T cell response against the melanoma or other cancer is, a, is what we are desiring to promote. And with these um, anti-checkpoint uh, uh, inhibitor medicines, you can unleash the, the T cell. And so um, the patient in this case had a combination um, uh, treatment of ipilimumab and nivolumumab to um, unlock both of these checkpoints. And so what does that do? Well, we believe it does a number of different things that uh, the immune system gets very widely activated. Um, and so there's T cell responses against various antigens that are present both in tumors and in healthy tissue. Um, so you get a tumor response, you get a paraneoplastic response a lot of time too. Um, there's antibody production, there's cytokine production, and increased complement mediated inflammation as well. And um, there can be um, adverse effects in many different parts of the nervous system, uh, in addition to other parts of the body, but you can have CNS and PNS um, complications that span a lot of things that we are interested in in neuroophthalmology. So you can have cases of um, optic neuritis, uveitis, iritis. Um, you can have cases of um, vasculitis making, mimicking a temporal arteritis syndrome. You can have cases of a, uh, meningitis um, or demyelinating disorder. And in the peripheral nervous system, you can have cases of what appears to be Guillain-Barre syndrome um, and, uh, and, and myasthenia and myositis. 
Um, but the big one here that I wanted to highlight is this myositis overlap with myasthenia and myocarditis that we saw here. Um, and, um, and the reason for that is um, because I would like every you know, ophthalmologist and neurologist in the audience to be aware that when you encounter these patients, um, and you may you need to focus beyond the, just the uh, ocular findings and evaluate you know check the CK level is there is there an, you know is there a systemic myositis and check the cardiac enzyme and check the EKG is there um, you know a cardiomyopathy as well uh, because uh, these cases can have twenty to twenty five percent mortality because of this overlap syndrome um, and so in this case you know the patient was treated here with um, with IV steroids um, we tried them on pyrostigmine as well there was no response then plasmapheresis. Um, about the sept, which um, did not have an immediate response, and then infliximab was the the uh, definitive treatment that was chosen. So here's check take home points. Um, is uh, the first one is so checkpoint inhibitor complications are not phenocopies of spontaneous autoimmune diseases. Um, so uh, it may look like myasthenia, um, but it could be uh, there could be an additional myositis. Um, the optic neuritis that is present is sometimes after these ch uh, checkpoint inhibitor cases also looks different than typical optic neuritis. It is more likely than to be, for instance, bilateral, hemorrhagic, and have MRI negative. Um, and please be aware of this, you know, um, uh, this, this spectrum of, of muscle disease and neuromuscular junction disease that can all coexist. And then, of course, other multisystem disease can um, occur at the same time, can, they can, the patients can have a pneumonitis or a colitis or hypophysitis, whatever it may be. The treatment would be to stop the checkpoint inhibitor and to treat the complications. It's not enough to just stop the cancer drug. You need to uh, treat the immune response, which has taken on a life of its own at this point. Thank you. Bart, do you recommend stopping the checkpoint inhibitor in all patients, or does it depend on the severity of their disease? Keeping in mind, right, this is like their last line of treatment for their cancer many times. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So a couple of points on that. So for um, we did publish uh, recommendations on how to grade the severity and how to diagnose the different syndromes for neurological complications. And the same thing will be coming out for ophthalmic complications um, probably next year um, for, from our group. So um, you need to you know, properly diagnose the syndrome, name the syndrome, and then assess the severity. And um, you know, the severity can be um, anywhere from you know, mild and annoying, you know, let's say dry eye disease is a very common one, to um, you know, life-threatening such as this one. Um, and so it, it, it becomes a judgment call in the more severe complications, you know, life-threatening, eye-threatening, severe neurological disease, you will always uh, stop the checkpoint inhibitor. Um, that seems to be an okay thing to do. A lot of times people get the anti-cancer effect already. So they've already been exposed to it. They, may, they will already have a lot of anti-cancer benefit. Um, and then sometimes it is possible to later carefully rechallenge these patients. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you don't stop the, the checkpoint inhibitor, uh, the complications could be extremely severe. So I think you're, you're obligated to in all but the mildest cases. Yeah, I, I agree. I have a patient who had a perineural spread of a facial squamous cell, unresectable, and they didn't want to radiate it because uh, it would have blinded the patient. And he got treated with simiplumab and had a severe pneumonitis reaction after one dose. Um, and so this simiplumab was stopped, but a year and a half later, he's still uh, in cancer remission after the windows of the simiplumab. So I think we don't fully understand the, the, you know, the durability of these treatments. And some people have, um, you know, persistent anti-cancer response and other patients need ongoing treatment or we get switched to a different one after they're stabilized. But great case. And thanks for the teaching points. Yeah. What I thank you. What I don't understand, and I don't know if anybody has any comments on this, is uh, this MRI MRI scan, which to me looks like an end stage atrophic um, a muscle MRI. Um, but of course, the patient was completely normal, and this was done, you know, two weeks or so, three weeks into their course. Um, I don't know why how the signal uh, these signal changes developed. Um, I don't know if anybody in the audience has any thought.
no idea but just uh, hypothesizing maybe the receptors for those checkpoint inhibitors are more localized over there causes a marked atrophy yeah that's i think so too i just just a rapid atrophy i think is is um the patient did not improve either with with treatment i mean his his, his myositis and cut and myocarditis improved but uh, his his extraocular muscles um last he was seen here have not improved. I did not. I don't have long term follow up because he moved to South Carolina um, and continued his treatment there. So Bart, I found some literature which says that this kind of uh, extraocular muscle uh, thinning uh, can be seen in chronic myasthenia, ocular myasthenia gravis patients. Uh, yes. But it's so difficult to explain that uh, this patient who had certain sudden acute uh, myasthenic uh, symptoms. Uh, shows this kind of a picture on MRI. I agree. I agree. And then there's a different question that I have. Then is MRI orbit routinely done in chronic ocular myasthenia patients? Um, it probably isn't done routinely. I, I, I don't know. But I, I mean, if I, have a, if I have a conclusive diagnosis of myasthenia, I don't pursue further imaging other than the chest, uh, of course. Um, but I, I um, the cases where it may be pursued, I think, is if you are suspecting um, oh, coexisting yeah. thyroid eye disease, um, yeah. or maybe are you know long-standing myasthenia, consisting uh, considering strabismus surgery. I think in those cases, maybe it it will be reasonable to obtain. And uh, maybe those patients who are refractory to treatment, ocular myasthenia gravis patients. Sure, certainly. Mm -hmm. I think again, uh, no other questions, but I think uh, Dr. Ambika also put up that uh, again for CPO also, that might also show a similar picture. So again, as you were saying, possibly for refractory case also, it would make sense uh, to do a repeat imaging. But I think none of us do it for a chronic myasthenia per se, which is really responding to treatment. Any other comments from any other panelist or uh, speakers? If none, thank you. I think it was again once again a wonderful case. I think uh, all the cases have been checkmating all of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with this, we move on to the next presentation. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I would like to invite over here, Dr. Wayne Conblat, uh, he is he's a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences and neurology at University of Michigan. He did his uh, medical schooling from University of Missouri, 1983, then went on to do residency uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. He did his fellowship in uh, neuro-ophthalmology at Wilmer Institute, John Hopkins University, long back in 1989. Uh, he, he has a lot of keen interest in ocular myasthenia and waves, giant cell arthritis, optic neuritis, and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. With this, I welcome you, Dr. Conblath, and uh, look forward to your interesting session. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to assume you saved the best for last. And yes, yes, there we go. So, we're going to do double, double toil and trouble, courtesy of uh, Macbeth and William Shakespeare. And so a 58-year-old man complained of double vision, headache, nausea, vomiting, and confusion for 10 days. He had diabetes, coronary artery disease. He'd had stents. He had hypothyroidism, uh, social history, family history, uh, negative surgical history. He's on levothyroxine for the hypothyroidism. And on exam, he was 2020 on the right, 2030 on the left, and he had a left afferent pupillary defect. And so uh, uh, you, you gave away when I trained. All I was going to say was that I trained with Neil Miller prior to OCT. And to quote uh, Liam Neeson from the movie Taken, uh, I have a particular set of skills that I've developed over years, and that is doing the pupillary testing and looking for the APD for the 
audience that neuro-ophthalmology lives and dies on the afferent pupillary defect. 2030 in this man could easily have been cataract, refractive error, but the APD tells us exactly what it was. It tells us exactly what it is in terms of localization. Um, one other uh, anecdote from fellowship, Neil Miller would not recheck my vision, but he would recheck the pupil exam on every patient the fellows saw. This man had normal color vision. And then on motility, you can see his right eye, he has a uh, decreased uh, elevation, depression, and adduction. The left eye is full. With alternate cover, he has an incommonent uh, extropian hyper, uh, right hyper, left hyper. So going along with this, slit lamp exam was unremarkable. The discs were normal. And so we come to now a decision point. Is there any additional testing we need to do in the office? And so let's go back to one of the abnormalities. He has decreased vision in the left with an APD. And so for me, this is going to lead to formal visual fields. Now, what about an OCT? I'd be, we can see what the panel says, but I did not feel an OCT would be helpful to me at this point. He had an afferent defect. He has an optic neuropathy. I looked, his discs were normal appearing. There was not uh, swelling. So an OCT at this point won't particularly help me, I don't think. And so when we do his visual fields, we did Humphrey visual fields, and you can see he's got either an enlarged blind spot or some nonspecific changes in the right eye. The left eye has what looks like a suprotemporal defect. We're fairly respecting the vertical meridian. And so now, uh, where, where are we at? We've got some findings. We have a right pupil sparing partial third nerve palsy. We have a left afferent pupillary defect. We have a left temporal visual field defect. And we have confusion, because don't forget he had that complaint also. So we've got to localize these. And a lot of times I think we localize, then we say what happens at that localization. And so we kind of really have to localize and then uh, come up with the possibility. And so let's go back and review some anatomy as we localize. Uh, Neil, I don't know if you recognize these pictures, but I will give you credit. These are two pictures from uh, fourth volume of Walsh and Hoyt written by Dr. Miller. And I have combined these were two separate pictures. And this shows the afferent pathway from the eyeball to the occipital lobe. And so remember, he has a left APD. So where, where can that come from? That can come from, oh, and uh, unlike MRI, this we're looking at a, a live brain, not a live brain, <laughs> a dead brain. We're looking at a brain, and this is the left side, that's the right side. So a left APD can be in his left optic nerve, chiasm, or the tract, the right tract. And let's talk about that a little bit more detail. If he's in the left optic nerve, he's going to have a central scotoma as shown on the visual fields here. If he's in the right optic tract, he's going to have a left homonymous hemianopia shown on the visual fields here. But don't forget, he had a left APD and a left temporal defect, and that's going to come from the chiasm. So we've actually taken our localization down to one spot here for this exam for this portion of the findings. Now we got the third nerve palsy. So let's bring that up. So here's the kind of a picture, uh, you know, the third nerve nucleus. Here's the third nerve. And as mentioned actually uh, by Dr. Carey, you know, here's where we get divisional thirds typically. And so this man has a partial third. It's likely somewhere here. Now, he does not have any Weber's uh, syndrome. He does not have a contralateral hemiparesis. He doesn't have other brainstem findings. 
So we're probably at this third nerve somewhere in here. How can we combine these two things? Let's look at a different uh, plane. This is, we're axial here. Let's look coronal. Oh, and he also has confusion. And that's going to be bilateral frontal lobe, bilateral cortical process, or a metabolic process. So let's look now. And again, this is uh, from Neil Miller's uh, Walsh and Hoyt. Um, so there's the chiasm. And he's got a problem on the left chiasm. And let me highlight, there's the third nerve. So now all of a sudden, I actually have these findings in relative proximity to each other. And I got to think about anat an causes and differential. And so now I've got to think what else is in this area. Well, you can see here's the carotid. Uh, there's the carotid, the carotid splitting to the MCAACA. Um, could a giant aneurysm do this? Is there anything else in this region? Let me show you this thing. There's the pituitary gland. So about equidistance from his right third and the left side of his chiasm is the pituitary gland. So I'm going to wonder, should I next do an MRI with attention to his chiasm and cavernous sinus? And sure enough, that's what we did. And what do we see? We see a very large uh, uh, cellular base mass, uh, likely from the pituitary, that is involving the left side of the chiasm and surrounding his right cavernous sinus. And whenever we are concerned with a pituitary or cellular uh, region process, we always like to check a number of different labs. So when we checked labs, what we found is his sodium was markedly low, he is hyponatremic, and we found that his prolactin was through the roof at 10,000. So this is a prolactinoma. And so our diagnosis in this man is prolactinoma with cavernous sinus and chiasmal involvement and hyponatremia accounting for um, uh, accounting for a right third nerve palsy, left APD and left temporal defect, and confusion. And he was uh, treated with cabergoline to reduce the prolactinoma. And, uh, and Dr. Miller noted the comment to give the credit for the uh, anatomic picture from the original atlas that he got it from. And so at follow-up with the cabergoline, you can see the marked shrinkage of his uh, adenoma. And just to give you, here he was pre, uh, and here he is post, and you can see there's no longer pressure on the chiasm. And let's go back again for a second. Remember, there's that third nerve circled in blue. And look here on his post-treatment uh, MRI. And what you see, there's his third nerve in his uh, cavernous sinus, no longer compressed uh, by the uh, adenoma. And follow-up visual fields. You can see uh, that temporal defect is gone. A few nonspecific changes in the right eye. And here is his visual field pre, and then you see the improvement. And the third nerve palsy also resolved. And so what are our take home points in this man? Well, one is, and some of this has been gone over previously, um, the accurate history, like we heard just a uh, little bit ago with the testicular torsion. We really need to know more than just eye complaints in our patients. We do need a comprehensive history to put everything together. Um, and so he'd have the history of confusion. We need an accurate exam and the APD, you know, we, again, we live and die on that, on that finding. And the one, I'm sure every neuro ophthalmologist here has had a more than one patient sent to them with no APD noted on the prior exam, and there's an obvious APD. And I think that leads uh, referring physicians down, down the wrong pathway, uh, not 
not being accurate with that APD finding. And then judicious testing. So what will each test add? So, you know, I do not reflexively do an OCT. I said, he doesn't have swelling. The OCT in this case would not add anything, but the visual field was critical for localization and for follow-up uh, to observe improvement. And then localized and know your anatomy. And sometimes you have to, you know, get the book out and relook and say, how close are these things? What, what, what are the possibilities? And then finally, generate a differential and an action plan. And in this case, you might even say it, if I had had a differential of something's happening in the cavernous sinus in the chiasm without anything further, that would have led me to the action plan of I've got an image in that area. So, um, uh, and so that's it. Uh, any questions or comments or thoughts from the panel? Wonderful case, uh, Dr. Kornblad. I think uh, you wonderfully put all the teachings of Dr. Neil Miller and your vast experience over there. And uh, I think the way you showed us the localization, that was the key for all of us, putting all the bits of the examination findings very nicely. I, uh, I think uh, just to add to this uh, uh, case, I think the, the adenoma was growing in a little asymmetrical manner. Vertically, it was reaching towards the left side of the chiasm and it was extending to the horizontally or transversely, it was growing into the cavernous sinus that was causing this, possibly uh, one of the rare findings. But uh, I have seen one case where uh, the patient had a normal visual function normal visual fields, but presented with the isolated people involving third palsy, And it was due to a pituitary adenoma growing primarily in the transfer screen. So that was one experience I had. And there is a nice write-up, I think, by Dr. Newman about describing the cranial nerve palsies in patients with uh, pituitary adenomas. And I think apoplexy is one of the other things that might be uh, the sudden that might be causing the sudden change. These are my thoughts, and I request all others to contribute and uh, share their experience. Wayne actually uh, brought us back to the crux of neuroophthalmology where is the lesion and what is the lesion? Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody else? Any other suggestion or comment? If not, uh, thank you all. A wonderful session and a wonderful meeting. Dr. Satya, over to you. Thank you. So I am filled with gratitude for the tremendous support from all the faculty and a special mention to Dr. Miller and Dr. Plant for mentoring us yesterday and today, and the overwhelming response from viewers worldwide. The NOSIG members would also like to express our gratitude to all the speakers, panelists, and moderators for making the discussions priceless. We gratefully acknowledge the efforts of Sunilji, the webmaster who managed the technical aspects very professionally and entered pharmaceuticals for facilitating the entire event. Thank you all. And have a good day and good night.